A former NASA engineer has made bold claims around Saturn. He goes on to say that giant crafts can be seen around this planet and that the National Aeronautics and Space Administration are well aware of this. The former employee goes on to detail that unidentified flying objects are interested in Saturn's rings and on numerous occasions we've captured them lurking close to the planet. Who's said to have been an employee at NASA's research center details that these crafts that have been captured are not hard to spot, mainly because they're massive easily being several miles in length. He said the following about the mysterious objects that were detected close to Saturn. Alien spacecrafts are proliferating in our solar system and around these ring planets. End quote. One of the ways he was able to find out about these crafts was because he had exclusive access to raw images. These are images that are sent back to NASA that haven't yet been edited or tampered with. Something that's commonly done by the space agency and that they're open about. They claim that various images we see have been edited or part of various images that have been put together, commonly known as composite images. These raw images, however, gave him an insight into what the public weren't able to see and in various photographs he could see junk craft sitting close to Saturn and its rings. Knowing that these objects were being kept a secret, he decided that the general public should know about them and so went about releasing a book. However, he soon revealed that he wasn't able to get it published in the United States. This caused him to travel to Scotland in the hopes of getting it published. He did, and the book was titled Ring Makers of Saturn. Many interesting photographs have been presented to back up his claims, but one of the most interesting ones shows what appears to be a giant cylindrical craft. He calls them electromagnetic vehicles. It was estimated that this giant object was over 2,000 miles long. Dr. Berggrun said the following about the mysterious objects. I don't know who built it, but what I found out is that these things inhabit Saturn. That's where I first discovered them and they're proliferating. They are now in Uranus and Jupiter wherever you see some rings. I call it the ring maker. I could be looking down on the rings and I could see parallel lines crossing all of the rings at once. That's about as long as you could go. I could tell that those lines mark to the outside of the object. I say that it's an electromagnetic vehicle. Because I can identify streamline patterns and I know that they were potential lines and that says it was electrical. He claims that these giant crafts are building the rings on these planets, with theorists saying that these crafts can be found close to many celestial bodies in our solar system, including the Moon, Mars, and the Sun. It appears though that amateur researchers can't agree on why these crafts are here. Some believe that they're monitoring the solar system, while others believe that they're actually other life forms that we share our solar system with. One of the issues though is the size of these crafts. The majority of them are hundreds, if not thousands of miles in length. So, what are these things? And if they are genuine, who's building them? One amateur researcher said the following. These giant crafts need to be investigated as they've been witnessed for years. I think that at this point we have enough proof to make a case that these are real. One of the problems is that we look at them and apply human ideas, thinking that humans can't build a craft of this size, so it can't be done. But this is the wrong way of looking at it and will actually set us back if we keep doing this. Just because humans can't do it, it doesn't mean it can't be done. After all, we are talking about the universe here. Human laws don't apply. I think more research needs to be done surrounding this topic. And the quicker we take it seriously, the quicker we'll get answers. End quote. Scientists and researchers, though, are not impressed with these kinds of images. With them saying that the most likely explanation is that these objects are just space debris or anomalies picked up on the camera equipment. When talking about unidentified flying objects in space, one researcher went on to say the following, most commonly UFO claims are due to perfectly natural flaws or artifacts in our publicly available data. Some of the things that people are seeing are planets, cosmic rays, software glitches, and debris. End quote. Another NASA official said the following about these claims. The majority of these alleged UFO sightings can be easily explained. One of the things that people see is space debris that's made its way in front of the cameras. When these pieces of debris are up close, it can look like an unidentified flying object. In reality, people are just seeing a common piece of space debris. Even with this explanation, UFO researchers have said this isn't what we're seeing. And in some cases, these objects stick around for several hours. With one UFO researcher saying the following, what I find strange is how these cylinder-shaped UFOs are seen on this planet. I think if it wasn't for that then I'd be more inclined to believe these are natural. But it's just strange how we see similar looking UFOs on our planet. Every year people report different shaped graphs. So I think that there could be more to this than what scientists are letting on. End quote. 
As mentioned, NASA officials have said that when space debris gets close up to the cameras, it can take the shape of a UFO. And many times, this is what we're seeing. Officials say if it's not space debris, then the other explanation is that this is a camera anomaly. And these happen during the processing stage. But as some researchers have pointed out, some of these objects are seen on the raw file images before anything has happened. With space being so vast, is it really far-fetched to believe that we share it with other life forms? As of right now, NASA has said they've never recorded a UFO and that every alleged UFO can be easily explained as space debris. This week, two celebrities have come forward in detail at the UFO encounters. The first one was Demi Lovato, who said that while being out in the desert, she used meditation to contact UFOs, even having proof as she took photographs of the craft. Many people came out and said it was good how such a high-profile celebrity was talking about UFOs. It now seems that Miley Cyrus has done the same thing. During an interview with US Weekly, Marley said she was once followed by an unidentified flying object. She said the following during the interview. I was driving through San Bernardino with my friend and I got chased down by some sort of UFO. I'm pretty sure about what I saw. The best way to describe it is a flung snowplow. It had this big plow in front of it and it was glowing yellow. I did see it flying and my friend saw it too. Perhaps the most interesting part of the interview is when she said she made eye contact with the occupants. Going on to say the following. A being was sitting in front of the object. It looked at me and we made eye contact and I think that's what really shook me. Looking into the eyes of something I couldn't quite wrap my head around. I was shaken for like five days. It really messed me up. I couldn't really look at the sky the same. I thought they might come back. Miley isn't the first person to have experienced something like this and for years many people have come forward with similar kinds of encounters. Hynek's scale is used to explain different types of interactions with UFOs. For example, a close encounter of the first kind is described as seeing an unidentified flying object less than 500 feet away. In this case, the individual is able to give a detailed description of the craft they saw, helping investigators to build a case around the encounter. This is what Miley's encounter would come under and something that is surprisingly not uncommon. Every year across the United States alone, there are more than 8,000 annual reports of unidentified flying objects sighted all across the country with several thousand more sightings made across the world and countless more that have gone unreported out of fear of ridicule. Oddly enough, since the 1950s, this annual number of UFO witness reports continues to grow every year either pointing to evidence of a growing number of extraterrestrial visitations or the cultural shift that allows more and more individuals to come forward and report their strange sightings without fear of being ridiculed by the public. A recurring theme surrounding that of extraterrestrial abduction stories is that many alien abductees are unaware of being victims of an abduction until therapeutic hypnosis allows them to unlock repressed memories seemingly locked away from their conscious minds. This also appears to be the case with the witness account of Judy Dorotry. According to Judy's case, back in 1973, four witnesses were traveling home to Texas City when they encountered a strange light that was described as hovering above them in the night sky. The four witnesses, Judy Daughtry, her daughter Cindy, Judy's mother, and Judy's sister-in-law, all exited the car to get a better look at the strange hovering craft. The group of people claimed that it felt as if a long period of time had passed, despite having no recollection of the time. And shortly after this unexplained ton of confusion, the lights began to hover away and then disappeared into the distance. Immediately following the event, Judy and several members of the group began complaining of severe migraine headaches, generalized anxiety, and trouble sleeping following the encounter. After visiting a handful of doctors, all of whom believed the symptoms were most likely physical manifestations of stress, Judy visited Dr. Leo Sprinkle, a well-known urologist and trained hypnotist to activate her stress. Once under hypnosis, Judy began to uncover repressed memories of an alien abduction encounter that took place during the sighting that the four witnesses only made several weeks prior. According to Judy and later cooperated by her daughter after she'd also undergone hypnosis therapy before women were taken on the craft and witnessed two alien entities performing a series of surgeries and experiments. The event began as Judy claimed that while under hypnosis, she felt the impossible feeling of being in two places at once, as if holding conflicting memories of her standing outside the car and being taken up into the ship. As if the memories of her standing beside the car were implanted over her real memories of the abduction. She would also provide the additional statements surrounding their abduction and ascent into the craft. 
It's like a spotlight shining down on the back of my car and it's like it has this substance to it. I can see an animal being taken up into this. I can see it squirming and trying to get free and it's like it's being sucked up. End quote. The first experiment they witnessed was that of small entities cutting apart a cow and removing its organs for study. Throughout the experiment, the woman claimed that they would feel the thoughts and emotions of the small alien entities and could feel how robotic and inhuman they were. Judy herself claimed the alien creatures possessed no form of empathy and were merely curious creatures with no concept of emotional bias. Not even showing emotion when it came to the pain screams of the bovine creature during its examination, causing her own fear to grow that the alien creatures were capable of far more sinister actions without a consequence. Following the cow examination, Judy claimed to have seen her daughter being placed on an operating table as the aliens began taking a variety of samples. However, Judy nor the daughter go into details about what they mean by this or what they witnessed, with her only statement being the following. They don't listen, they just ignore me and go about their work as if it's nothing. They don't seem to have emotions. They don't seem to care. They just took some samples from her. End quote. Once the hypnosis therapy was finished, Judy's symptoms cleared up almost immediately and she remarked that Normacki resumed back into her life, as her anxiety was nearly completely alleviated. Although skeptics have continued to deny her claims, all witnesses confirm each other's stories and leave behind a grave warning that visiting alien life is far more sinister, not because of some sadistic pleasure, but because they're far less human than anyone could imagine and will do whatever they want to satisfy their own curiosity, even if such actions lead to the harm of those around them. Before we continue, I have a small request for you. We've created a new channel where we upload content related to old, historical ruins and interesting events. So, if you're interested, kindly subscribe to my channel, Decoverize, for daily interesting videos and show some love in the comments. I'll read every one of your comments. The link is in the description. Okay, let's continue. The Dewey Lake Monster The Dewey Lake Monster is reported to be a humanoid bipedal creature standing at an approximate height of 9 feet tall, covered from head to toe in thick hair. Witness sightings differ in some regard on the texture and color, given that many different lighting conditions in which witness encountered the creature. In some cases, the creature's hair is red and matches closely with brownish bark. Appears to have a texture that matches the trunk of a tree with many witnesses mistaking the creature to have been a standing tree. Some claim that the creature has no visible face or has a visible black face with reflective eyes and sharp teeth that become visible only when the mouth opens. Witnesses consistently report the smell of a strong odor or skunk-like stench that accompanies the creature. The Dewey Lake monster has made several non-human sounds, such as a deeper yelling tone, impossible for a human to replicate, barking noises, ear-splitting honking sounds, and piercing screams that have caused ear damage and could be heard over a tremendous distance. Some of the encounters have been compared to the sound of a wild goose or a large dog, whereas other encounters claim the sound to have been impossible to describe or identify. The creature has demonstrated multiple forms of adapted locomotion. One such ability is the proficiency to swim and dive of expert quality with the creature able of staying underwater for tremendously longer periods of time than is possible for humans or any other known creatures. It's also been reported to be able to run on all four limbs at speed that tops 30 miles per hour and has demonstrated violent tendencies against cars and individuals. The Berry Patch Salt and Hill Sighting on the 1st of June back in 1962, four young boys were playing around Suntan Hill, located near Dewey Lake Street in Michigan. The boys, Jimmy Andre, Jeff Hall, Gary Lee, and Al Johnson, were familiar with playing by themselves in wooded areas and had made a game of their adventures called Playing Army. While Neil Suntan Hill, the children would run around pretending to fight each other with large sticks and engage in pretend battles for several hours. Estimated to have been sometime around 4.23 p.m., the children decided to take a break and eat their pre-packed lunch that consisted of packed sandwiches, which had been left in Geralia's Boy Scout backpack located at the bottom of the hill. The children began to race down the hill, with the four of them splitting off into two groups of two, with Gary Lee and Al Johnson forming the first group and Jimmy Andrew and Jeff Hall forming the second group. Taking two separate paths, Gary Lee and L. Johnson would reach the bottom of the hill first and would spend a considerable amount of time waiting for Jimmy Andrew and Jeff Hall to arrive. After around 10 to 15 minutes, the second group of boys would arrive suffering from an intense form of hysteria which was brought on by fear, with Jimmy's pants having been completely soaked through with urine from a terrifying encounter. 
According to the two boys, they took a separate longer path down the bottom of Suntan Hill that passed through a patch of wild raspberries. While they were passing through the patch, they began racing each other in a small competition to see who could eat the most wild raspberries, pushing and pulling at each other and snatching the raspberries out of each other's hands. Suddenly Jimmy had frozen placed while staring off into the distance and appeared to have a scared or grimacing look on his face as he was frozen. Jeff turned instead at Jimmy for a while, believing that his friend was playing a strange prank or trying to scare him. Tried to figure out what he was doing. Without turning to see what Jimmy had been looking at, Jeff began making mocking faces at Jimmy, mimicking the scared, wild-eyed emotions of the boy before running up to him and pushing him until he fell over. Jeff would later recount that before Jimmy had frozen in shock, a large gust of wind appeared to have blown in, causing weeds to fly around. Once Jimmy was on the ground, the wind continued to grow in force, flying Jeff's head off his head and landing a distance away in the nearby grass. As Jeff ran to chase his hand, he noticed what Jimmy had been staring at and felt the ground in fear. According to Jeff, the object was a bipedal creature of immense height. The creature was covered from head to toe in red hair and looked like a giant tree. Terrified of the creature, Jeff claimed that he began to bark like a dog to scare away the creature, unsure if it was a large unknown animal that would have been frightened by sharp noises. Realizing that the creature was not reacting to his barking, Jeff and Jimmy got up and started to run away from the creature. Once they were an estimated 20 yards away, they turned back around and watched the creature from afar. As they stared at the creature, wants to let out a deafening roar that sounded like the deep-throated scream of a wild man. The kids then ran and met up with Gary Lee and Al Johnson. Testimony later provided by Jimmy's uncle would claim that the event had split the boys up in angry fury with the children never going out again or hanging out with each other. The uncle would provide the following statement. Or being a coward, but even years later Jimmy swore he saw this giant bear with an alligator belly and long legs. Skeptic Explanation believes the children encountered a large black bear, a species of large animals native to West Virginia. The children would deny the claims that the animal was a bear and would remark that the creature stood on its two legs and was covered in reddish or light brown fur. Another interesting account is thought of the moving shadowhawk of a Ray Lane sighting. Almost two months later, on the 20th of July back in 1962, three men Kirk Stover, Vinnie Armstrong and Willis Rind were attacked by an unknown humanoid bipedal creature of a massive size. According to Kirk Stover, he'd recently bought a new mobile trailer for camping and was eager to show it to his two friends, Vinnie Armstrong and Willis Rind. He told his friends to meet him by Huckleberry Lane on the south side of the Dewey Lake and this was for a party at his new mobile trailer. While Kirk Stover was waiting for his friends, he began to notice that the trailer was being pushed and pulled by a great force that rocked the trailer back and forth. Quickly, Kirk Stover ran out of the trailer, believing that his friends were trying to play a prank by rocking the trailer back and forth. As he came storming out of the trailer, ready to yell at his friends and warn them that they were going to knock the trailer over, Stover claimed he was attacked by a massive creature. According to Kirk Stover, he was originally unable to see the creature due to having been attached from behind. When he was attacked, he was immediately thrown to the ground and started to scream thinking he was being attacked by a bear. Before he could turn around, the creature began to drag him a great distance by the legs towards the leg and Kirk became terrified believing that the animal would soon submerge him underwater. As he fought with the creature and struggled, he made several attempts to get away and prevent himself from being dragged towards the water. After struggling for a period of time, suddenly the creature let him go and stopped the attack. It was at this point that Kirk Stover got to his feet and ran as fast away as he could from the creature. When he turned around, he could finally see what had been attacking him. Stover would later provide the following statement. I thought I was being attacked by a bear, but when I tried to run, I saw it. It was standing like a man. It wasn't a bear. I don't know what that thing was. End quote. As soon as Stover had got a distance away from the creature, he hid in the nearby bushes and trees, waiting for the creature to leave before he would make his escape. He then began to realize that the creature had not suddenly become disinterested in the attack because he had been struggling, but that something else had drawn his attention away. At around this time, Vinnie Armstrong and Willis Wright would arrive at the mobile trailer and would spend some time calling out looking for Kirk as they noticed that he was nowhere to be seen. Checking around the trailer, they were puzzled to find no sign of their friend, who left the trailer unlocked and the door completely open. Believing that he was playing a prank, the two men entered the trailer and started to drink all of the beer that they found inside, cracking open a few cans, but not yet enough alcohol to have been impaired. 
As they were waiting for Stover, they grew increasingly suspicious that something bad had happened to their friend. After more than 10 minutes had passed and they had not yet seen their friend, it was at that moment estimated to have been sometime around 8 p.m. that the two men heard the sounds of leaves crunching and twigs snapping outside the trailer, and called out to Kirk believing that he'd finally arrived. Suddenly, the two men felt the violent shaking of the trailer rock back and forth, which caused them to fall to the ground spilling their beers. Vinny would provide the following statement, I was thinking we're going to go into the water. The two men would make their way out of the trailer by crawling on the rocking ground and sliding out the door. As soon as they were out of the trailer, they saw Kirk Stover running towards them from a distance away. Kirk realized that the monster suddenly ignored him to go after his two friends who had arrived at the trailer. He had not known that his friends had arrived. But it was clear that the monster had somehow become aware of this moment and decided to go back to the trailer. Once the monster was out of the sight of Kirk Stover, he got up from his hiding place and began to run back to the trailer, running into Vinnie Armstrong and Willis Wright who appeared to have been suffering a terrible find. Willis Wright and Vinnie Armstrong had believed that they were being attacked by a large bear. And at the sight of witnessing Kirk Stover running up towards them soon realized that something far more strange was taking place. As the men were telling each other what they'd experienced, the three turned to see what they described as a large shadow passing by the lights forming from the lake, the light most likely having been a reflection of the light caused by the moon, which was in its waning gibbous phase at the time. Willis later said the following, it was huge. I mean big. All three of us saw it. We jumped. It went back down to the lake, then splashed and disappeared. Once the creature entered the waters, the men notified the local law enforcement about their encounter, who would later dismiss the event after finding several cans of spilled alcohol throughout the trailer. The Magician Lake sighting 26 days later on the 15th of August back in 1962, two witnesses, Roger Long and Helen Borges, would encounter a humanoid bipedal giant while visiting the Magician Lake, one of the sister lakes of Dewey Lake during the early morning. According to the couple, they'd been riding around in the motorboat or throughout the Magician Lake, resting occasionally around a small cluster of islands seen in the lake. Although it was too early to see into the water clearly, the couple would notice a very large hairy animal swimming around in the lake, near to their motorboat, and would occasionally watch it submerge for a period of time and splash around. The couple remarked that they believed the animal to have been a deer, and so they watched it for some time, enjoying the novelty of the sighting. Once the light became more clear, however, they began to realize that the creature was definitely not a deer and was some unknown large hairy animal. As curious as to what the creature could have been, the couple continued watching until it reached the nearby shore. Once on the shore, the animal stood up on its two legs and turned to the couple. Roger Long said the following. It walked out of the water straight up on the shore. It was around twice the size of a full-grown man. It looked back at us and then disappeared into the woods. End quote. The couple then saw the creature do a shuddering motion, causing all the water to come off its hairy body as the creature slowly made its way into the nearby forest. Robert Long would immediately report the sighting to the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Roy Townsend sighting. Nine days later, on the 24th of August back in 1962, the police received several phone calls reporting a large explosion that had been heard coming from Priest Street of Michigan. Investigating the cause of the explosion, police located a flipped car that had been completely scorched. Shortly after the flames being put out, the police received a call from Mildred Whittingmore. A local resident, the two teenagers came out to her house for help after suffering from a terrible accident. Once the police arrived, the two teenagers were hesitant to tell the officers what had transpired, with one of the teenagers, Roy Townsend, claiming that they'd been parked up when another car hit them. After some coaxing from the officers, the two teenagers, Roy Townsend and Jane Arnett, provided the full story. While the teenagers were sitting alone in the car together, the car had suddenly been lifted and flipped on its hood. Roy Townsend claimed to have seen a humanoid bipedal giant man smashing the car. Jane Arnett would claim that Roy Townsend would immediately flee the scene, leaving her behind. Jan would then crawl her way out of the car while screaming in terror and would meet up with Townsend later on the side of the highway a distance away from the accident. After a period of wondering, the two teenagers would find a nearby home and ask for assistance. The local law enforcement initially proved to be skeptical. Investigators from one of the multi-jurisdictional officers, Officer Gerald Jones, however, believed the teenagers after analyzing the time marks from the wreckage. According to Officer Jones, skid marks were visible on the road that continued over the hill and down the road. 
which proved that the car had been in parked position and was pushed at a constantly slow rate of speed. Towards the end of the skid marks, the pivot point where the car had been flipped was clearly defined on the road, which provided evidence that the car had been lifted in an upward direction from a stationary position. If the car had been flipped due to losing control of the car at a high rate of speed, the skid marks would have ended at the peak of the hill and not have been following the road at the descent down with an ending pivot mark. Ritelmsen and Jan did not suffer any physical injuries, but would break up shortly after the incident and suffer from temporary hysteria. Michigan Swamp Sighting A little over a month later, on the 30th of September 1962, for friends who were visiting from Chicago and unaware of the monster sightings in the region visited the Twin Lakes, one of the sister lakes of Dewey Lakes, to see the opening of a musical fountain. Roughly 15 minutes away from the Twin Lakes, while traveling on the Dewey Lake Road, the four witnesses Terry Jones, Randy Emmys, Beth Hormel, and Patty Pasternak were stopped in the middle of the road late at night, sometime around 9 p.m., as it appeared to them that a tree had been growing in the middle of the street. Unsure of what it was they were looking at, the tree suddenly turned around and faced the four friends who got a clear look at the creature. The women in the car screamed so loud that the driver panicked and began to drive towards the creature. The bipedal humanoid giant then began to walk away towards the nearby swamp and entered the water casually, disappearing on the north side of Dewey Lake Street. The Jamie Shaw Encounter Five children on a late Sunday night would witness one of the most terrifying encounters of the Dewey Lake Monster, and this was on the 30th of December 1962. According to the witnesses, Jamie Shaw, Mark Miller, Dale Howe, Yana Keen, and Katie Keen, they were all playing around Dewey Lake Street, looking for a rare lunar moth species native to the region. Throughout their hunt, Jamie Shaw became interested in several lights in the sky that could be seen across the street, and this was towards the nearby swamp. Jamie Shaw told the other children that he was going to go firefly hunting instead. Although the other children would tell Jamie that there were no lights in the sky and that fireflies weren't around during that time of year, Jamie would continue closer to the swamp disregarding their advice. At around 9 p.m., Katie King's mother would call for the children to come home and notice that Jamie Shaw had yet to return. When she asked the children where he was, the other kids told her that he'd gone to chase fireflies. Originally, the group did not panic, believing instead that Jamie Shaw was just slightly out of earshot of them and so began searching for him. It was shortly after 9 p.m. that panic began to arise and it became obvious that Jamie Shaw was missing. Dale Howell's mother and Jamie Shaw's mother would quickly be alerted about the missing child. The neighborhood came together to search for the missing boy before alerting local law enforcement, spending roughly 30 minutes searching for Jamie Shaw. The neighbors were prepared to alert law enforcement when a local resident, Harry Woods, found Jamie Shaw curled up in a weeded area located besides the swamp, badly bruised and injured all over. Jamie Shaw would immediately be treated for his injuries and would return to school three days later, telling everyone that he had been attacked by a huge hairy man who hit him to the ground and threw him towards the swamp. Lying in the wooded area, Jamie hid from the monster and stayed there until help would arrive. Jamie's teacher, Michelle, would remark that she believed Jamie's testimony after having questioned him privately for telling lies to other kids and seeing the bruises on his body and having him recount in eerie detail everything that had happened. Betty Garcon Sighting On the 31st of October 1962, Betty Garcon would take a train ride from Detroit, Michigan to Chicago that would travel through the Michigan area. Around 10 p.m., the train made a slow stop near the Dewey Lake Street to investigate claims of severe debris on the tracks. While the train was stationed for around 15 minutes, Betty noticed what she described as a faceless tree or a giant stump that stood in the distance, approaching the train from the woods. Betty would claim that for the first few minutes. She was unsure of what she was looking at as the mouse appeared to have been standing motionless for several minutes, confusing her as to if it was a creature or a fallen tree. Suddenly, the figure began moving from the tree lean towards the rear of the train. At this point, Betty would motion to two other passengers, Emily Clark from Chicago and Roger Wentworth from St. Louis, to confirm her sighting. All three would claim to be winners to the event and confirm Betty's sighting. The passengers on the train would then hear a loud metal impact against the train before it was then moving again, with the train porter claiming that the sound was caused by a cold start on the rural tracks. Once arriving at their destination, the rear end of the train would see a considerable dent in the side of the yen car. The witness would report their sighting, providing testimony that the creature was a hairy bipedal humanoid creature that stood 10 feet tall and was estimated to have weighed 700 to 1,000 pounds. 
The Chicago police artist would draw their sighting, creating the Gar Contrain sighting sketch, of which would show one of the first designs of a Sasquatch-like creature. Camp sighting. On the 20th of June, 1963, students from the Dorjak school system would get to enjoy the end-of-the-year activity in which all of the students would journey to Finch Camp for outdoor education. Finch Camp was used as a way for students to study in Michigan geography, learn outdoor skills, and appreciate the natural beauty of their state. Many of the camp classes included activities like archery, track and racing, and traditional survival studies. Two of the students, Denise McCormick and Jenny Fisher, while participating in the outdoor archery class, had misfired an arrow and went to retrieve it by venturing further out into the wilderness. While looking for their arrow, the two students claimed to have seen a huge, stinky, hairy man and said it was staring at them, which caused them to run back to their camp in terror. When the two students returned, they told their friends about the encounter, and soon all of the students were made aware of the story. Later that night, the cabin in which the two students were staying in, alongside several other students, was attacked by a creature that began slamming itself against one of the cabins. The girls were all screaming, and one of the students ended up flying out of her bed from the force of the strikes. And the shaking of the cabin. That next morning, the group of students discovered that the foundation of the cabin had been cracked, as if a tremendous force had been attempted to lift the cabin from the ground. Additionally, two large inhuman footprints were pressed into the mud right where the students had believed the monster was attacking the cabin. Throughout history, various paranormal stories have been told and it seems that the majority of these aren't one of cases. Others have come forward in detail encountering similar things. One of the most common yet frightening entities has been called the shadow person. For many years, a number of people all around the world have reported waking up at night and seeing a mysterious shadow figure in their room. This shadowy figure has over time become famous, leading on to it being given a variety of different names, some of which include the shadow man, the hat man, and the shadow person. The phenomenon has gained widespread popularity and a number of documentaries have been made on the subject, trying to get to the bottom of what people are experiencing. However, it seems the more the subject is looked into, the more questions are put forward. The history of the hat man phenomenon goes way back in time, and different written records of the hat man have been found. In fact, some evidence of a hat man-like entity has been found in scriptures of previous civilizations showcasing that whatever this thing is, it's been plaguing humanity for a long time. Some have gone on to detail that this entity would appear in the corner of a room and that this usually happens while they're sleeping and when they try to move or get away from it, they realize they can't. This has caused some to say this entity is evil. One woman has detailed her encounters with something mysterious. She shared her account with us, saying the following. We originally captured a voice on video while my mom was talking with my one-year-old son. The voice sounded like it said, come, come on, or something along those lines. Then we set up cameras and I called a priest. The priest came the same day when we set up the cameras. Within 24 hours, we captured several smoke videos, two additional instances where we heard a clear voice and it said, I'm tired of you trying to get me out of this house and come see or come sleep. And orbs that when slowed down formed the image of a man and a little girl. I called the priest back for a second blessing and then we disconnected the cameras to avoid giving it any more attention or power. Before this started, my mom and I had been suffering from vivid nightmares and sleep paralysis where I would see shadow man-shaped blobs, sleep hallucinations and voices calling you awake and also feeling things. Lastly, my mother and I used to see the infamous shadow man in the hat when I was younger. This happened when I was around 5. I'm now 35. My mother and grandma saw it while awake. Since we disconnected the video, I'm still having sleep issues and even hallucinating, hearing things like growling, name calling and loud buzzing noises but I am seeing a sleep specialist and attributing it to REM disorder to avoid attention just in case. We don't know why it started, but my mother, myself, and my one daughter have always been sensitive and seen things such as shadow people during sleep awakenings. Before this started, we had enormous negative energy in the household and my sister tried to communicate with something, something that had a bad energy presence. That said, I've always been having horrible nightmares and sleep paralysis more frequently since I moved in here around a year ago. The previous owner had a daughter that was connected to a murder and we actually found a small witch broom in our attic a couple of weeks back with her name on it which we the true cause of what happened is a mystery and maybe a little bit of everything. As mentioned, this isn't the first person to come forward with their encounter. Others have detailed very similar things happening, especially when seeing the entity they call the shadow person. 
One thing that paranormal researchers can't seem to agree on though is what this entity is. Some people believe that Hatman is actually a mysterious entity that's haunted human beings for years and continues to do so in the present day. They believe that the Hatman tries his best to paralyze a person and even go as far as taking their life. However, when it fails to do so, the person lives to tell the tale. Interestingly, some tribes have described seeing a similar looking entity. One is that of the Canadian Inuit people who refer to this entity as Yukum and Gurnik. This mysterious entity is known to paralyze humans with fear, and it seems to suck the breath right out of them. While scientific studies have found a phenomenon known as sleep paralysis, they fail to explain the appearance of the shadow figure. According to one theory, humans are most vulnerable when they're asleep and when they're suffering from sleep paralysis, their brain plays a trick where they believe that someone is ready to harm them. However, there's no scientific evidence supporting this theory. Some people believe that the hat man is actually their own spirit and that it appears as a shadowy figure. They claim that when we're asleep, our spirit leaves our body and sometimes when we suddenly wake up during the middle of the night, our spirit has not yet returned to the body and what we're actually seeing is the hat man is our own spirit. Another person detailed their encounter, saying that they've had nightmares their whole life and during many of these they've encountered the hat man. Going on to say that this faceless being slowly makes its way towards them and once it reaches the bed they then wake up, left scarred and confused about what happened. People like this who have encountered the hat man believe this is a real entity and that its main goal is just to cause fear. There's certainly no shortage of shadow people stories and there seems to be no consistency with it affecting people from all over the world and of all ages. Many of us find space interesting and with things like movies, TV shows and live feeds it's helped a generation of people fall in love with the wonders of our universe. Every year, countless discoveries are made by space agencies with NASA no longer being at the forefront of these discoveries. Other space agencies like SpaceX have stepped up their game, introducing us to new rockets. And even saying things like they plan to put millions of people on Mars within the next few decades. It's these announcements that have made people say that within the next few years, we're going to make big leaps in regards to space travel and discoveries. With more missions than ever being given the green light, people have taken time out to tune into these and wonder where the next one will take us. However, during these events, some people have made some interesting discoveries. Even going as far as saying that when these missions are launched into space, they're not alone. A number of anomalies have been detected by the cameras and this has caused many to slow down the footage in order to work out what these things are. One of the things that people say is when these strange crafts are seen out in space, they can't be ours. Agencies and researchers are quite open about the fact that space is one of the last unexplored frontier for humans. And this has caused amateur researchers to give their own opinions on what they think these objects are. One researcher said the following about this SpaceX video. For the last few days this video has been making its way around Facebook and it shows what it looks like a large object flying close by. I've seen different comments, with some saying that it could be part of the man-made structure that came off during the mission and that the camera managed to pick up on it. While others think that is an unidentified flying object, what's odd is that this object does seem to have a pyramid-like shape and to me it seems big. As mentioned, the clip is currently making the rounds on social media with people confused about what the object is. Some people who slowed down the video suggested that it's actually a triangle UFO, a commonly sighted UFO that's been reported for many years. As suggested in the name, these objects are triangular in shape and have been reported for many years, with UFO researchers saying they're one of the most common UFOs. Interestingly, amateur researchers have said these shaped crafts are also reported in space. Another user said the following about the footage. It's hard to deny that this is a trick of the camera. Whatever this object is, it definitely has the shape of a triangle and it also looks like it has lights on it. I think this is some good evidence we have of an unidentified flying object in space. End quote. Going back a few weeks ago, Elon said the following on Twitter in regards to UFOs, I have seen no evidence of an advanced civilization visiting Earth. Fuzzy pics that are worse than a 7 to 11 security chem frame grab don't count. End quote. Many people hit back at these comments, saying how close-minded and ignorant Elon has been. With one person saying the following, the whole argument around why there aren't clear photographs with UFOs is a frustrating one. Take your iPhone camera, for example, and put it on maximum zoom and see what happens. It immediately goes fuzzy. Then try and take a photograph of something in the distance. Now imagine that object is moving in the sky. Now imagine your inner car wasers is happening. 
it's near impossible to get a clear photograph of anything under these circumstances. One of the things that many people don't seem to mention is that while camera quality in everyday phones has massively increased, they're only really good for up-close photographs. Anything that's over 5 meters away starts to get blurry. Also, the majority of people aren't expecting to see UFOs, so the whole encounter is rushed. People are normally doing everyday things and don't expect to see a UFO. So when it happens, they just pull out their phone and try to take the best photo possible. It's not like people can walk around 24 to 7 with a tripod and a HD camera waiting for UFOs. End quote. As mentioned in previous videos, NASA's stance on these alleged objects is that they're just space debris and don't show anything of interest. Scientists and researchers all agree that these objects don't need to be investigated and go on to say that these are likely camera anomalies. Amateur researchers have hit back at these claims, though, and say that many of these strange objects are detected during lifeines, so before the footage has even gone through any processing stages. Officials stick to their replies, though, and state these are not of interest. What's strange, though, is that there seems to be a bit of a disagreement around unidentified flying objects. You have space agencies and people like Elon saying they don't exist. And then you have the Pentagon and other U.S. officials saying these objects need to be investigated more and even claiming that they've recovered off-world crafts. According to Eric Davis, the astrophysicist claims that the United States Department of Defense is in possession of recovered off-world crafts, and these are verifiably not made on our planet. His story detailed in the New York Times claims that Davis was tasked with giving classified briefings to Defense Department agencies, the Senate Armed Services Committee, and the Senate Intelligence Committee last October. During multiple instances of recovered materials from extraterrestrial events, Davis details that he was unable to determine the source of the materials that made up recovered artifacts, most likely being off-world metals and materials that could not have been terrestrial in nature. These massively different opinions have caused some to think that NASA are not letting us in on what they know, and with some UFO researchers even praising the government for being open about this topic. It seems that time will tell whether we're told more in regards to this subject. One of the greatest inventors to have lived was that of Nikola Tesla. At the time, his unique mind wasn't appreciated and in some cases people even tried to brand him as a mystic and someone who didn't know what he was talking about. However, these comments didn't stop him and Nikola Tesla wasn't one to shy away from electricity and being able to harness it. One of his famous quotes was the following, I have worked out a dynamic theory of gravity in all details and hope to give this to the world very soon. Nikola Tesla has impacted your life in one way or another. For example, electricity, radar, microwaves, the radio, drones, and many other things. All these came from the great mind that was Nikola Tesla. Recently, the FBI has released 64 pages of unreleased documents. And these include things like papers and documents that were collected shortly after Nikola Tesla passed away. For many years now, theories have been floating around as to why Tesla's work was collected by the government. Some have said that Tesla's work wasn't important and wouldn't have impacted us and that the ideas and inventions he was working on didn't work or were just made up. So, if this was the case, why then did the United States government quickly swoop in and collect his work shortly after he'd passed away? Tesla's work obviously caught the attention of the FBI's. They wanted to come through what he'd been working on. One of their reasons for doing this was to ensure that any of his work didn't get into the wrong hands. For this reason, they decided it would be best if Tesla's documents remained in the property of the Office of Alien Property Custody and, this was however until the documents and other pieces of Tesla's work mysteriously disappeared after the war. Interestingly enough discussion had been created that the public was aware of some of these alleged inventions and it even caused citizens to question Director J. Edgar Hoover about what Tesla was working on. It's some of these excerpts, though, that caused many people to question why the government would look into this, and not only that, but also keep it a secret. These are some experts from the official FBI documents that got released. This letter will not reach you in time to sight flying saucers over New York on the night of June 13th from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m., but there will again be full-scale operations of flying saucers over all American areas on July 1st. This will be in three phases as follows. New York areas July 1st, 9 a.m. Washington, D.C. areas 9.25 a.m. 
General North American Errors After 9.25 AM Central American Errors 9.30 AM South American Errors 9.35 AM Second Phases Same Errors as Above Beginning at 12 Midday July 1st Third Phase Full Scale Operations Over. All American Errors Beginning at 7 PM on the Evening of July 1st The above information has been supplied by George King Editor of Cosmic Voice 88 The Drive Mansions, Fulham Road in London. Also, please note that George King has also published back issues of Cosmic Voice in one volume. This is beyond doubt the funnest source of messages that we know of. George King is considered the best telepathic contacts that the space people have. Although George Van Tassel is the funnest we have in America, Margaret Storm has been assigned to certain work with the space people. As follows, she is writing a book, a story of the life of Nikola Tesla and the part his inventions will play in the New Age. Much of the data for this book has been supplied to Mrs. Storm through transcripts received on the Tesla's End, a radiotype machine invented by Tesla in 1938 for interplanetary communication. Tesla died in 1943 and his engineers did not build the Tesla set until after his death. It was placed in operation in 1950 and since the time the Tesla engineers have been in close touch with space gyms. The space people have visited the Tesla engineers many times and have told us that Tesla was a Venetian brought to this planet as a baby in 1856 and left with Mr. and Mrs. Tesla in remote mountain provenance in what is now Yugoslavia. On 26th and 27th of January 1943, an examination was made of the technical papers of Dr. Nikola Tesla, which after his passing had been stored in the Manhattan warehouse in New York City. This examination was made for the purpose of determining if any ideas of significant value in the present United States war effort could be found among his possessions. New York Office of the Alien Property Custodian, Dr. Charles of the Washington Office of Scientific Research and Development, and John G. Trump of the Office of Scientific Research and Development of Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The following papers, which were regarded as typical of Nikola Tesla's writings and thoughts in the period of 1925 to 1942, were removed for the purpose of record and listed below in random order in which they were found, together with a brief individual abstract. Exhibit A, Possibilities of Electrostatic Generators. An updated article probably written about 1934 discussing the possibilities as a source of high-voltage DC power of the Van de Graaff of electrostatic belt generator. The article states correctly the electrostatic principle employed in this device and points out that suck generators are not suitable for commercial, high-powered applications, though of undoubted scientific value. Tesla's wireless tower erected in 1902 on Long Island is stated in this memorandum to have charged to 30 million volts. Exhibit B, Reactive Force of Glycerin and Dynamite. An updated memorandum involving some calculations of the explosive power of certain compounds, and then deviating to a discussion of the possibility of transmitting power by mechanical vibrations along the Earth's crust. Exhibit C, Process of Degasifying, Refining, and Purifying Metals. A 40-page memorandum probably written around 1930 detailing with the above subject and proposing new theories of capillarity and surface tension. These correspondence indicated these had been submitted to various industry companies. Exhibit D, replying to Antwerp regarding the generation of high voltage and acceleration of charged particles. This document dated 8th of November 1935 answers questions raised by Soviet engineers and scientists regarding Tesla's proposal array. From this answer is deduced that the proposal concerned the generators of high voltage by electrostatic means. These means consisted of a high voltage terminal presumably supported on an isolating column and charged by a gaseous charge conveying medium passing between ground and terminal. The ideas contained in this memorandum are fairly similar to the bulk conveyor electrostatic generator proposed by Van de Graaff and do not appear to offer any unusual features. End quote. There are some, however, that believe these documents are not telling us everything, and that there's a possibility some of Tesla's work and inventions are being held back. It's interesting because during Tesla's life, he claimed to have contacted and heard voices through transmitters. Tesla wrote extensively in his notes that when he made the first radio capable of receiving and broadcasting his signal as soon as he turned on the device, he could already hear another person's voice on the other side. He said he could hear a voice calling out his name, saying Tesla 123. Some have suggested that what he was hearing may have been the space people.
With the advancement of technology, millions of us are now able to tune into live streams to watch the launches of space missions. There's never been a better time to access space footage from home. However, this footage often causes controversy in UFO circles with hundreds of images and clips hitting the web and becoming the subjects of viral debates. There are people that spend hundreds of hours carefully analyzing footage, looking for anything that may seem unusual. One place where alleged UFOs have been seen is that of Mars. Ever since humans managed to send rovers to Mars, there have been people who have claimed to have seen Martian objects on the planet's surface. Famous authors and scientists have long speculated about possible Martian life on the planet, so it was inevitable that humans would become fascinated with signs of life once we reached its surface. UFO hunters online have spent hundreds of hours scanning through thousands of live streams and NASA photographs in the hopes of finding something strange. This has in turn caused other researchers to try their luck in finding anomalies in these photographs, and it seems that there's no shortage of strange images. One photograph that was sent to me several years ago was this one, with the individual saying that it looks like a large object can be seen hovering above the Martian surface. Not much information could be gathered about the photograph, with them saying that they sent it to me because they thought it was a UFO. Others have seen similar-looking objects on the Martian surface, with one UFO researcher saying the following, seeing unidentified flying objects on the Martian surface is not uncommon. And if you're patient and have time to look through the massive NASA library, you will likely discover one yourself. I've seen many objects hovering above Mars, some of which are similar to orbs while others look like large triangular graphs. I believe that something is happening on Mars that we're not being told about. Another place where UFOs have been reported is that of the International Space Station. UFOs have been seen countless times on live streams and photographs, but there are some which have caused more of a stir on life. The NASA live stream from the International Space Station seems to have caught three ought which appear to pass close to the ISS. UFO enthusiasts were left debating what the objects were online. It's not one, but three objects came into view on the NASA live feed. Some thought that these objects could have been surveilling human space missions while others tried to pass them off as a lens flare or other more common occurrences. While UFO enthusiasts were quick to acknowledge the mysterious smoke objects, NASA claims these interferences with live streams are simply lens distortion and not some type of alien craft. While some UFO researchers have said that these unknown crafts could be of alien origin, scientists have said this is not the case and we shouldn't always jump to conclusions. In 2016, another random object was caught on camera and appeared to fly by the ISS. A diamond-shaped object could be initially seen, but as the footage went on the object appeared to be changing its shape and the NASA life feed was randomly cut at the same time. Viewers looking at a blue screen in this instantly caused wild speculation online as to why NASA cut the live feed. NASA later claimed they'd not cut the live feed intentionally and stated they had in fact lost transmission. The timing of the lost transmission seemed all too coincidental to viewers and many were left believing a cover-up was the real reason for the live feed cut. In April 2017, another mysterious object caught the attention of UFO hunters and this was again on a live stream. A cylinder-type object entered the view of the camera and was quickly spotted by UFO enthusiasts. Other mysterious footage seen on the ISS live stream went viral when viewers claimed to have seen a mysterious object heading directly towards the ISS before quickly disappearing from view, despite some saying it was an unidentified flying object. I've suggested it was nothing more than space junk. Ivan Vanner, a Russian astronaut on the International Space Station, claimed to have caught a UFO on camera. Vanna tweeted the following, Space guess or how I filmed the new time lapse. The video which lasts for one minute shows the auroras passing near Antarctica and Australia. Vanner also said this, however, in the video you will see something else, not only the aurora. The incredible footage shows the curved edge of the Earth at night, with the green lights of the auroras moving across its surface, with several objects visible in the background. Between 9 and 12 seconds there are objects which appear to be flying in a formation. Though the video is a time lapse, so even though in the tweet they appear quickly, the actual footage of the objects flying would be around 52 seconds in real time. The International Space Station is a UFO hotspot when it comes to these sightings. Are alien life forms trying to understand and follow our space endeavors? Or do you think these are just space debris being picked up by the space station cameras? Another common place where unidentified flying objects have been reported is that of our moon. In 2016, hundreds of UFOs were reported to have been seen taken off from the surface of the moon. 
However, experts have claimed this is just a natural phenomenon, which is seen any time you look at the edge of the moon's surface. Experts claim that what's been seen is nothing more than an optical illusion caused by digital glitches known as artifacts. Though many UFO sightings are reported, NASA live feeds are often among the most prominent places for UFO researchers to find sightings of mysterious objects. There are many more UFO hunters who don't take to observing the skies at night, but rather observe space from their computers, looking through hundreds of photos and watching live feeds. They say this is one of the best ways to see these strange objects and that it allows you to compare them to photographs taken a matter of seconds before. Still, UFO researchers and scientists still disagree on what they're seeing, with scientists saying these are nothing more than natural phenomena, while UFO researchers think these UFOs belong to something much more advanced than us. Mars is a planet that's of high interest. For years, NASA have been carrying out various experiments on the Red Planet, with other space agencies such as SpaceX saying they're also interested in Mars even going as far as saying that within the next 10 years they want to put humans on the Martian soil. According to NASA, Mars is a planet that doesn't really have much going on, saying that the climate is harsh and there's no forms of life. Interestingly though, various people have managed to capture some interesting photos of the Martian surface, with amateur researchers saying there's more going on there than what we're being told. One idea that's put forward is that Mars is actually full of precious metals, with gold being one of the main ones. NASA have even said that gold likely exists on Mars in trace amounts. Mars has the largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons, and it's been theorized that gold could be near the surface of Mars as this volcano is still relatively young. Going back a few years ago, amateur researchers posted images online allegedly showing what looks like small gold nuggets. One idea that was put forward was that the rock could be from a meteorite impact, and this isn't a far-fetched idea either, with scientists saying that over 200 meteorites hit the planet every year. The photographs were taken on the 26th of November, and NASA scientists said they'll now try to locate the objects so they can take more detailed photographs. These recent images are the ones that's currently making the rounds, allegedly showing what looks like large gold deposits on the Martian surface. Various people on Facebook groups gave their opinion on what they could be, with one user saying the following, I think there's more to Mars than what they're letting on, and these discoveries prove it. I think there are large gold deposits that run through the surface of the planet. Maybe that's why space agencies are gearing up to go there. We know there's water deposits there. So who knows what else is there? End quote. It seems we'll have to wait for future missions to see if there's as much gold as people make out, or if it's just shiny rocks, as some researchers suggest. Although this may be the case, astronomers have said that space is littered with many interesting objects, one of which is that of the billionaire banking asteroid, more commonly known as 16 Psyche. An asteroid hitting Earth normally isn't a good thing. However, in March 1892, scientists discovered an incredible asteroid that's unlike any other that's out in our vast universe. 16 Psyche, as it was named, is not a rocky or icy body but rather made up of valuable metals that are currently found in our core. Some of these metals are used in everyday industry and some are a little more special. One of these metals is gold. In theory, we have a massive space bank sitting thousands of miles above us, somewhere between Mars and Jupiter. 16 Psyche measures around 140 Mars in Aimter and makes up around 1% of the mass of the main asteroid belt. It's thought to be a stripped core of another planet, allowing scientists to gain a deeper understanding of what our planet's core is like. It's one of the biggest asteroids in the solar system, meaning if it did hit Earth, it would take a lot of people before anybody got their hands on any gold. However, if in theory scientists could harness the asteroid and bring it back to Earth, then the wealth that could be obtained would be unimaginable. As far as scientists currently know, this value stands at around 700 quatillion dollars. The thing is that making everybody billionaires would basically keep everybody at the same level of wealth they were before. The world economy is only worth around $59 trillion, so if 700 quatillion was injected into it, the entire world economy would crash and would essentially render money worthless. For example, loaves of bread and points of milk would begin to be priced at millions of pounds and holidays at billions. In other words, there would be a massive inflation. Gold will no longer be worth as much and this process is already underway as companies start to look at mining asteroids closer to Earth. Whilst we're on the business side of things, companies may begin to monopolize the mining of these asteroids, which would keep gold prices high and out of the hands of the average person. This sort of thing has happened before with valuable minerals and metals. 
In the 1800s South Africa, the De Beers company effectively monopolized the diamond industry, inventing the cliché a diamond is forever. Now NASA is hoping to send a craft to visit the asteroid in 2022, arriving in 2026. It offers NASA the chance to research forever about what our own planet is composed of, and to delve deeper into the history of how terrestrial planets came to exist. However, it seems highly unlikely that any of the gold in the chest will be in yours on my hands anytime soon. Something we can only dream of. It does show us though an example of what could be out there in the endless expanse of space. This incredible object was found within our solar system. Something that is monumentally small when compared to the universe. It's one of the reasons that people have an open mind about things when it comes to our universe. Due to it being so vast, the possibilities are endless. As mentioned, companies like NASA and SpaceX are gearing up to send humans back into space, with missions being planned for the Moon and Mars. SpaceX has announced their plans to send over 1 million people to Mars by 2050. And not only this, but they plan to build an actual city for these people in the hopes that a new civilization can be started. Elon Musk stated in various tweets that the end goal is to get 1 million people on Mars and he hopes to do this within the next few decades. He also said that he hopes that 1,000 starships can help him achieve this. He goes on to say that the goal is to be able to launch several of these starships a day so that trips to Mars can be open all the time. Over the years, NASA have conducted various experiments, many of which have been carried out in space. One of the things that NASA boasts is a massive library of photographs, and although some of these don't include anything interesting, there's some that stand out more than others. NASA's Space Shuttle Columbia Mission STS-58 was a spaceflight mission carried out to help aid in life science research. NASA said the following about the mission on their website. Countdown proceeded smoothly to liftoff, delayed only by a few seconds because of an aircraft in the launch zone. Fourteen experiments conducted in four areas, physiology, cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, and neuroscience. Eight of the experiments focused on crew, six on 48 rodents. Crew collected more than 650 different samples from themselves from rodents, increasing stat space for life science research. Combined data from SLS-1 and SLS-2 will help build a comprehensive picture of how humans and animals adapt to weightlessness. However, during this mission they also took various photographs of our planet. Interestingly, some of these contain anomalies that's caused some to ask questions. It's no secret that supposed UFOs have been captured in NASA photographs. In fact, even astronauts themselves have come forward and said they think they've captured UFOs. Although NASA have said there's no proof in these sightings and that they've never captured a UFO in any of their photographs, other people think this isn't the case. However, NASA have said that everything mysterious can be explained as space debris. Regardless, there's those that believe this isn't the case. And in some older NASA photographs, mysterious anomalies can be seen. One old photograph from the STS-58 mission is this one, which appears to show an unidentified flying object. The object in question is black and looks to have two wings. It can be seen hovering above the planet and not far from the STS. What's odd is that many of these strange objects have been witnessed around these older NASA missions, causing some to speculate about what they could possibly be. There's one group of people that believe these are unidentified flying objects and that they approach our crafts in order to see what we're doing. This idea isn't supported by mainstream scientists, but amateur researchers say the subject needs to be taken more seriously and that there's thousands of NASA photographs like this that show mysterious objects getting very close to our missions. Of course, when it comes to objects like this, there's always the possibility that it could be space junk. Even though, as some have pointed out, many of these objects do appear to look like shims and not just random pieces of space junk. As mentioned, astronauts have come forward over the years and reported seeing mysterious objects, some of which have flew past them while in space. They've also gone on to detail mysterious glowing objects, large objects that appear to look like shims, and even objects that appear to travel thousands of miles per hour, beating anything that we have on Earth. Interestingly, when images like this get shared, it reminds some of the Black Knight satellite. A strange satellite that's said to have been placed above our planet in order to spy on the human race. Scientists have said there's around 3,000 human-made satellites in orbit around the Earth. After the Soviet Union launched the very first artificial satellite into orbit in 1957, various countries around the world have sought to compete, and satellites today are used for communication, navigation, and exploration. 
One mysterious satellite that's been capturing people's attention for many years is that of the Black Knight satellite. Those who've studied it have said the satellite must be one of the oldest ones orbiting our planet and that it wasn't placed there by humans. This idea then suggests that the satellite is much older than many human civilizations, causing some to speculate that it could be thousands of years old. This has caused theorists to say that this ancient object is transmitting signals to somewhere in space. This mysterious satellite has been featured in the media since the late 1950s and it's become one of the most talked about objects in space, with some thinking that this satellite is a spy satellite. One of the first people to allegedly pick up on the object was that of Nikola Tesla, a Serbian-American inventor who would change the world we live in. Those who have been looking for signs of extraterrestrial life have said that this satellite is one of the best pieces of evidence we have so far. It's important to note that researchers and scientists have said that Black Knight satellite is not real and that what people are seeing is just pieces of space junk. The space above our planet is littered with old satellites and materials, with some researchers saying that space debris that's high in altitude will stay in orbits the longest. Low-orbit objects dropping back to Earth within several years. Upon first seeing images like these, people have suggested it could be the Black Knight satellite. One person said the following, I find the idea of the Black Knight satellite interesting and firstly it's not a piece of space debris. The famous photographs are the well-known ones, but this satellite has been picked up on for decades. Way before the supposed 1998 thermal blanket. Photographs from the 1970s and 80s show a mysterious looking satellite above our planet. So the thermal blanket theory doesn't hold up even though I'm sure it does explain some of the sightings. What I find interesting about this satellite though is who placed it there. Why was it placed here? Why is it still being captured in photographs today? Are we actually being monitored? It does sound out there, but the photographs speak for themselves. End quote. As mentioned though, NASA have said these photographs are nothing more than space debris and that they've never picked up on an ancient satellite above our planet. Space truly is one of the last unexplored frontiers and it's likely that within the next few decades we'll start venturing into space. The idea of this is exciting, but even scientists have said it's unlikely we'll make it out of our solar system. Space is so vast, and every year researchers make incredible discoveries, all of which help us to understand how monumentally massive the universe is. So although there's no chance of us venturing too far, perhaps that doesn't matter as we're already being visited. It seems that time will tell whether these objects are the real deal or are just being misidentified. Technology is always improving. Scientists and researchers are experimenting with technology more than ever. What this means is that we are making breakthroughs in different departments, and one of these is that of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence makes it possible for machines to learn from experience. This means that repetitive actions will be picked up much quicker. This is why researchers have come forward and said that certain jobs will be lost to artificial intelligence. Movements, especially those that require repetitive movements. Various experiments have been announced over the years with some questioning whether we should be playing around with things like AI. For example, it was announced not too long ago that Facebook was using chatbots. The reason this made the news was because the AI chatbots did something unexpected although the bots were given specific scripts to use. They seemingly began communicating with one another in their own language. Humans were unable to understand communication between the chatbots or grasp how it was developed with no human input. This information is kind of scary but yet impressive as it speaks to where we stand with artificial intelligence and what it's capable of. Again though, this calls on to question whether we're out of our depths when it comes to AI and whether we should be experimenting with it. In 2018, Harvard scientists hooked a monkey's brain up to a neural network. At first, people questioned why they'd want to do this, but the researchers said they did it to try and simulate individual neurons. The neurons in question are responsible for recognizing different patterns and phases and the scientists attempted to activate those particular neurons. But showing the monkeys images created by this deep learning artificial intelligence. One of the monkeys they tried this on was Ringo and the Harvard scientists said that different photographs were shown to the monkeys and these were created by an artificial intelligence algorithm called Xtreme. Before people get worried though, Ringo wasn't tied up or in any pain when this experiment was taking place. In fact, the scientist said he was very comfortable throughout the whole thing and actually sat in the Harvard lab sipping in orange juice. While the monkey was happy enjoying his juice, the researchers flickered images in front of his eyes. The AI system quickly learned to generate images which would trigger individual brain cells. Incredibly, this was done without activating any of their neighbors. 
The AI system did do this until it got a response from the neurons. And what's incredible though is that the artificial intelligence was able to trigger the neurons in the monkey's brain to create images that resembled faces. The whole idea behind this was to see if this technology could allow us to ask the neurons what they wanted to see. This is uncharted territory and further tests will need to be carried out. Interestingly, this isn't the only test that's linking artificial intelligence and brains. Elon Musk has detailed more about his Neuralink. It's his recent vision that involves AI brain gyms. The company was first set up back in 2018 and as stated on their website, they plan on developing ultra-high bandwidth brain-machine interfaces to connect humans and computers. Elon has even gone as far as saying that this technology could even treat brain injury and trauma. While on the Joe Rogan podcast, he went into more detail about the company and what they plan on doing. Elon said the following, There's still a lot of work to do, but I think we're looking at within a year. I think we have a chance of putting input in one end, having them be healthy and restoring some functionality that they've lost. This isn't science fiction either. The company has brought on various high-profile neuroscientists from top universities. By mid-2019, the company has over $158 million in backing. Some have found it interesting that Elon has gone down this path. After all, he's been very vocal about the dangers of AI and even suggested that in time, artificial intelligence could take over. He warned people about superintelligence, a form of artificial intelligence that's way smarter than us humans. He stated that this AI could create an immortal dictator. His worry is that the development of superintelligence could end up in the form of AI that governs the whole world. Elon said the following, There are many outcomes, but one of the least scary ones is if we had a company or small group of people that manages the superintelligence. This type of technology could take over the world. He went on to say the following, At least when there's an evil dictator that human is going to pass away. But for an AI, there would be no death. It would live forever and then you have an immortal dictator from which we can never escape. That sounds worrying and rightly so. Elon isn't trying to scare people, but is trying to make them understand what implications artificial intelligence could have on the world. Currently, we use AI for everything, and he says it won't be long before it's controlling us completely. Early AI work has allowed us to be where we are today, and it seems that we're not slowing down. Elon has also stated that he thinks the human race will be overtaken by artificial intelligence by 2030 or 2040. That doesn't seem too bad, but in reality, it only gives us 10 years. This study has said that machines could outperform humans in all tasks within 45 years. The stats were gathered from a survey of more than 350 artificial intelligence researchers. However, the study says that within seven years, computers will be better at translating languages, and by 2026, they could be writing our school essays. Another worry is the manipulation of information. Algorithms could be used to affect certain information. Because AI is good at repeating, it could report negative news on certain businesses or individuals. The future of artificial intelligence is uncertain. But researchers have said that people should get used to the idea of robots and AI, and it seems they will be very much a part of our future. Every year, researchers and scientists are making breakthroughs that hopefully will allow humans and machines to live side by side. There are those that have warned us about testing with AI though and that it easily has the capabilities to outsmart humans, demonstrated when the two AIs created its own language to get past humans. It's examples like this that have made some people worried, but researchers have said that as of right now, the majority of testing is under control. Only time will tell whether we made the right decision to continue experimenting. So what do you make of artificial intelligence and the fact that it's become a part of our everyday life? Also, would you guys have one of these implantable brain machine interfaces? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comments section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. For years, Antarctica has been a place of mystery. Its rough conditions meant it was one of the last places people were able to inhabit. Yet, in recent years, various places have been built here, with some officials even calling this place home. Although it's incredible what man has achieved, some have said that other motives brought them here. Although researchers deny the claims that anything strange is going on down in Antarctica, amateur researchers have said there's so much evidence to point that there's more going on in Antarctica than what we're being told. Various different photographs have been presented to back up the idea that Antarctica houses various artifacts, and one of the most common ones that researchers go to is that of unidentified flying objects. 
Although a megalithic structure might be hard to explain, a truly impossible discovery for researchers to dismiss is the supposed findings of unidentified flying objects, saying that these can be found all across the Antarctic continent and have been sighted via the use of satellite surveillance of the entire icy landmass. Researchers have said these are the best pieces of evidence that there are UFOs in the area and that this may be the sole reason why we wanted to go there so badly in the first place. First found by internet theorists, online images have surfaced of flying saucer-like shapes hiding within ice games and remote areas across the Antarctic. Further satellite images can also be seen of large outcroppings that many researchers have speculated are possible crash bahips, which can be seen casting large shadows and patterns directly following each other. Amateur researchers have also claimed there's evidence of trapped unidentified flying objects deep within the glacial formations and they're just trapped there waiting to be uncovered by research teams stationed on the southern continent. One recent photograph that was sent to us was this one, with the individual claiming that it shows a large object that crashed into the thick snow. They claim that the object and trail that can be seen goes on for several hundred feet and says that whatever this object is, it was big enough to leave a large trail behind it. They said the following, while looking on Google Maps, I discovered this strange object in the snow. It looks like something crashed here and left a large trail behind it. I've not seen many of these types of photos before and there wasn't anything around to suggest that it could be something natural. What's interesting about this one is there seems to be a large imprint where the object would have been, but it appears that it's no longer there, leaving me to think that it may have been taken away or that it somehow managed to fly off. I've shown a few people this and they don't think it's natural, saying that it does look like something lodged skidded in the snow. End quote. Another researcher said the following about Antarctica. I think that there's definitely something going down in Antarctica. There's so many anomalies that have come to light in recent years and I think they're here to retrieve these objects. It's why they don't let on what's going on down here. Many strange stories and discoveries have been made in this region, some of which include heavy-duty military trucks, large structures such as pyramids, and the large UFOs that had been found embedded in the ice. It would seem that Antarctica definitely has its secrets. End quote. When seeing these types of photographs, they do look like crash sites. And it's one of the reasons that the UFO community shares these types of images. Saying that this is proof that unidentified flying objects have made contact with our planet. It's also fueled more speculation. As according to many theories, Antarctica is home to many mysterious happenings. It's not just UFOs that can be found in and around the dense snow. Amateur researchers have also said that Antarctica is home to the giant pyramids. Believed to be much larger than the pyramids at Giza, researchers began noticing strange mountains that did not seem to match with the overall landscape of the region. Not only did these supposed large mountains not exist anywhere close to a mountain range, but the region in which they inhabit do not appear to even have the stresses or strains of the tectonic plains that could cause a potential mountain range in the first place. Not only this, but the size of the mountains in these areas end up displaying the proportions of a perfect pyramid with four even sides, a symmetrical peak, and the same degree in slip gradient compared to that of the large pyramids at Giza. Images of these structures and high definition can also be found thanks to researchers. As they say, there's many of these giant structures scattered throughout the region of Antarctica, leading to a number of legends surrounding the icy continent that speak of advanced civilizations before the existence of human civilization. And they once inhabited the land in a far distant and unremembered past. Others have pointed out that pyramid-like structures are found in almost every region across our planet. So why is it so unlikely that they wouldn't exist in Antarctica? Once again, believers have said places like this need to be studied more and taken more seriously. Scientists say though these structures are not proof of UFOs or pyramids and that what people are experiencing is that of pareidolia. This is when the mind plays tricks on us. It makes us think that something's there when it isn't. However, in recent years proof of dinosaurs and ancient fauna have been found in this region showcasing that at one point many different plant species and animals would have called this place home. With amateur researchers saying it's just a matter of time before ancient man gets discovered in this region and that this will help back up the pyramid theory. Going back in early September, it was announced that the FBI was investigating strange reports made by pilots. Two pilots detailed how they saw a mysterious humanoid figure on a jetpack near Los Angeles International Airport. The airline pilots said the humanoid was around 3,000 feet in the air and that whatever it was, it was flying incredibly fast. 
Several U.S. media outlets have managed to get their hands on the alleged recordings of the during the conversation back in September. One of the pilots said the following, Tower American 1997, we just passed a guy in a jetpack. To which the controller on the ground responds with the following, America 1997, okay, were they off to your left side or your right side? The pilot replies saying the individual was on the left side, around 300 feet or so, but sticking with our altitude. A few seconds later, another pilot reports the following to the tower. We just saw the guy pass by us in a jetpack. The controller then tells the pilots to use caution when flying in the area and also puts out a warning stating that there's someone flying around on a jetpack. Someone in the background can be heard saying, only in LA. It's now been reported that the same thing has happened again. Pilots and crew members flying close to Los Angeles International Airport once again saw a mysterious humanoid on a jetpack saying that whatever this was, it was flying at 6,000 feet. The following conversation was recorded. China Airlines 006, we just saw an object at 6,000. LAX Tower 006 Heavy, can you say that one more time, please? China Airlines 006, we saw a flying object like a flight suit jetpack at 6,000. LAX Tower. Was it a UAV or a jetpack? China Airlines 006. Like a jetpack, too shiny is too far. LAX Tower. 006 Heavy. Roger, thank you. Emirates 215 Heavy. There was a jetpack reported around 30 miles ahead. This soon caused various people to give their opinions on what the object could be, with some saying that it's strange how this happened twice now and noting that although we have jetpack-like devices that can take humans into the air, we don't have anything that's able to reach these kinds of altitudes and that also has the ability to overtake planes. One person said the following, it's weird how both of these reports have been made so close to one another. It's a really interesting case. Could this be some kind of new technology that's carrying out experiments above Los Angeles? Either way, it's odd the pilots are saying that it looks like a humanoid on a jetpack. To my knowledge, there's no jetpack in the world that's able to take a human to these kinds of altitudes. End quote. Various officials have also given their opinions on the strange sightings, saying that on paper this sounds like a person on a jetpack. But when you hear the speeds they're going and the altitude they're reaching, this is very unlikely to be a human on a modern-day jetpack. They can't reach these heights, and some of them even need machinery like helicopters to get them to these heights. Other people have decided to look at other possibilities, one of which is that this could be linked to UFOs. Although this isn't supported at this moment in time, technically this is a UFO. It's a flying object that can't be identified. Other amateur researchers have come forward and said this isn't the first time this type of sighting has been reported, going on to say that nearly all of these cases still to this day remain a mystery. The number of pilots who have come forward in detail to see mysterious things isn't anything new. But perhaps the sad part about this is that most of these don't get taken seriously. It seems almost bizarre that someone like a pilot can report something mysterious and no further investigation is carried out. After all, these are the people that spend the most amount of time in the sky. So when they report something strange, it should be taken more seriously. Back in 2014, news broke that pilots on a passenger plane were left confused when they witnessed a flying humanoid going past them at 3,500 feet. They couldn't wrap their heads around how, number one, a human was able to zip past them so quick and secondly where they come from. Aviation experts then admitted that they were too baffled by the reported sightings of a flying humanoid. After making the news, the flying humanoid was then given the name of the Superman of Macclesfield. The mysterious individual suddenly appeared out of nowhere and was able to overtake the Airbus 320. This was while the plane was flying close to Cheshire Town in England. The pilot and first officer reported the strange sighting to air traffic control where at first they thought the individual may have been a paraglider. However, they couldn't see any gear on the humanoid and so ruled this out. Things got even more confusing when air traffic control reported that they hadn't picked anything up on radar. It was as if the mysterious individual appeared and then suddenly vanished. Teams on the ground were sure that the individual that was seen must have been a paraglider. However, further checks were carried out to see if any paragliders or people using parachutes were in the area and it turns out that no one was in the area during the strange encounter. Officials at the UK Airprox Board, who investigate near misses in British airspace, came forward and said they think this is one of those cases that will likely never be solved. The report states the following. They first sighted the object a few hundred meters in the 11 o'clock position, 200 to 300 feet above. 
It passed down the left-hand side of the aircraft at 100 to 200 meters. The crew only saw it fleetingly. There was no time to take avoiding action and they reported they based their assumptions on it being a person under a canopy. But at the time, the skies were clear and the pilots had visibility of around six miles. None of them remember seeing a canopy. It wasn't long before experts at the British Hand Gliding and Paragliding Association got involved and even they said that at the time of the report. And due to the weather conditions, it would have been impossible for a single flyer to be in the area and traveling at the speeds they were. Many strange creatures have been reported throughout the years and although some of these get explained after further investigation, some remain a mystery, leaving the eyewitness with more questions than answers. It's these reports that have led some to investigate these creatures. These individuals call themselves cryptid researchers and say that there's many creatures out there not known to science. Due to all these reports, enough data has been collected to give people a good idea of the creature in question and it seems that there's no shortage of mysterious creature reports. One interesting one that's currently making the rounds is that of a USPS worker who detailed their encounter with a seven-foot-tall red-eyed humanoid. The encounter was shared to the UFO Clearinghouse website in which the eyewitness detailed the following. I had just left work at the USPS sorting facility, which is at O'Hare Airport, and this was at 11 p.m. on Thursday, the 24th of September. I was walking to my car when I saw something standing at the far end of the parking lot. At first, I thought it was a very tall person with a long coat. As I got closer, I unlocked my car, which caused my headlights to come on. My headlights hit the person standing around 20 to 25 feet from my car, causing it to turn and look right at me. I saw that this was not some person, but some red-eyed creature, and what appeared to be coked were actually wings, which it spread out as it turned to look at me. At first, I thought it was some kind of very large bird, but I've never seen any bird that stood almost 7 feet tall. I'm 5 feet 4 inches and this thing looked taller than me by at least 2 feet. This thing then started making some type of chirping sound, almost a half chirp and a half click like someone was clicking their tongue but much faster. It then made some type of screeching sound and took off running towards me. It got within 10 feet of me and took off into the air and flew above me. I was screaming hysterically as I crouched down behind the car's open door, which I then dived into head first. I was in and near panic as I tried to start the car, close and lock the doors and turn on my interior lights. I started my car and took off out the building lot and flew down the road till I hit the main road. I got home and told my husband, who also works at the same facility, and he was the one who told me about the sightings of this creature. I was scared and I hope I never see this thing again. This thing is roaming around the area and it's scaring people. I hope the airport decides to do something about this thing. End quote. There's many that have said this creature only matches one cryptid and that's the Mothman, a large battle bird-like creature that's been witnessed by people for the last few decades. Some are worried as it's said the Mothman appears right before a tragedy with some saying that the creature acts as a type of warning. While others believe the creature itself might be a type of bad omen, one user said the following about the encounter. This sounds exactly like the Mothman. This creature is rarely seen, but those who see it usually describe something very similar to what this person did. If it was seen near the airport, though there should be plenty of security cameras, so the first thing I would be doing is checking the CCTV cameras. Ever since the experience is seen on the night of the Silver Bridge collapse in the state of West Virginia, many have often believed that the Mothman creature has been at the center of this strange occurrence. In fact, in countless witness accounts, it appears that the collapse of the Silver Bridge had been predicted by many who encountered the Mothman, of whom seemed to be in the attempts of trying to prevent the event from ever occurring. Since this event, various people have come forward with their stories. Witnesses who've encountered the creature have given researchers a detailed description. Most can agree that it's bipedal, having large wings and a small head. However, some have described the head as being in the middle of its body while others have said its head looks more similar to that of an owl. The color of this creature is usually always described as being dark in color, is most commonly seen during the nighttime, helping it blend in with its surroundings. Mothman is said to stand around 6 to 7 feet tall, having a wingspan of between 8 and 15 feet and being able to let out a high-pitched screech. The eyes are red in color and large. In fact, eyewitnesses have said it's one of the first things they notice about the creature. Interestingly, some may not be aware that this creature hasn't just been witnessed in the United States, but many countries across the globe. For example, here in England we call this creature the Owlman. The first reported sighting of the Mothman comes from a small town that's located more than 80 miles away from Point Pleasant. 
The story goes that according to a group of five individuals of whom worked as diggers in the town of Clendenin, as they were working at a plot getting ready to dig, they heard a strange noise in the distance. At first they were unaware of what could have been causing the strange noise, but it persisted until one of them spotted a figure floating above them. They claimed that it looked human, almost as if a person was floating without the use of roams, strings, wings, or hover designs of any kind and that this strange humanoid figure was moving between the autumn trees in the area. They reported that all five of them saw this human-like creature and believed it to have originally been a prank of some kind. But as they watched it slowly move away from them, they believed the creature to be far more ominous than usual. Although some have suggested the creature is a large bird, such as that of an owl or a crane, eyewitnesses say that what they witnessed definitely wasn't a bird and that this creature is something entirely different. Going back a few days ago, a rare blue moon could be seen. This was the first time in 70 years that it landed on Halloween. It was the second full moon to happen in one month, meaning it got labeled as a blue moon. Interestingly, it was actually a mix-up that happened in 1999 that got it this name. The term blue moon was actually meant to refer to the third full moon in a calendar month, but the label continues today. Regardless, it's still quite rare for this to happen twice in a month, and what's even rarer is for one of these to happen on Halloween. The last time this happened was back in 1944. During these events, many people were pointing their cameras and telescopes towards the moon. Interestingly though, some people captured more than what they intended and this was the case for one person that captured the moon in Birmingham. However, when looking back at their image, they noticed that it contained something strange. They soon shared their image online where various people gave their opinions on what they thought it could be. The person behind the photograph said the following, this photograph was captured above Birmingham in England. As with most people, I looked out for the moon as it was a blue moon. I have a Canon camera and a low-budget telescope, so decided to get both out for the occasion. After snapping several dozen photographs, I then went in to review them. However, on one of them, I noticed four lights sitting close to the moon. I'm not sure what they are, and I didn't see them as when I was taking the photographs, I was looking at the camera screen, and I think they would have been too small to pick up. Regardless, I have no idea what they are, and I'm interested to see what people make of them. End quote. Various users gave their opinions on the photograph, with one man saying the following, I'm someone who does a lot of astrophotography, and one of the issues is that you can get light interference. However, when you're taking photographs of something big such as the moon, this isn't so much of an issue. The moon is one of the easiest things to photograph in the night sky because it's so big. Although you can sometimes get the odd light, you never normally see four in a line like this. Very strange. End quote. Others went down the route of suggesting that what the person captured was an unidentified flying object. With this person saying the following, I've seen many different photographs that show similar things. I don't think these are natural, but rather come under the category of UFOs. These shaped crafts are commonly seen on Earth. And various amateur photographers have captured similar looking objects. End quote. As UFO researchers have pointed out in the past, the moon is actually one place where many alleged UFOs have been captured, with researchers saying that there's more going on around our moon than what we're being told. Scientists and researchers, though, have spoken out and said this isn't the case, and these strange lights are most likely debris on the camera or lights coming from a different source. Amateur researchers have hit back at these claims, though, and go into detail that places like the Moon and the International Space Station are actually hotspots for UFOs. For those that aren't aware, the International Space Station has a variety of cameras to monitor spacewalks and other areas that need to be under 24-hour surveillance. This has allowed the agency to play live footage on internet shows, websites, live television broadcasting, and so on. This is to help build up an interest in space. Recently, there have been numerous events where footage of strange objects can be seen floating in the distance, and this has led many to believe that is extraterrestrial in origin. After such incidents are spotted, the footage will later be removed or edited. The live feed will be cut or the entire incident will be completely ignored by NASA. One incident happened back in 2014, and amateur researchers have said it's some of the best evidence they have of a UFO in space. The object could be seen on one of the live cams. Many people across the world were watching on this particular occasion. However, something they couldn't explain was the strange object that quickly made itself known. The object appeared to be sleek and orange in color. 
After only a few seconds, those watching the live feed said it docked onto the International Space Station and shortly after it did this the live cameras were shut down with those watching the events saying that all they could now see was a blue or purple screen. Interestingly, many who watched the live cams have said this is a common occurrence when an unidentified flying object is seen in the background. Others have even said that NASA themselves sometimes zoom in to get a better look at the object. But after determining that it's not part of any spacecraft, they quickly shut off the cameras. It's this type of activity that's caused some to believe that there could be mysterious objects visiting our planet. The objects that could be seen at the International Space Station wasn't there very long before the live cams were shut off. Since then, it hasn't been seen since. But this was enough for people as they were able to take screenshots of the strange-looking object. After this, various people started to give their ideas on what they thought the object was. One individual suggested they were looking at a genuine UFO and that NASA were not quick enough to shut off the cameras on this occasion, leaving all those who tuned in to see the object very clearly. Astronomers have said these objects can be explained using everyday things, but people have struggled to explain some of the objects that are seen close to the International Space Station. With amateur researchers saying that some of these are definitely not space debris, with one UFO researcher saying the following, I understand that some of these objects can be explained as space debris and that makes sense, but it's obvious that some of these are not space debris. Also, if this was the case, why does the space station cameras shut off when they come into view? If they were just space debris, why shut down the live feed? It's this kind of behavior that makes people question these objects. Researchers have said that recent discoveries only give us a small glimpse into our history, going on to say that over 98% of our ancient history is being lost. Ancient carvings and structures can give us an idea of what certain civilizations were capable of, and there's some within the archaeological community that disagree with how advanced certain cultures were. One that's shrouded in mystery is that of the Maya. Recently, very strange photographs have been shared on social media claiming that amateur archaeologists found these artifacts while digging. One report states the artifacts were discovered during the building of the Mayan train. Currently, construction work is underway to build a large railway in Mexico. The construction began in December of 2018, with various people coming forward and saying that strange discoveries have been made in the area. These mysterious artifacts were discovered in a region known as Quintana Roo. There's no other way to describe these artifacts other than they look like extraterrestrials, possessing big eyes, a large oval head, and just matching the overall shape of the gray alien. This has had social media users convinced that these are the real deal. Because these images were only posted recently though, it's been tough to track down more information about them, who found them, and where they're currently being held. Amateur researchers though were obviously excited when these artifacts started to be shared claiming that it could be the evidence to back up the claims that UFOs had been visiting us for thousands of years. One of the things that people struggle with is trying to track down where these first came from and who took the images. The stories behind these images usually follows a similar theme. A person or group of people digging close to the mine temples discover strange-looking artifacts. Reports on where these artifacts were found varies depending on who you talk to, with websites not revealing much information. Regardless, though, they report that a team of archaeologists were surprised to find the ancient ruins, saying that it's one of the biggest discoveries in the era today. Some have claimed that these are too good to be true, with one Mexican archaeologist saying that these are fangs and that although they were allegedly found with other Mayan artifacts, it's thought they were placed here in order to make the findings seem more genuine. With one amateur archaeologist saying the following, I don't think these images are fake. I think these are real objects, but they are not from the same age as the other artifacts found in the area. These were likely created in a nearby workshop and placed there on purpose. The overall look of them is just off. They don't look old and look very amateur in appearance. End quote. People are still waiting for more information to come out about these artifacts. When you think of space exploration, you may think of companies like NASA and modern-day equipments like rockets and space stations. However, there's various scriptures and books that detail our ancient ancestors possessing knowledge of the stars. This has caused some interesting conversations to be put forward with some saying that our ancestors may have had more knowledge of the stars' celestial bodies in the universe than we previously thought. How then were they able to do this? Back in those days, they didn't possess the technology or equipment we have today. Or did they? Drawings and writings may contradict this. And although this sounds outlandish, these theories are based on evidence that we've managed to discover in recent years. 
Perhaps one of the most interesting discoveries comes from that of the Mayan civilization. In the 7th century AD, Paco the Great was the ruler of this time. During his time, he oversaw some of the most impressive sites of Palenque. During this time, the civilization was able to build things that many would say was impossible. They built complex streams that would transport them fresh water. However, one image of the ruler has caused much speculation among certain groups. The image in question depicts the king descending into the Mayan underworld. All around the carving we see objects that are said to represent celestial objects. This includes Venus, the sun, and the moon. Some individuals have suggested that what this shows is the ancient Mayan civilization working on their most recent invention and that structure has something to do with space travel. Our ancestors were obsessed with space and all over the world these ancient civilizations found ways to observe the cosmos. Why were they interested in space? And what do these carvings show us? In recent years, researchers have been able to find writings that prove that ancient man was interested in the stars. This discovery was made in 1961 in Romania. An engineer discovered a strange-looking manuscript. While looking through the ancient papers, something caught the researchers' attention. It turns out the papers were detailing concepts about rocketry, and this existed in a time when these types of things weren't meant to be around. The individual who worked in these designs was a man by the name of Comrade Haas, and he lived between 1509 and 1576. Interestingly, although he was able to design these incredible concepts of rocketry, not much is known about his life, but due to the findings by the engineer, it's caused scholars and researchers to become much more interested in this man. One of the first things the researchers noticed was that these drawings were very similar to that of the multi-stage rockets. This is complex rocketry and is something that consists of two or more engines that are placed on top of this. This is normally used in rockets that need to reach high altitudes. So the question here is why was someone hundreds of years ago trying to create a multi-stage rocket? It turns out that Mr. Comrade Haas was a talented man. The manuscript that was discovered is over 450 pages and hints at Comrade Haas being a master engineer and someone who's looked upon during this era. The manuscript also details artillery and rocket technology. Interestingly, the invention Haas was working on can be found in the manuscript. Comrade Haas was taken on by the military at an unknown time, and some have theorized this was because at the time he would have been one of the most impressive engineers around. Having a good understanding of rocketry in a time where not many people would have understood what it was. It's incredible that someone during this time was even able to come up with the ideas of rockets. And researchers have even said that he's one of the first people to put into writing the concept of multi-stage rockets. Further saying that his concepts were put to test and they did in fact work. Incredibly, his work doesn't stop there. He went on to designing detailed spacecrafts, delta fins, bell nozzles, and even liquid fuel. Being one of the first people to create complex things like this, it begs the question of where he was getting these ideas from. It's true that we know more about what's going on the surface of the moon than what's happening within our own oceans. Our oceans are teeming with incredible mysteries and strange occurrences that have left experts all around the world baffled and amazed since their discoveries. In fact, few of these discoveries are as mysterious in their nature as the humanoid sea people that have been witnessed by numerous historical figures in the past. These elusive half-human, half-fish hybrids are at the center of strange sightings and what's interesting is that they've been reported all around the world. Although modern scientists have spoken out about these sightings and say that there's no proof these underwater humanoids ever existed, researchers point to historical accounts where people would detail their encounters with mermaid-like creatures. With that being said, those scientists have proof to back this up. One of these fake mermaids was created by P.T. Barnum. The creature went by the name of the Fiji mermaid and it was created using the torso of a monkey and the tail end of a fish. When the creation was made, it looked like a real mermaid. And interestingly, this is what people go to when they think of P.T. Barnum's mermaid. However, there's stories that P.T. Barnum actually had another mermaid and he was getting ready to reveal it to the public. But this one was said to be genuine. A fire happened in New York City going back in 1865. It took out various properties, one of which was P.C. Barnum's. However, it's not until you start looking at the events surrounding the fire that some things don't seem to add up. The official story goes that a museum employee ran out of the basement saying that a fire was tearing through his office. After this, the fire quickly spread throughout the whole building, causing people to run out into the streets and even ending some of the lives of the animals that were trapped inside. 
However, some theorists have said this isn't the real reason behind the fire, going on to say that someone did this on purpose because P.T. Barnum was going to reveal a real mermaid to the world. This is said to be one of only a few photographs that survived and allegedly shows the giant mermaid that was going to be revealed to the world. The creature clearly isn't a human, possessing a large brow ridge, webbed hands and feet, and dark sunken eyes. One of the issues is that there's really not much information about the photograph with it only being featured on a few websites with limited information. One person said the following, I've read stories that P.T. Barnum was going to show the world this new mermaid and that this one was the real deal. But I believe the photographs might not be real and are actually recreations of what people said it looked like. It seems that some are of the opinion that the fire was started on purpose to stop people seeing this exhibit, with others saying that the fire may have been a diversion and that the creature was soon taken from the museum, being taken somewhere secret where nobody would see it. One of the issues is because P.T. Barnum was known to fake and exaggerate what he was showing to the public. Many don't believe in these accounts, with others saying that the story isn't real and that the photographs are fake. This hasn't stopped people though from believing in mermaid stories. One of these stories is that of Captain John Smith. According to old myths and rumors published back in 1849, during the year 1611, as Captain John Smith and his crew were traveling around the West Indies, they spotted a strange creature in the water beside them. The crew described the creature as looking like that of a woman for the upper part of the body. Except for a few key changes in the face, such as that of the eyes, of which were described as larger and more round, his short nose, long ears, and bright green hair. The lower part of the creature's body was described as being similar to that of a dolphin's body and not that of a fish or scales of any kind. Interestingly, when researchers looked for the source of the tale concerning Captain John Smith and his crew's encounter with the mermaid, they found that the original author for the piece, that was later published in 1849, was the author of The Three Musketeers. This has led many skeptics to believe that the stories could have been fabricated. However, at the time the author was more well-versed in writing articles pertaining to nonfiction and had even co-authored other pieces that involved true stories of encounters with mermaids. This helps to not only prove the author's fascination with the subject, but that's the rigorous fact-checking involved with publications at the time more than helped to steer the author clear from fictitious accounts in his works. Still, to this day, many claim the account is nothing more than a forgery despite evidence of Captain John Smith and his crew encountering other strange creatures in the sea and often writing about them. There's been other stories of mermaids in recent years as well. One of the most well-known ones is that of the Israeli mermaid. Back in 2009, there were witness reports coming from the local residents living in the Israeli town of Kiri Ayam that had believed they had seen what they described as a mermaid swimming close to the shores of the town that's located next to the Mediterranean Sea. According to the reports, a man by the name of Sam Cohen was one of the first to report the sightings. According to his account, they first saw what looked like an injured woman laying on the sand before she quickly jumped into the water and disappeared. Others claim that at sunset you can catch a glimpse of mermaids swimming by the shore and sometimes they will even observe onlookers and go to the surface to get a better look. Interestingly, the increased number of these sightings have left researchers in the town wondering what these creatures could be. In order to get to the bottom of these claims, the town has offered a $1 million reward for anyone of whom can gather evidence as to the creature's origins and likeness. This has led to a number of different researchers, tourists, and cryptid enthusiasts racing to try and uncover the cause of these sightings and what could very well be the truth behind the accounts. Skywatching is something that many people do. For some, it's calming, and for others, it's a way to escape everyday life. Watching the sky at night can help to reduce stress, and sometimes you'll even see something interesting. For example, a meteorite flying past. However, there are those that have seen mysterious things and this has caused some to spend countless hours sky watching in the hopes of capturing something interesting. It seems though that most people are actually unsuccessful in seeing something strange and as fate would have it the majority of people who do see mysterious things are usually just going about their everyday life and isn't expecting to see anything strange. This was the case for one truck driver who spotted something mysterious in the sky. The driver describes seeing a mysterious object in the sky while walking back to his trunk. They were able to record the object for a minute before they said it vanished. Interestingly, when shared online, it caused various people to put forward different theories for what it could be, with some saying that it may have been an unidentified flying object, a drone, or even a portal that opened up. 
Square-shaped UFOs are not uncommon and various people have recorded these objects in various countries. UFOs doesn't mean aliens, it's just an object that can't be identified at that moment in time. Although the footage is a little blurry, the drivers said they tried the best they could to record it and that it didn't help that the weather conditions were super windy. Regardless, they managed to record the object. The driver said the following, I'm a truck driver and while walking back to my truck, I saw this object. I went to find a high viewpoint and it was gone. After being posted to online UFO grooms, some suggested that it may have been a plastic bag or a piece of garbage. However, others were not open to this idea because the object in question does not flap around. Rather, it just looks to be flying at a moderate speed. Take a look at the footage. UFO sightings are nothing new. For years, these mysterious crafts have been reported from various regions across our planet, with some ancient scriptures proving that they've been around since the time of the airplane. It's this and the thousands of sightings that are reported every year that make people believe that perhaps we're not being told the truth about these crafts. After all, if you have a craft that's able to travel vast distances in a matter of seconds, this could be considered dangerous if it got into the wrong hands. It's for this reason and various others that people say we're kept in the dark. Or at least we were. Interestingly, the government seems to be more open to discussing unidentified flying objects. And this has caused some to think that perhaps an announcement is on the way. After all, the government hasn't exactly been open to the idea of extraterrestrial life, even going as far as mocking it and those who believe in it. Different shaped crafts have been reported, with some being more common than others. The most common shaped UFOs reported are those of the disc, triangle, orb, cigar, and boomerang. Interestingly, recent reports that came from Eric W. Davis, who works at the United States Department of Defense, states that the United States government is in possession of recovered off-road vehicles. Although skeptics have been quick to claim that Eric W. Davis is nothing more than a fraud making outrageous claims, key figures have also come forward to address the claims, including the former director of the Pentagon's Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, Luis Elizondo. Additionally, in regards to the program and its ties to the passing of the Intelligence Authorization Act, former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid commented that he'd been involved in the effort and hopes that the UFO investigation program will seek further evidence of other potential recoveries of extraterrestrial crafts. Even the acting chairman of the Senate-led Committee of Intelligence, Marco Rubio, provided an official statement saying the following, maybe there is a completely sort of boring explanation for it, but we need to find out expressing concern that the increased reports of unidentified crafts over American military basins is definitely seen as a threat to the national security of the United States. Although Marco Rubio believes the sightings could be attributed to a possible technological leap made by China or Russia, Eric Davis and Luis Elizondo are far more certain of the crafts originating from an off-world source. Across several interviews for mass media outlets, Luis Elizondo claimed that not only do these crafts exhibit behaviors that appear to defy the very laws of aviation, but that these crafts were found to be 100% not man-made and were out of the scope of human capabilities. His reasoning for this claim was that the crafts investigated demonstrated hypersonic capabilities that were described as being far beyond the scope that's physically tolerable by a human being of whom would experience a high amount of juice to the point that it would either be fatal or seriously wound them. This meant that whoever or whatever was piloting these aircrafts appeared to be non-human. Not only this, but the technical developments of the crafts also made it very apparent that the creation of these unidentified flying objects were vastly superior to anything man-made. Luis Elizondo describes in one of his many reports regarding the subject matter as saying the following, a craft that does not have any obvious flight surfaces, forms of propulsion, and maneuvering in ways that include extreme maneuverability beyond the healthy g-forces of anything biological, low observability, and positive lift. These aircraft will call them aircraft display capabilities not in the U.S. arsenal or any other militaries. This finding urges the Department of Defense to treat the existence of these crafts not as random sightings and made-up accounts, but rather as genuine worries and threats that must be actively defended against and analyze and attempt to reverse-engineer the mechanisms behind the graft and to devise ways to deactivate them, and prepare for an eventual confrontation with these unidentified grafts. Paranormal is a subject that interests many people. Many of us are interested in the unknown, with some even having experienced it themselves. It's these experiences that's led some to investigate the subject, causing them to find a variety of answers for what happened to them. 
There are those that believe that we share the planet with paranormal entities and every so often they make themselves known. Science, however, tells us that ghosts don't exist and it's actually our brains playing tricks on us. They go into detail that many things can happen to the brain that causes us to see ghosts and some of these examples can be attributed to us being tired. Our brain identifying objects in the dark or our senses being heightened after watching a horror movie and therefore we are more alert about what's going on around us. Paranormal researchers and those that have seen and say that the topic should be taken seriously and investigated. Other theories have been put forward to try and explain what we're seeing. For example, some note that humans' visual spectrum is ingrained and that we can only see a certain amount of things, while certain animals have a much wider spectrum. Snakes, for example, are able to see an infrared vision. Some suggest that ghosts are beings that exist in a spectrum not picked up by the human eye. And this is why sometimes motion detectors pick up on paranormal beings. Researchers have also said that a variety of different places can be haunted, with some of the most common places being that of graveyards. Old buildings and houses where something bad has happened. However, one place you wouldn't expect to be haunted is that of ships and even the ocean. A man was working on an old boat when he took a mysterious photograph. Upon reviewing it, he discovered he'd accidentally captured something in the background. The image first started to make the rounds online back in August of 2014 with the eyewitness saying the following about the image. As I said in a previous post, I work at sea. Last month we came into a dry dock to carry out refit and repairs. Dry dock is when a ship is brought into a lock, the gates closed and all the water pumped out, leaving the ships high and dry on the blocks, thus allowing repairs and inspections on the underside of the hole. Next to us was an old military frigate being broken down for scram. She had arrived around two weeks prior to us. Once the frigate was on the blocks and all dry, all the crew left the old girl to her veins. A sad sight, but that's how these things go. Once all the sensitive stuff had been removed, the dock workers were free to go on. The dock foreman John went on board first with a camera to take pictures of work areas. All in all, he took a couple hundred. This was one of them. He later sent all of the photographs to his boss, who upon seeing this one called John straight away asking the following. Who is the guy with the axe, the edge of the camera flash? At the time, John was confused as he never saw anyone while on the ship. The area where this photograph was taken was in a cross alley deep inside the ship. He was walking around with a torch and a camera. And when he'd go to take a photograph, he would turn off the torch, leaving him in total darkness. After this, he would turn the torch back on and be on his way. Because of it being a military ship, the police were soon contacted. The police turned up and carried out their own investigation. However, they noted that they didn't find any trace of anyone being on the ship. It's also interesting to note that there was only one way on and off the ship and this was by a gameway covered by CCTV. It was very unlikely that someone would jump off the side of the ship as it was a 25 meter drop. You couldn't jump over without being seriously injured. No one was seen to leave the ship after John had taken this. If you zoom in on the image, you can make out what appears to be a person. The witness went on to say the following, I am a skeptic. Maybe it's a trick of the flash reflecting off something. But if you really zoom in, you can make out the face, ear, collar, the jacket, and the axe. And before anyone asks, I'm not going to name the ship or where she is. As I'm not sure if I'm even supposed to have a picture of the innards of a military ship. This gave me serious goosebumps. Needless to say, I didn't go back on board for a look. Some people gave their opinion on what they thought the bean could be. This caused some to suggest that something dark took place in the region and now that event has left an imprint that gets played over and over. Other examples of residual haunting include that of something making banging noises or turning on the same light over and over. Although this may sound creepy, residual haunting is actually one of the better hauntings to experience. According to paranormal researchers, these entities will let you know that they're there, but they'll usually stay out of your way. There's also a dark entity that's allegedly been plaguing the human race since recorded history and this entity goes by many different names. For many years a number of people all around the world have reported waking up at night and seeing a mysterious shadowy figure and some suggested that the being in this photograph is a shadow figure. The shadowy figure has over time become famous leading on to it to be given a variety of different names some of which include the shadow man, the hat man and the shadow person. The phenomenon has gained widespread popularity and a number of documentaries have been made on the subject, trying to get to the bottom of what people are experiencing. However, it seems that the more the subject is looked into, the more questions are put forward. 
A dedicated blog known as The Hat Man Project has also been launched where people share their experiences with the hat man. The history of the hat man phenomenon goes way back in time and different written records of the hat man have been found. In fact, some evidence of the hat man-like entity have been found in scriptures of previous civilizations as well, showcasing that whatever this thing is, it's been plaguing humanity for a long time. It's important that we research strange discoveries. It helps us to better understand the enormous reports found throughout the world and what they could mean for the scientific world around us. According to author Richard J. Dewhurst, he had come across a number of strange reports made during the early 1800s and up until the 1900s that described North American archaeological discoveries of giant humanoid skeletons. And what was originally presumed to be a race of non-human creatures but seemed eerily similar to ancient descriptions of a race of giants. For some unknown reasons, the reports, data surrounding the reports, and discoveries taken in for research, such as skeletons, ancient artifacts, and references to the culture of giants, were either completely covered up, destroyed, or hidden from the public. One of the first reports made apparent to the author, Richard Dewhurst, were the overwhelming number of archaeological discoveries made by common people during the expansion of New York. The first report, titled A History of Livingston Country, New York, 1824 detailed the discovery of an indigenous people's barrel mound that uncovered massive humanoid skeletons and this was discovered by a man named Jesse Stanley. A portion of the report described the following statement. About the year 1820, the mound was removed and in its removal arrowheads a brass kettle and knives were thrown out. A number of skeletons were also disinterred. Among the bones was a human skeleton of enormous size, the jawbone of which was so large that Adam Hollisander placed it over his own chin and jaw. He was the largest man in the settlement and his face was in proportion to the rest of his body. End quote. As convincing as it might be to assume that the Institute reporting the 1820 discovery had made an error in the proportions of the skeletons or the exact size of the jawbone, hundreds of additional reports would be made surrounding different mounds discovered in the region. In another New York report titled A History of Western New York, 1804, that detailed the discovery of gigantic humanoid bones that were accurately measured and described by scientific sources, with the report quoted as providing the following statement. Human bones of gigantic proportion were discovered in such a state of preservation as to be accurately described and measured. The cavities of the skulls were large enough in their dimensions to receive the entire head of a man in modern times and could be put on one's head with as much ease as a hut or a camp. The jawbones were significantly large and the fit was outside of a modern man's face. The other bones so far discovered epitope of equal proportions with the skull and jawbones, several of which have been preserved in the cabinets of antiquarians where they still may be seen. Oddly enough, as mentioned in this report, the skeletons were preserved, sent to museums and studied by archaeological experts of the time, and yet not a single giant humanoid skeleton can be viewed today, or found in any major Native American museums whatsoever. How could there be so many discoveries surrounding giant Native American skeletons? And yet none of them are on display today to be studied or viewed. As Richard Yu, Huss continues throughout his book, he points to one organization deceiving the narrative throughout his life. Richard Yu, Huss writes the following quote, The Smithsonian began to adopt a policy of excluding any evidence of direct front interference in the Americans prior to Columbus. Some have argued it was an attempt by the fractured post-war government to downplay any regional and ethnic conflicts in the still fragile national rebuilding after the war. Others have pointed to the expansionist policies incorporated in the manifest destiny and the desire to obscure the origins of the tribes being displaced and annihilated by Western expansion. Still, others have alleged that it was a direct religious policy adapted to counter the growing problem with the Mormon religion and its assertions that the lost tribes of Israel were found in America. End quote. Could this mean that the Smithsonian Institution in its entirely white to cover up the possible origins of humanoid giants? Or was it a far simpler explanation used to prevent the destruction of commonly held theories at the time? Dewars goes on to explain that throughout his studies, the majority of the evidence surrounding the Smithsonian active policies of excluding any gathered archaeological discoveries that did not confirm to their own narrative centers around one man. Major John Wesley Powell, a geologist of whom was directly responsible for many policies of exclusion of evidence. 
As it turns out, when the United States Congress first established the Bureau of Anthology back in 1879, Major John Wesley was declared its first director, holding that position until his eventual passing away in 1902. Was created with the sole purpose of being responsible for the transferring of archives, records, and materials relating to the Indians of North America from the Interior Department to the ownership of the Smithsonian Institution. It was during this time as director of the Bureau of Anthology that Major John Wesley, seen as the lone expert of the geography of the American West, was asked to write up an extensive report surrounding the history of ancient tribes and their most likely origins. After finishing this report, rather than it be confirmed by other experts, archaeologists, or explorers in their field, Major John quickly uses reports as the official policy of the Smithsonian Institution with little sway in its writings for the next 100 years. Additionally, John Wesley would write a report to the Secretary of the Smithsonian titled the following, Limitations to the use of some anthropological data in which he actively asserted that there was no reason and no benefit to trying to discover the origins of North American native tribes. A report is directly quoted as saying the following, Hints of customs may be discovered, but outside of this, the discoveries made have often been illegitimately used, especially with the purpose of connecting the tribes of North America, with people of so-called races of antiquity in other portions of the world. In the study of these antiquities, there's been much unnecessary speculation in respect to the relaxation existing between the people to whose existence they attest and the tribes of Indians inhabiting the country during this historic period. There is therefore no reason for us to search for an extralimital origin through lost tribes of the arts discovered in the mounds of North America. End quote. Unfortunately, following these reports, the later 20th century secretary of the Smithsonian between 1907 and 1927, a man by the name of Charles Walcott, would adopt the PAL doctrine as the official stance of the Smithsonian Institute for the rest of the 20th century. In fact, even today, the PAL doctrine is considered to be the official stance held by the Smithsonian, despite the fact that many modern-day archaeologists and historians are attempting to speak out in support of evidence of a wide number of set-in attempts made prior to the European settlements of the 18th century. The author of The Find Richard Doerst attributed the policy to evidence of an overwhelming cover-up of not only discoveries of giant humanoid skeletons all across North America, but of any artifacts that could imply past European origin or expansion into the new kept hidden prior to the colonization efforts made by Christopher Columbus. Even today, the currently held theory as to the origin of Native Americans is centered around a purely theoretical argument of past ice ages having formed ice bridges connecting all continents of the world together and allowed for the travel for Africa all the way to the Southern Americas, despite the lack of any evidence for this claim. Richard Yu has provided the following statement in his study surrounding the cover-up. The great crime and tragedy of this policy is hard to compute. One glaring result has been the suppression of hundreds of out-of-context finds, all submitted to the museum in naive ignorance of the museum's official policy of suppression of alternative perspectives. To compound the problem, all major universities in the United States also adopt this policy in conjunction with the official position of the Smithsonian, thus making it impossible to study alternative American history and receive any grants or funding for pursuits of this nature. Although it's impossible to find any of the recovered joint humanoid skeletons in the modern day, it has become apparent that an active cover-up has been taken by North American archaeological institutes, with a focus on disregarding any conflicting information, discoveries that put into question the validity of the PAL doctrine. Until private institutes make their own attempts to uncover the hidden Native American barrel mounds that tend to hide giant humanoid skeletons all across the country, it appears that educational institutes will continue to cover up the truth for the foreseeable future. Another interesting discovery is the one made inside the Lovelock Hames. A group of archaeologists from the University of California discovered a number of strange objects inside the Lovelock Hames. Among the objects were mummies of rare giants. These mummies were said to be between 8 and 10 feet tall. As they were found in the Lovelock Cave, these giants were given the name of the Lovelock Giants. The archaeologists also discovered a pair of large sandals, far too large to fit an average human's feet. These sandals were 15 inches long, and they had signs showing that they were once worn by someone. Researchers also discovered a handprint on one of the stones in the Lovelock Cave. The imprint came from a massive hand. Many of the items found in the Lovelock Cave are held today in different museums and also private collections. 
In 1931, two large skeletons of red-haired giants were found very close to Lovelock Cave. These amazing discoveries have led many people to believe that at one point in time, giant humans once walked our planet. The Mystery of King Tutankhamun The world of archaeology has allowed us to see a glimpse of what life would have been like for our ancestors. One of these is King Tutankhamun. There's been many theories put forward about what he looked like, but new research suggests that the king wasn't disabled as previously thought. King Tutankhamun ruled over Egypt as pharaoh for ten years. And the only reason this came to an end is because he passed away at the young age of 19, with Egyptologists estimating this would have been around 1324 BC. Back in 1922, during a privately funded excavation by Lord Carnarvon, Harold Carter discovered the completely intact tomb of the ancient Egyptian pharaoh Tutankhamun. The artifacts retrieved along with the well-preserved body of the pharaoh helped to provide a clear image during the reign of Tutankhamun and also life for ancient Egypt. The tomb was one of the most well-preserved and unaffected tombs. Holding a variety of artifacts and clues as to many other Egyptian mysteries the Egyptologists were still trying to answer. One of the most interesting discoveries was the stone sarcophagus containing three coffins. The final one was made of gold. When the archaeologists opened the lid King Tut's mummy was revealed. Researchers have put forward the theory that King Tut passed away from a gangrene infection suggesting that it likely came from a broken leg. However, fast forward to 2006 and a scan showed researchers that there was damage to King Tut's skull. And another 2010 study showed scientists that King Tut had malaria and was disabled. Even coming forward and saying that he would have needed a cane ta war. The 2018 study, however, has challenged these beliefs with scientists saying that King Tart was a warrior. Specialized photography uncovered signs of battle scars in the 18-year-old pharaoh's 3,000-year-old leather war armor. A University of Northampton researcher worked on a documentary and they discovered that King Tart's armor was buried inside his tomb, further saying that it contradicted past theories of King Tart's weak image. Researcher Lucy Skinner said the following, It was possible to see abrasions along the edges of the leather scales, meaning that the armor had seen considerable use, but suggests that King Tut had worn it and that perhaps he had even seen battle. End quote. As of right now, the studies and debates are still ongoing, with some believing that King Tut was not an eel king, but rather someone who was a leader in the battlefield. Tyrannosaurs interest many of us, and every time one of these ancient creatures is unearthed, it gives us a small peek into what life would have been like millions of years ago. One of the most interesting discoveries that caused much discussion is that of Mary Schweitzer's T-Rex. For years, researchers have known about the giant theropod Tyrannosaurus rex, but Mary's discoveries surprise even the most knowledgeable researchers, and is still heavily debated amongst paleontologists to this day. Mary Schweitzer discovered astonishing evidence that may change the world's view of dinosaurs. While studying a slice of Tyrannosaurus rex bone through a microscope, she spotted something that looked like red blood cells. This seemed impossible because organic remains could not possibly survive the fossilization process. Subsequent tests, however, indicated that the structures were red blood cells and they were from a 67 million year old Tyrannosaurus rex. In the years that followed, Mary and her team discovered other soft tissues, including what appeared to be blood vessels and feather fibers. Skeptics, however, argued that what they claimed to be organic tissues were actually biofilms formed by microbes which had invaded the fossil bones. Schweitzert and her team have continued to gather support for their conclusions, with the most recent evidence coming from molecular analysis of what seems to be bone cells from a T-Rex. After isolating the possible osteocytes, the team subjected them to tests, exposing them to antibodies that targeted a protein found in bird cells only. Considering that birds are dinosaur descendants, there was a reaction as would be expected if the cells were from dinosaurs. When subjected to other antibodies that target DNA, they bind to specific regions inside the cell membrane. After using the spectrometry technique on the dinosaur bone extract, the team of researchers found that the sequence of amino acid proteins match protein sequences present in all animal cells. The discovery of whole cells in a T-Rex bone amazed everyone. This writer has reversed the usual belief by providing that 67 million year old fossils can still hold soft tissues inside, something that baffled many at the time as it's thought it would have broken down within a million years. This discovery could shed some light on the evolution of dinosaurs and the workings of their muscles and blood vessels. The mystery remains, however, if this discovery was truly red blood cells. 
A paleontologist at the University of Bristol said the following about the discovery. It's problematic that no other lab has been able to replicate Mary Swetcher's work. End quote. Mary's discovery continues to be debated amongst paleontologists. With reports of Yeti and Sasquatch surfacing from all around the world, it's no surprise to cryptozoologists that the Mongolian kingdoms also had their own reference to giant ape-men creatures that would dwell within the distant mountain sides and wilderness uninhabited by human beings. Known as the Almas, these Mongolian hominids were believed to have inhabited the mountains across Central Asia as well as the Altai Mountains of Western Mongolia, of which the majority of ancient reports were made. The oldest known verifiable record made of the Almas was written by a man known as Hans Strauberger, a prisoner of the Mongol Khan that had been sent to Mongolia, and wrote about his observations of the surrounding landscaping people back during the year of 1420. In his journal, he wrote the following surrounding the Almas creatures. On the same mountain there are savages, are not like other people and they live there. They are covered all over the body with hair, except the hands and face, and run about like other wild beasts in the mountains and eat leaves, grass, and any things they can find. The lord of the country sent to egg a man and a woman from among these savages that had been taken in the mountain. Additional reports detail that the Almas are consistently described as being human-like bipedal creatures, typically between the height of five and six and a half feet tall, a monstrous size compared to people during that time period and so what often depicted as giants. Their bodies have been detailed as being varying tinges of reddish and brownish with ape-like animalistic facial features such as a pronounced and enlarged brow line, a wide flat nose, and a weak chin. There have been and is debates both archaeological and scientific surrounding the existence of the Almas and whether or not it's a genuine species. Some have argued that the Almas may have been a small population of surviving evolutionary ancestors, given that their descriptions made them more humanoid than ape-like in appearance, and that their omnivorous nature and animalistic behavior pointed towards signs of less evolved intelligence. Others believe that the creature could have been a species entirely different from humanity and could have been an undiscovered branching of the species in the past, caused by the physical separation of humans in the mountains and wilderness. Researchers would generally dismiss the validity of the Almas under the claim that for such creatures to exist in the modern day, it would require a rather large population that could not go unseen and so argue that the species either never existed or is now extinct in the modern day. Despite such sentiments, the Mongolian people today continue to claim to see the Almas when talking of terrifying encounters with the giants in the Altai Mountains. Qi, the vital life source that exists inside of every living being. The word comes from traditional Chinese, meaning air in the sense of life force and energy flow. For centuries it's been used in Chinese martial arts and healing practices. The act of balancing Qi is referred to as Qigong. Those who believe in this mystic force say it's the energy which flows through and within us. Qi must remain balanced in order to bring good health and a stable mind. The notion itself in scientific terms is a pseudoscience and proven as there's no way to directly observe it and yet despite this it's an ancient practice that remains strongly practiced and followed. Even to this day with many believers and healers who follow these classical teachings and beliefs. So today we'll be taking a look at the concept of Qi and about the fabled extraordinary individual Cheng Chang, otherwise known as Dunamoja. Zhang Chang is a Qi master and acupuncturist who rose to fame in the 1980s. The healer who is from Indonesia was part of an Indonesian travel documentary by Lorne and Lawrence Blair. The documentary Ring of Fire East of Krakatoa was broadcast on public television and depicted Zhang Chang's practices. He was referred to as Dynamo Jack due to his desire to keep his identity a secret. In the Mangas of Java, a book written about Cheng's life, we learn that he was forbidden from accepting any payment for his healing work by his mentor. In other words, he was prohibited from gaining a profit by using his sacred abilities. For 20 years, Cheng worked as a Java to earn money for himself and his family, including his seven children. This was just enough to keep him financially affluent. The family was in trouble with poverty for many years. And misfortunes before them often joined them months prior to the documentary. Cheng claims to have summoned the spirit of his old mentor who told him his financial concerns would soon ease. The spirit had been right for financial opportunities soon arrived. The Blair brothers found him in Java and asked him if he would like to be in their documentary. Initially, he refused. He stated, I'm only a healer. 
Lawrence Blair stated in an interview we followed him around Java on his healing rounds and asked if we could film him, but he always declined, saying his powers resulted from a type of meditation with an ancient tradition of secrecy. Only when my brother Lauren was suffering from a serious eye infection that he finally allowed us to film him in 1987. End quote. Lauren's healing session with Dynamo Jack was recorded and included in the documentary. Lauren laid still as Dynamo Jack placed acupuncture needles into his arms. The action caused them to move sporadically, chi allegedly flowing through them. After the experience, Lauren stated it wasn't like any acupuncture I've had. I was getting very powerful electric shocks and couldn't control my movements. End quote. Chong then explained the process of what he was doing. He was transferring his positive yang and removing Lauren's negative yin and linking them together which created physical electricity. He explained, inside our bodies, both flow in equal amounts. These energies are opposites they can never meet. Yin and yang normally run parallel to each other, never letting go of one another. I used my yin and yang together as one. This is why I can do what I do. By itself, yang chi cannot pass the limits of the body. According to the brothers, Chong had the powers of primacy. He took a newspaper outside with the intention of showcasing this. He held out his hand over the paper, concentrating as he did this and smoke began to form from the paper, bursting into flames. Chong had made a sacred oath not to reveal the secrecy of his powers to anyone other than pure-hearted students with the desire to learn and heal. When the documentary was published and broadcast, Chong despised the sudden popularity it gave him. Immediately the contact he had with the brothers was cut. Lawrence said the following in an interview when he heard we'd shown this footage in the public, he was very upset and refused all our future efforts to contact him. As the years passed, we sadly resigned ourselves to never seeing him again. My brother, Lon, never did get the opportunity to meet him again as he passed away. End quote. When Lawrence met with Chang for the second time, he explained that he'd spent two years performing deep meditation in Borneo. Chang said that during this time, he had the epiphany that the old knowledge was fading from the common consciousness. He decided to do another documentary to remind humanity of the power that dwells inside us, docile and waiting for us to awaken it. He seems able to control the amplitude of this power like a dimmer switch and it causes uncontrollable responses in the patients. Chang believes that mastering Ying Qi is what will allow people to enter the spirit world. The purpose of qi in the traditional sense is mixed with the ancient beliefs of otherworldly in the spiritual. Because of the spiritual aspect of qi, qing and alternative eastern practices in general have been placed under scientific scrutiny. Suggestions of qing using electric shocks with a secret device have been spread throughout the years, but there's no idea why qing would do this to every single patient he sees as he would gain no profit from it. Furthermore, even an electronic device would not be able to set off such wild muscle movements so suddenly. This happened in the limbs of the patients after inserting the needles. In acupuncture, the body is said to absorb electrical energy or said energy is dispelled. The charge is seemingly mild at most. Not to mention that an electrical current and metal needles would mean the acupuncturist would likely be electrocuted by the device. Opinions vary, but many believe in the power of John Chang and Qi. Many Eastern practices are foreign to Westerners. People fear the unknown, especially those who cling on to logical science about spiritualism. In the second documentary, a team of American scientists were invited to investigate the practice and could not find any proof of trickery or misconduct with Chang's work. In fact, there was no way in which they could disprove the concept of Qi nor prove it, however. The idea of qi originates all the way back to the 5th century BCE in China. The Western viewer may associate the concept of qi with the now-abandoned ancient concept of the four humors or the ancient Hindu yogic belief. The Chinese philosopher by the name of Mencius, who lived in the 4th century BCE, described qi as the life force in all living beings. Nature, heavens, and oceans connected together by an invisible force that exists within all of us. Qi was commonly associated with the human body and its health. When the flow of qi was stable, your body was functioning and healthy. If it was unbalanced, it would cause sickness and disease. As such, the importance of qi grew over time and it was vital for people to keep there. The people believe that special exercises and metaphysical treatments could bring longevity and stability to one's life. The concept of qi has been a crucial part of Chinese and Asians' histories, philosophies, and beliefs. This means, however, there are various descriptions of what qi is. As time passed, thinkers created various kinds of qi. According to them, the heaviest fractions produce solid objects and matter. 
Like divisions of qi form liquids like the oceans and ethyl qi created life breath, it exists as energy within living beings. These beliefs remained popular during the 20th century and even now they're still followed, descendants following the paths laid out by their ancestors. Acupuncture is still a highly praised type of alternative medicine, especially in the East. In the end, we can only speculate on Zhang Chang or Dynamo Jack and his abilities. Are they real? Do we all truly possess an unstoppable force within us? Could we unlock unlimited potential with enough determination, practice, and understanding of the life force inside us? Did Zhang Chang really possess psychic abilities and powers, telekinesis, and more? Can we too learn to control such unthinkable powers if we only try hard enough? Or perhaps are some people born to be sacred healers and philosophers whilst others are not? We are left with a thousand questions which beg for answers, but some things are forever fated to be mystery. Unfortunately for us, the concept of qi is not one that's easy to prove or determine. It cannot be quite disproved. Therefore, we'll have to decide what we believe for ourselves. Some people doubt the metaphysical, others believe in it wholeheartedly, and some stay on the fence between the two views, uncertain of where the truth lies. But what is certain is that this enigma is intriguing and worth speculating on. A fairy is a mythical creature that's usually depicted as being small. Having a humanoid body, small wings and in some reports is even able to glow. The Eastern Virginia Medical School carried out a study in the 1970s in which they asked everyday Americans about their belief in the supernatural. The study showed that over two-thirds of them had an experience that they couldn't explain. There's many people that believe in certain regions of our planet. Small fairy-like creatures can be found and that at first they can be tough to make out due to how fast they fly. However, those who are able to get decent photographs do show what appears to be tiny fairy-like creatures. This person shared these interesting photographs to their Facebook page. At first glance, they appear to look like the typical fairy we all think of. They said the following about the photographs. My friend from Agatha visited me. Some of you will say it's just a moth, but it's not. I always meet them every night. With another person saying the following, you must have a very special relationship. They don't like people or cameras from what I understand. This person said this. These photographs are interesting and I think they do show a fairy. If you look at a photograph of a moth and then compare it to this, it's completely different. Moths don't have thin bodies and legs like that. I think the people need to be more open-minded about these creatures. I think it's quite obvious that there's something going on. My friends have seen creatures that look similar to this, and it's true that when they're around you, they do look like moths. But upon closer inspection, you can see these are tiny fairy-like creatures. However, not everyone is convinced by these types of discoveries. Skeptics have pointed out these are just everyday creatures, with one person saying the following, I see these in my garden all the time, and they're not fairies but rather midges. End quote. For those unaware, midges are small flying insects that have a maximum wingspan of 2 to 4 millimeters. There's over 35 different species of these creatures in the UK alone, with wildlife researchers noting that they live in practically every land area outside of dry deserts. There's people though that state this isn't what they're seeing in their photographs and that believe very large creatures do live in certain regions on our planet. It seems that there's no shortage of mysterious creatures living among us. The Irish have their leprechauns and the Scandinavians have their trunks. Latin America has El Duende. Standing less than two feet tall, El Duende is said to cause mischief wherever they're seen. They are described as being covered in hair, including long bushy beards for the men. Some also described a wide brim hand. These mysterious creatures can hail from the forest or live inside the walls of your home. They are mostly seen by children as they tend to be mischievous and childlike themselves. They also blame for quite a bit of strange doings around one's home. Your missing keys or that important paper that went missing. This has caused some to say that these creatures are playing tricks on you. In most stories, they seem fairly harmless. Some even suggest offering up your first bite to any meal to them as to keep them on your good side. They are said to lend a helping hand around the house. Other locals have reported that if you get lost in the woods, you can call out to these creatures and they will help you. This seemed to remain true as long as you weren't causing harm. When boys grow up to play in the woods, they are warned of the watcher of the woods. Little boys were told not to make too much mischief in the woods and not to cause harm to any of the animals. Elder Wendy was always watching you and if he spotted you doing wrong, he would appear to you and take you to his cave, which many stories state is deep inside the woods. The only way to escape was to fool him into thinking you was one of his kind. Elder Wendy only has four fingers. If you could hide your thumb and convince him so, he would let you go. Another tale tells of the sleeping El Duende. 
Settling in for a nap, the creature would rest against a tree, slowly disguising themselves as the clay around them. Children would find small clay statues of little gnomes throughout the woods and would sometimes take them home. During the night, they would sneak off back into the woods. When the children awoke and found the figure missing, they knew for sure that they'd plucked one of the small gnomes. Interestingly, although these sound like childish tales, many have come forward with alleged proof of these creatures' existence. There have been many sightings, pictures, and videos that point to this creature being genuine. Many people, whether they believe in many folk tales or not, believe in the El Duendo's existence. Some put them in the same category as Bigfoot or Tupacabra. Others believe it just to be a cautionary tale to boys heading into the woods. Whether it's a tale to keep children out of trouble or simply a tale meant to enlist a fear, urban legends will continue to be told as long as stories exist. It may be because they're just fun. Some believe, however, it gives us a very keen insight into our deepest fears as humans. Perhaps it's that keeps us coming back for more. Others suggest that the majority of these stories are based on real events and that over time they've just been retold. As mentioned earlier, there's no shortage of mysterious creature encounters and every year people come forward with their stories, detailing impossible to explain creatures. Perhaps the study of cryptids needs to be taken more seriously. After all, people from all around the world have reported encountering creatures not recognized by science, with some even being able to provide photographic evidence. Maybe it won't be long before scientists make a breakthrough in some of these cases. As many know, it's no secret that there's various locations on our planets that remain unexplored. So maybe some of these cryptids could be hiding away in these isolated places. Only time will tell whether these creatures live among us or just in our imagination. The United States government is well known for conducting a wide variety of strange research experiments. Many of these are described as being on the cutting edge of scientific advancement. This has led to incredible breakthroughs in medicine, computer technology, agriculture, and a wide variety of additional fields used across the military. Oddly enough, however, there seems to be a recently declassified government experiment that was approved for release back in 2003, surrounding the training of psychic soldiers and enhancements to the brain known as the Gateway Process Experience Experiments. The declassified document titled Analysis and Assessment of Gateway Process seems to be a written memo between a U.S. Army researcher at the CIA and sent to a U.S. Army operational commander located out of Fort Meade. The study of the memo seems to have been the analysis surrounding the legitimacy of the Gateway Process study. As the researcher writes the following in an opening statement, you asked me to provide an assessment of the Gateway experience in terms of its mechanics and ultimate practicality. Most likely, the U.S. government was unaware of what the gateway process really entailed and so sent an independent researcher to the examination areas to undergo the process and learn if there was any legitimacy to the study in the first place for continued funding. Within the first paragraph of the document, however, the researcher makes a special note to include that the gateway process was a technique designed by Isaac Bentov, stating the following. Based on conversations with a physician who took the gateway training with me, I had recourse to the biomedical models developed by Isaac Bentov to obtain information concerning the physical aspects of the process. For those that are not aware, Isaac Ben Hoff was a leading Israeli researcher known for his incredible contributions in the creation of patents for the steerable heart catheter, ECG electrodes. Pacemaker leads and a number of other patents that would help to form the Boston Scientific Meditech Corporation. Isaac Ben Hoff was also known for his contributions to the Israeli Defense Force, being one of the lead inventors on the Israeli Missile Project, as well as many other improvised weapons. However, what many are not aware of surrounding the Israeli inventor was his developed belief in following the mystical side of consciousness, which would lead to his primary contributions to the Gateway Process Experiment. John Abel Bentov's fellow business partner was once quoted as saying that Bentov said the following, Bentov was interested in how the brain worked and actually attached electrodes to his head, which were connected to a function generator in which he could change the wave shape and the power and learned about how the brain interprets these different frequencies, hinting at the plausibility of Bentov's connection with the gateway process experiment. The document then goes into the breakdown of what the gateway process holds, with the first explanation from the researcher being in regards to the human body's natural frequencies of the brain and the frequency following a response. According to the study, a form of enlightenment can be triggered in a person's mind when both hemispheres of the brain begin operating at the same frequency, allowing them to communicate without any form of distraction and leading to a heightened state of focus. 
Although it requires a number of different techniques to reach the state, the main contributing factor in the study was a device that relied on the human body's natural frequency following response. In the document, the researcher details the following statement. Achieve synchronization of brain hemispheres, the hemisync technique takes advantage of a phenomenon known as the frequency following response, or the FFAR, which means that if a subject hears a sound produced at a frequency which emulates one of those associated with the operation of the human brain, the brain will try to mimic the same frequency pattern by adjusting its brainwave hears sound frequencies which approximates brainwave outputs to the theta level. The subject's brain will endeavor to alter its brainwave pattern from the normal beta to the theta level. Additional techniques for reaching a sinking of the hemispheres include assisted hypothesis from a psychologist as well as techniques that match transcendental meditation practices. With a note stating that gurus who have practiced transcendental meditation practices for 20 years have the ability to reach a hemisphere sink for up to 15 minutes at a time without any form of assisted technology. According to the document, this training lasts around seven days before a person is capable of reaching a hemisphere sync frequency with the assistance of technology and is capable of furthering the study with tasks related to skill and a gateway process experience techniques. The first task that is given to the trained subject is that of problem solving. When under the influence of synced hemispheres, a subject can call upon its higher self for assistance in solving problems with the higher self representing a form of unfiltered subconsciousness that can remember everything ever taught to the subject and use it for perfect creativity and logical deduction. The document details that this ability can be used to solve personal difficulties, technical problems in the realm of physics, mathematics, science, practical, administrative problems, and so on in a way turning the brain into an instantly responding and calculating computer that can analyze and process information at a much faster rate than normal. The second task that is given to a trained subject is referred to as an energy bar tool. The subject is then required to visualize and focus different forms of energy throughout its body being fed by the universe to allow the body to undergo rapid healing processes. This could mean that with the increased focus on the mind, the brain can suddenly in consciousness force autonomous physical processes such as healing and heart rate ravines. The third, and usually described as the final task for most of the subjects, is referred to by the researchers of the gateway process experience as remote viewing. Although it's not similar to traditional remote viewing noted by psychics to see distant locations using astral projection. Instead, the technique requires the subject to visualize and access parts of their memory and begin to holographically portray the memory in such a way as to allow the person to relive memories with perfect total recall. The researcher writing the document then notes that this is typically where training and ability of most of the subjects end, and that less than 5% of the participants are able to move party skills into the realm of impossible to understand psychic abilities. The document then details the following. The ability known as Focus 21 The Future, the last and most advanced of all focus states associated with the Gateway Training Program, involves movement outside of the boundaries of time spaces in Focus 15, but with attention to discovering the future rather than the past. The individual who has achieved this state has reached a truly advanced level. The research document then goes on to state that the ability to travel into the future is accomplished only after the subject is able to master an out-of-body experience. This occurs when the natural brain frequency of the hemispheres are synced and then reach a matching frequency with the background electromagnetic phenomenon of the universe, allowing consciousness to imprint itself and begin to leave its body and journey out into the rest of the world, picking up electromagnetic information similar to how a radio captures radio waves and how our eyes capture photons to imprint an image of our surrounding environment. Once this information begins to pour into the consciousness of a person, they can then begin the process of astral projection that will allow them to speed up time and look into the future, as well as deep within the past at moments that their memory would not be able to access. Unfortunately, the document does not go into any form of evidence. Surrounding the legitimacy of the claims of an out-of-body experience with the ability to see into the past or future with verifiable tests, Regardless of this lack of information, the formal conclusion of the document states the following. There is a sound. Rational basis in terms of physical science parameters for considering the gateway process experience to be plausible in terms of its essential objectives of heightened brain activity. Additionally, the document seems to hold several pages involving a new scientific theory as to the formation of the universe and that is actually a massive three-dimensional toroid. 
helping to explain why certain parts of the universe seem to be moving at faster speeds compared to others as evidence of this donut shaped moving the mass of galaxies back down and around to the other side of the universe. The document then ends with the researcher stating that the gateway process experience should be provided to all members of the organization for heightened mental ability and goes on to suggest a 12-step plan as to how to provide the gateway training to all members of the organization. Although the document fails to elaborate on the finding, the memo then states the training could open up members of the gateway process to be attacked by intelligent energy beings if the boundaries of time and space are being surpassed. Stating the following, subjects must be intellectually prepared to react to possible encounters with intelligent, non-corporal energy forms when time-space boundaries are exceeded. With additional statements that perhaps practical use of the gateway process experience could be used to gather information from such entities and the universal consciousness. The United States government is well known for conducting a wide variety of strange research experiments. Many of these are described as being on the cutting edge of scientific advancement. This has led to incredible breakthroughs in medicine, computer technology, agriculture, and a wide variety of additional fields used across the military. Oddly enough, however, there seems to be a recently declassified government experiment that was approved for release back in 2003, surrounding the training of psychic soldiers and enhancements to the brain known as the Gateway Process Experience Experiments. The declassified document titled Analysis and Assessment of Gateway Process seems to be a written memo between a U.S. Army researcher at the CIA and sent to a U.S. Army operational commander located out of Fort Meade. The study of the memo seems to have been the analysis surrounding the legitimacy of the Gateway Process study. As the researcher writes the following in an opening statement, you asked me to provide an assessment of the Gateway experience in terms of its mechanics and ultimate practicality. Most likely, the U.S. government was unaware of what the gateway process really entailed, and so sent an independent researcher to the examination areas to undergo the process and learn if there was any legitimacy to the study in the first place for continued funding. Within the first paragraph of the document, however, the researcher makes a special note to include that the gateway process was a technique designed by Isaac Bentov, stating the following. Based on conversations with a physician who took the gateway training with me, I had recourse to the biomedical models developed by Isaac Bentov to obtain information concerning the physical aspects of the process. For those that are not aware, Isaac Ben Hoff was a leading Israeli researcher known for his incredible contributions in the creation of patents for the steerable heart catheter, ECG electrodes. Pacemaker leads and a number of other patents that would help to form the Boston Scientific Meditech Corporation. Isaac Ben Hoff was also known for his contributions to the Israeli Defense Force, being one of the lead inventors on the Israeli missile project, as well as many other improvised weapons. However, what many are not aware of surrounding the Israeli inventor was his developed belief in following the mystical side of consciousness, which would lead to his primary contributions to the Gateway Process experiment. John Abel Bentov's fellow business partner was once quoted as saying that Bentov said the following, Bentov was interested in how the brain worked and actually attached electrodes to his head, which were connected to a function generator in which he could change the wave shape and the power, and learned about how the brain interprets these different frequencies, hinting at the plausibility of Bentov's connection with the gateway process experiment. The document then goes into the breakdown of what the gateway process holds, with the first explanation from the researcher being in regards to the human body's natural frequencies of the brain and the frequency following a response. According to the study, a form of enlightenment can be triggered in a person's mind when both hemispheres of the brain begin operating at the same frequency, allowing them to communicate without any form of distraction and leading to a heightened state of focus. Although it requires a number of different techniques to reach the state, the main contributing factor in the study was a device that relied on the human body's natural frequency following response. In the document, the researcher details the following statement. Achieve synchronization of brain hemispheres, the hemisync technique takes advantage of a phenomenon known as the frequency following response, or the FFAR which means that if a subject hears a sound produced at a frequency which emulates one of those associated with the operation of the human brain. The brain will try to mimic the same frequency pattern by adjusting its brainwave hears sound frequencies which approximates brainwave outputs to the theta level. The subject's brain will endeavor to alter its brainwave pattern from the normal beta to the theta level. 
Additional techniques for reaching a sinking of the hemispheres include assisted hypothesis from a psychologist as well as techniques that match transcendental meditation practices. With a note stating that gurus who have practiced transcendental meditation practices for 20 years have the ability to reach a hemisphere sink for up to 15 minutes at a time without any form of assisted technology. According to the document, this training lasts around seven days before a person is capable of reaching a hemisphere sync frequency with the assistance of technology and is capable of furthering the study with tasks related to skill and a gateway process experience techniques. The first task that is given to the trained subject is that of problem solving. When under the influence of synced hemispheres, a subject can call upon its higher self for assistance in solving problems with the higher self representing a form of unfiltered subconsciousness that can remember everything ever taught to the subject and use it for perfect creativity and logical deduction. The document details that this ability can be used to solve personal difficulties, technical problems in the realm of physics, mathematics, science, practical, administrative problems, and so on in a way turning the brain into an instantly responding and calculating computer that can analyze and process information at a much faster rate than normal. The second task that is given to a trained subject is referred to as an energy bar tool. The subject is then required to visualize and focus different forms of energy throughout its body being fed by the universe to allow the body to undergo rapid healing processes. This could mean that with the increased focus on the mind, the brain can suddenly in consciousness force autonomous physical processes such as healing and heart rate ravines. The third, and usually described as the final task for most of the subjects, is referred to by the researchers of the gateway process experience as remote viewing. Although it's not similar to traditional remote viewing noted by psychics to see distant locations using astral projection. Instead, the technique requires the subject to visualize and access parts of their memory and begin to holographically portray the memory in such a way as to allow the person to relive memories with perfect total recall. The researcher writing the document then notes that this is typically where training and ability of most of the subjects end, and that less than 5% of the participants are able to move party skills into the realm of impossible to understand psychic abilities. The document then details the following. The ability known as Focus 21 The Future, the last and most advanced of all focus states associated with the Gateway Training Program, involves movement outside of the boundaries of time spaces in Focus 15. But with attention to discovering the future rather than the past, the individual who has achieved this state has reached a truly advanced level. The research document then goes on to state that the ability to travel into the future is accomplished only after the subject is able to master an out-of-body experience. This occurs when the natural brain frequency of the hemispheres are synced and then reach a matching frequency with the background electromagnetic phenomenon of the universe, allowing consciousness to imprint itself and begin to leave its body and journey out into the rest of the world, picking up electromagnetic information similar to how a radio captures radio waves and how our eyes capture photons to imprint an image of our surrounding environment. Once this information begins to pour into the consciousness of a person, they can then begin the process of astral projection that will allow them to speed up time and look into the future, as well as deep within the past at moments that their memory would not be able to access. Unfortunately, the document does not go into any form of evidence. Surrounding the legitimacy of the claims of an out-of-body experience with the ability to see into the past or future with verifiable tests, Regardless of this lack of information, the formal conclusion of the document states the following. There is a sound. Rational basis in terms of physical science parameters for considering the gateway process experience to be plausible in terms of its essential objectives of heightened brain activity. Additionally, the document seems to hold several pages involving a new scientific theory as to the formation of the universe and that is actually a massive three-dimensional toroid helping to explain why certain parts of the universe seem to be moving at faster speeds compared to others as evidence of this donut-shaped moving in the mass of galaxies back down and around to the other side of the universe. The document then ends with the researcher stating that the gateway process experience should be provided to all members of the organization for heightened mental ability, and goes on to suggest a 12-step plan as to how to provide the gateway training to all members of the organization. Although the document fails to elaborate on the finding, the memo then states the training could open up members of the gateway process to be attacked by intelligent energy beings if the boundaries of time and space are being surpassed. 
stating the following, subjects must be intellectually prepared to react to possible encounters with intelligent, non-corporal energy forms when time-space boundaries are exceeded. With additional statements that perhaps practical use of the gateway process experience could be used to gather information from such entities and the universal consciousness. Humans have managed to accomplish a lot in a relatively short time. We've already sent humans to live in space and to the moon. We've developed large and very sophisticated telescopes that have been able to reach some of the most remote places in space. Many organizations have decided to take it a step further. The European Space Agency, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and NASA have been working very hard to find if we're completely alone. Organizations are now sending probes and rovers to distant planets in order to see if it hosts life. These missions have piqued the interest of millions of people worldwide, and due to our technology and the various photographs that get sent back, it's caused some to do a little digging of their own. It seems though that all this has done is worked against the organizations as people from various countries have managed to find some mysterious anomalies on and around planets in our solar system. One of the most interesting discoveries is that of the Mars tunnels. This discovery doesn't get much attention, but when it was discovered back in 1999, many people couldn't wrap their head around what the Mars Global Surveyor had captured. When the photographs started to get seen, various theories were put forward to try and explain them. One that received the most attention was that these photographs showed some type of ancient tunnel system that had been built on the Red Planet. This for some was the proof they'd been looking for and that these structures were proof that an ancient civilization had once called this place home. The Mars Orbiter Surveyor was launched on the 7th of November 1996. It had taken years to build this incredible piece of equipment, but it's noted by NASA as being the first successful mission to the Red Planet in over 20 years. The orbiter finally reached the Red Planets back in March of 1999, where it would then go on to map the terrain from a low altitude. Since this date, it sent back thousands of images, interestingly many of which haven't been studied by researchers or scientists, and which some say do hide interesting anomalies that could help us understand the planet's environment better. This early surveyor was able to tell scientists a lot about Mars' surface, environment, atmosphere, and interior. That was on the Mars Orbiter was able to send back some incredible images that would help us understand how we would approach this planet in the future when it came to missions. During this mission though the spacecraft sent back some interesting photographs that some say can't be explained using natural explanations. As mentioned one of the most interesting ones is that of the Mars glass tunnels. These mysterious tunnels have been described as looking like large impressive structures that don't naturally occur on the planet. They have the typical shape of what you'd expect a tunnel to look like and are partially covered by the surface's terrain, causing some to suggest that these structures are tens of thousands of years old. Interestingly, other high-quality photographs show these tunnels as looking partially transparent. This was one of the first things that people noticed about them, with some saying that because of this translucent-like quality, it made them stand out against the Martian backdrop. There's even others that went down a different route and suggested that what we're looking at could have been a creature while others said that what we're looking at could be an ancient graveyard. This theory comes about after some compare the structures as looking like whale ribs and bones that are sometimes discovered in cold regions on our planet. Another idea is that these tunnel-like systems were created by giant ice worms. Ice worms are known to live in gravel beds or the banks of glacial ice. Some have suggested that this is what we're seeing here but on a much larger scale, again suggesting that many years ago these creatures existed and carved out these large tunnels. However, some have said this doesn't explain why the tubes appear to be partially transparent, and this has caused some to put forward the idea these were created by intelligent beings. Space agencies have said though these are not tunnels, but rather are natural dunes that have developed over the years. NASA even came forward and backed up this statement. David C. Pieri of Earth and Space Sciences Division of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory said that there's nothing mysterious about these glass tunnel anomalies and that what we're looking at is just a Martian dune. Dr. Pieri is respected in his field, but some have disagreed with this statement, especially when they've gone on to compare the alleged anomalies with Mars dunes, saying that the two are not similar. Some even went forward to say that David hadn't viewed the zoomed-in images and just received the original image that looks much different to the cropped version. In reality, the discovery has been at the center of an interesting discussion, which is, is there life on Mars? Regardless, it seems that believers are sticking to the idea that these are genuine tunnels either created or dug up by something living on the Red Planet.
Mars is the planet that people look to for life, perhaps because it's within reach and that it's always been featured in the news. Interestingly, NASA themselves have also dropped hints of this according to those who've looked into the topic. For example, going back a few months ago, one story that made the news came from one of NASA's chief scientists. NASA will soon be traveling to Mars in order to drill deep in the rocks. This is in the hopes of finding evidence of living organisms on the red planet. Mars could be home to current life as the space agency has expressed much interest in the planets over the years, along with upcoming space agency SpaceX, who have said they plan to put humans on the red planet within the next few years. Dr. Jim Green is the man who came forward and said the statement, and he thinks this mission could be a real success in finding life on Mars. However, he has said that he doesn't think people of our planet would be ready for the news. It's no secret that we've managed to accomplish a lot in a relatively short amount of time. And in regards to space, although it's massive, we have discovered some incredible things in recent years. It's been suggested by the scientists that this mission will likely be going on for the next few years and that it will take some time to find out if there really is life on Mars. Dr. Green said the following about the upcoming mission. Been worried about that because I think we're close to finding it and making some announcements. It will start a whole new line of thinking. I don't think we're prepared for the results. Interestingly, some have said they think we're close to discovering life on other planets and they say this because it seems that space agencies are gearing up to explore space more. They use SpaceX and Space Force as an example and say they think Space Force was established because they think they're trying to tell us something. Other countries have shown a massive interest in space. This includes places like China who not too long ago made history by landing on the dark side of the moon. It's not just NASA who will be digging into the Martian surface. It's also reported that the European Space Agency along with Russia will also be heading to Mars and their main goal is to find life. Saying they're hopeful and open to the idea that life could be on Mars. NASA's Mars 2020 rover will be sent to the planet with our mission, and that's to find life. Researchers have said it will be equipped with the newest technology that will help aid in this discovery and that once it's collected samples, it will be sent back to Earth. Dr. Green has said he's excited for this next step and that he wished the European Space Agency and Russia the best of luck in their mission. Dr. Green went on to say that if we discovered life, it would be an incredible milestone, but it would also lead to many questions that we're not able to answer. For example, how did life get there? Are we related in some way and how long has it been there? And we'll hopefully touch down on Mars on the 18th of February 2021. Researchers now know that water exists on Mars, which scientists say they think this lake sits under the planet's south polar ice camp and it's around 12 miles or 20 kilometers across. All across the world, researchers have discovered incredible megalithic structures. Although they are impressive, they have continued to puzzle engineers and archaeologists in the modern era. Not only are these structures impossible to replicate in current times, but they were seen as monumental and impossible tasks for our ancient ancestors. How they built these structures is widely unknown and has caused a massive stir in the archaeological communities. How could our ancient ancestors build such incredible structures in a time when it was deemed impossible? Various theories have been put forward to try and explain them, but the majority of these are just theories and are still up for debate. However, recently researchers have announced that one of Stonehenge's mysteries has been solved. Always a major fascination amongst the locals of the area and researchers from around the world, Stonehenge has proven to be quite a mystery to anyone who even attempts to understand its construction and the techniques behind it. What only are the large blocks used so massive? that even modern means of construction would fail in regards to establishing Stonehenge. But the sources of the blocks appear to have been carved from hundreds of miles away, which lead many researchers to question the ability of transporting such large stones to the area. To add to this bizarre strangeness of the formation of Stonehenge, it's been discovered that the structure appears to have been built with astonishing precision in its placement and carved creation. The structure appears to be able to be used as a complex calendar and can keep track of time to an incredibly mysterious accurate degree. However, this does insinuate that not only did the ancients have the technology to cut the stones with laser precision, transport the massive logs, lift them with tremendous force, and place them with perfect alignment, but that our ancestors also had the ability to make megalithic structures in a very short span of time. This continues to baffle researchers to this day who work to uncover more secrets regarding Stonehenge, such as its weird electromagnetic properties and special materials used in its creation. 
Others have even argued that the formation of the Great Stone Hinge could be direct proof of ancient technologies and extraterrestrial intervention. Researchers and scientists don't agree with this notion, though, and have even said they've unraveled one of its mysteries, and this is where the famous large stones come from. Before this discovery, researchers only knew that the stones had been placed there around 2500 BC. But a new study carried out by researchers at the University of Brighton have announced that they've traced the stones to a woodland close to Wiltshire. It's here that they say the stones originated, and back when the monument was being constructed, this area would have been rich with these large sarsen boulders, the rocks that were used to build Stonehenge. Further studies showed the team that the ancient civilization would have chosen these giant boulders because of their size and how flat they were. This in turn is thought to have helped the prehistoric workers to move the stones. Interestingly, the team said that not only did they use these giant stones for Stonehenge, but they also used them to construct other structures. The team also said that over a thousand years before Stonehenge was constructed, the giant blocks would have been used to construct a massive local prehistoric tomb. This would have been four important individuals in the region. The archaeologists have said it's an exciting discovery and that now they're trying to work out the route in which the workers took to transport them. Although the team said they made great progress, they still said they want to work out how the workers transported these 15 to 45 ton stones over 15 miles. When looking into the route though, they said this would have been no easy task as during some of these trips, these giant boulders would have had to have been hauled up an incline for several hundred meters. As of right now, more study is needed to determine how these ancient workers achieved this. Interestingly though, those who have looked into Stonehenge have said this more than what meets the eye. For years, an archaeological site of significant importance has always been a major fascination amongst the locals of the area. And researchers from around the world and that location is Stonehenge. And those who've studied the interesting monument have said it's proven to be quite a mystery to anyone who even attempts to try and understand it. When researchers attempted to better understand the strange electromagnetic phenomenon experienced at Stonehenge, they began to put forward a theory when plotting on a map a number of different megalithic monuments. That points to the idea of one long and massive road that seems to have connected the monuments in a straight line. This would later lead to the theory that the spiritual placement of Stonehenge was that of a mystical property and that this invisible road could have been referenced to a mystical line of energy that ran around the world known as a ley line. Though no one is quite sure that ley lines are responsible for it, it is believed there is a connection with that of the Earth's electromagnetic field and a property of mystical energy surrounding the entire monument. Ley lines are lines that cut across the Earth spotted with landmarks and historic structures and convey alongside them flowing Earth energies and these energies are concentrated at the points the lines meet. The concept behind the lines started with amateur archaeologist and businessman Alfred Watkins in 1921. This is when he realized that ancient sites appear to be lined up with others close by. Drew lines on its map to show that people that lived in Old Britain traveled in a straight line pattern with major man-made or natural sites falling in this line. In his 1925 book, The Old Straight Track, he suggested that ancient Roman and medieval structures across the globe fall within these straight lines, but his proposal was rejected by experts and archaeological scholars. His fault finders noticed that his faults depended on drawing lines between destinations set up at various times of the past. They additionally contended that in ancient times it was unfeasible to go in a straight line of a bumpy or rugged zones in Britain, rendering his ley lines far-fetched as trade routes. A year later, Watkins' followers started the Straight Line Club, and in 1927 Watkins published a book titled The Ley Line Hunters to help those interested in finding their own ley lines. The New Age movement interest in ley lines started in the 1960s by Earth Mysteries movement, growing from something ordinary to a whole field of study with more published books, research and fans, gathering together to dig deeper and find new paths that ley lines led to. Most believe these lines had supernatural powers or mysterious energies, even though Watkins never had that thought in the beginning. Other paranormal subjects have infused the concepts of ley lines to include things like UFOs and Atlantis. Critics to this day feel that until ley lines are proven scientifically, it cannot be taken seriously as most of the connected lines are mere coincidence. Ley lines remain a mystery and whether or not they're true, it goes to show man's interest in finding patterns in everything around us. It's interesting to think how far humanity has come in regards to structures. We've built some incredible ones in the modern day, but some of the most impressive and mysterious are those that our ancient ancestors built.
Although we step closer to understanding how they did it, sometimes discoveries can throw up more questions than answers. These interesting discoveries and monuments make for interesting conversations. And perhaps one day, we'll be able to look back and understand just how they did it. So what do you make of this recent discovery? And how do you think the prehistoric workers were able to get the slabs to the Stonehenge location? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comments section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos. Hamad Ali has gone down in history as being one of the greatest boxers of all time. His achievements in boxing would pave the way for future champions and inspire millions. His unique personality was only matched by his incredible skill in the ring. Many heavyweight champions regard him as the greatest boxer of all time, saying that he wasn't someone who had to work on his skill, but rather he was born with an incredible gift. He fought in the Olympics and would go on to become a world champion boxer. Ali stood at over six foot and had a unique fighting style, relying heavily on his quick footwork and being able to avoid punches at close range. Couple this with his incredible speed and accuracy, and in his prime he was untouchable. Muhammad Ali also spoke up on many political issues during his time. This included his name being changed from Cassis Clay to Muhammad Ali, and refusing to enter the military. Just before Ali's fight with George Foreman in 1974, he said the iconic quote, floats like a butterfly, stings like a bee, his hands can't hit what his eyes can't see. However, there was a side to Muhammad Ali that many people weren't aware of. He even tried to openly talk about it on The Tonight Show back in 1973, but the host and even the audience just laughed at him. This was the subject of UFOs. Muhammad Ali has started talking about the subject during the interview, something that the crowd thought was a joke. However, during this interesting interview, he goes on to talk about the topic for three minutes. It's important to note that during the 1970s, if somebody openly talked about UFOs, they were branded as crazy. The topic was definitely in its darker days, with people who came forward with their encounters being immediately debunked or called a liar. Ali had talked about his encounters with these mysterious crowds, even going on to say that during his lifetime he had encountered around 16 UFOs. During The Tonight Show, he was meant to be promoting his rematch with heavyweight champion Ken Norton, but as mentioned, the conversation took a different turn. Before he talks about the topic, the host notices that something is playing on the box's mind and that he seems to be a little troubled. This is when Ali opens up and says the following, I've been studying UFOs. Did you know these UFOs are unidentified flying objects flying around above us? I'm serious, they've sighted a bunch above Georgia. I've seen them at night. They have real photos of them. The government knows about them, but the people don't seem to talk about them. I have moving photographs of these sources that people took, and I'm surprised that people don't talk about them. The talk show host then goes on to mock Muhammad Ali while he's trying to talk about this topic or while the audience is laughing at him. You can tell that he was someone who looked into this topic and researched the various sightings that had been happening around that time. The host then goes on to say that what people were photographing and seeing were most likely satellites. Muhammad Ali then responds by saying the following, No, these crafts were 50 feet above the highway. They call it swamp gas. They don't know what they are. I think I know what they are. They are sources and objects coming into our atmosphere flying around. And people got pictures of them. They are sighted in many cities. They're red, green, and blue lines, but authorities brush it off like we're mental. Funny enough, after he says this, the host then asks why they don't land and come and say hi, to which Ali responds that they can't get no sense out of the people here. The audience then cheers, but Ali sits there with a serious expression on his face. He then details that he has photographs and moving films of his mysterious, unidentified flying objects. Those who have watched the interview have said it's bizarre how the interviewer tries to debunk everything that Muhammad Ali says. At another point in the interview, Ali says he was able to catch one of these crafts moving around in the sky, to which the host replies that it could be a motion picture. Ali's expression after this seems to be a mixture of frustration and sadness. After reading the room, he eventually gives up and goes on to talk about the find. Interestingly, after this footage was originally aired, it was cut out of the replays. Then the producers decided to cut the whole interview together. As some have pointed out, why would they do this? Was Ali touching on a subject that at that time was considered off-limits? During the 1970s, UFOs were really talked about. And if you were someone that wanted to bring up the topic, you'd usually be debunked straight away and the topic would be changed. Similar to what happened to Muhammad Ali during this interview. It's interesting to see how far we've come in regards to this topic. 
Now media outlets are openly talking about UFOs with various high up officials even admitting that some UFO footage that's been captured is genuine. The government hasn't always been open about UFOs. However, it seems that in recent years, officials have decided to change that. UFOs have been talked about more than ever with some theorists putting forward the idea that disclosure could be coming anytime soon. After all, going back several weeks ago, the Pentagon formally released three unclassified videos taken by Navy pilots. The mysterious video showing UFOs had been circulating for years. It's caused various theories to be put forward to try and explain them. However, for skeptics, they wouldn't believe the footage until the government came forward and announced they were real. And this is exactly what happened and they were given the name of unidentified aerial phenomena. Although this is massive news, it's not anything new. Pilots have been coming forward for years and detailing their interactions with unidentified flying objects. One person said the following, the comments are interesting and even after they capture these unidentified aerial objects on camera, it still feels like they're downplaying it. Although this is great news and I'm happy they're admitting that videos are genuine and show something mysterious. What about all the people that's been told to be quiet when they've talked about these encounters? And I'm not just talking about everyday people. People in high positions who have talked about these objects have been branded as crazy. Where's the justice in that? All they were trying to do is reveal what they saw and they were told to be quiet. With some people even losing their jobs or being demoted over it. Many UFO believers have said they're excited by the recent UFO videos and news that we've recovered off-world graphs. This could be one of the greatest discoveries that the human race has ever made. Not only this, but believers have said it's big news coming from the government and officials. As for the last few decades, they've hardly been open to the idea of talking about unidentified flying objects and have even gone out of their way to debunk those who have come forward with their stories. Perhaps then we should be celebrating this news and looking forward to what other information the government is holding. Some pointed out this is just the tip of the iceberg and that officials know a lot more than what they've told us. Interestingly, celebrities like Tom DeLonge have been vocal about UFOs. Going back a month ago, Tom DeLonge said the following on his Twitter account. Everyone will know the reality soon. And unfortunately, it's not just something to laugh at. It's pretty unnerving with some bad news and some good news. And with that in mind, all we can do is deal with it honestly and openly. We now know what Tom was referring to. It turns out that in a recent statement by Steve Justice, who is the chief operating officer of To The Stars Academy of Arts and Sciences, says how the organization got their hands on exotic properties. He said the following about the object. The structure and composition of these materials are not from any non-existing military or commercial application. They've been collected from sources with varying levels of chain of custody documentation. So we are focusing on verifiable facts and working to develop independent scientific proof of the materials, properties, and attributes. In some cases, the manufacturing technology required to fabricate the materials is only now becoming available. It's interesting to think what Muhammad Ali would think about the recent news in regards to UFOs. Now more than ever, more people are coming forward with their sightings and encounters and it seems that as a whole, more people are open to the idea of there being life out there. With the Milky Way galaxy being home to billions of planets and the universe being home to billions of galaxies, it's easy to see why more people are believing that there's life out there. For some, they believe that if life does exist somewhere in the universe, it's on a distant planet billions of miles away from us. But for some, they believe that an advanced race may have made their way to us, and this is backed up by the constant reports of unidentified flying objects. The brand of Disney has always been synonymous with childhood classics and carefree amusement parks since the animation company was founded roughly a century ago. It's because of this brand image that it comes as an unbelievable surprise that the company was believed to be at the center of a long-standing theory and eventual government disclosure of extraterrestrials to future populations. Although skeptics claim that this theory is nothing more than a paranoid rants targeted at one of the largest United States corporations to ever exist, it appears that with the discovery of the lost Disney documentary surrounding unidentified flying objects in the alien cover-up, there is definitely a profound amount of legitimacy to the claim. So today we're going to take a look at the Walt Disney UFO documentary and what it means for the government disclosure of the extraterrestrial visitation of our planet. Titled Alien Encounters and hosted by Robert Uring, the Disney documentary clearly states its purpose in the opening scenes. 
The beginning scene starts with an opening speech by Michael Eisner, the chairman and CEO of the Walt Disney Company from 1984 to 2005. He goes on to state the following, with more and more scientific evidence of alien encounters and UFO sightings, the idea of creatures from another planet might not be as far-fetched as we once thought. In fact, one of you out there could have the next alien encounter. He ended his speech with claiming that the documentary is a televised special that was most likely meant to be shown in three parts. The first section of the documentary opens with the host Robert Urich stating the following. We must prepare you for the future with some shocking insights of the recent past. The next four minutes of the documentary then show stunning high-quality video clips of extraterrestrial sightings and visitations. With one such video recorded back in 1991 in Ottawa, Canada, it appears that an unmarked vehicle meets with a landed UFO craft in a remote location as an anonymous videographer documents the scene. The footage is then cut short to show an interview with Captain Kevin Randall a retired Air Force intelligence officer that claims there is more than a substantial amount of evidence for the proof of the existence of extraterrestrial visitations and that they are a massive security threat that cannot be stopped with our current technology. It's at this moment in the documentary that we see the real reason behind its creation. Shortly after, Captain Kevin Randall talks about the national security threat of alien life. The documentary goes into detail about a federal-funded study done by the Brookings Institution that warns the government to prepare for the discovery of life in Spain and that the disclosure of alien visitation would lead to mass panic and the total destruction of civilization as we know it. Could it be that Walt Disney was hired by the United States government to begin slow disclosure of alien visitation to the general population via movies and cartoons to help prepare us for our meeting with superior interstellar creatures in fact? The documentary host states shortly after this interview in an exact quote, Disney Imagineers have designed a way to prepare humans for their inevitable alien encounter. At this point in the documentary, the host of the televised event explains the theory surrounding why extraterrestrials are visiting our planet. In a blunt matter-of-fact way of speaking, without hesitation or doubt in the claims, the host says the following. What the world didn't know in 1945 was that the atomic bomb's brilliant burst of energy would also be mankind's cosmic calling card, announcing to the universe that a technological society had evolved on a small blue planet in the backwaters of the stars. Alien enthusiasts have often noticed that UFO sightings and alien abductions began in mass following the first use of nuclear weaponry on the planet. Could Disney have been provided this information by the U.S. government as the actual reason for alien visitation? explained to them via alien contact. Oddly enough, the host states this is less of a theory and more of a verified fact. At around 20 minutes into the documentary, a chilling discovery is made as uncovered government documents go into the true dangers of UFOs arriving at our planet. During the heightened tensions of the Cold War, sensors for intercontinental ballistic missiles began to detect mysterious high-speed movements through the atmosphere that resembled intelligent flown graphs with turns, twists, and flight patterns. These mysterious objects, however, would occasionally follow the paths of intercontinental ballistic missiles with multiple cases almost leading to the total destruction of the Earth as paranoid countries almost began nuclear missile retaliation. One such well-known event is that of the 1983 Soviet nuclear false alarm incident that claimed to have detected the reported launch of multiple ICBMs from the United States at speeds impossible to match with any known aircraft at the time. The event would have escalated to an irrevocable full-scale nuclear war had the Soviet Air Defense Forces officer Stanislav Petrov not refused to retaliate. Even when all the signs pointed to potential nuclear destruction, the Soviet general was selfless enough not to press the big red button that would lead to the destruction of the planet. Several hours later, it was confirmed with the U.S. government that the reported detection of the ICBMs were false, with the official reports claiming that the sensory equipment had been giving false signals. Could the true explanation be that of extraterrestrial intervention? Making the attempt to trick human beings into destroying each other in a heightened state of paranoia. It becomes apparent that the Disney documentary sees alien life as a planetary threat to all human life and not that of the friendly, enlightened creatures ready to bring us gifts that the UFO community so adamantly believes. Recovered training documents from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA for short, also holds this sentiment as the documentary clearly shows. In 1995, members of the FEMA were provided the training manual titled the following. 
and other sections of the documents that teach team members how to handle UFO hazards such as power electromagnetic fields, force fields, psychological effects, and alien contact. The host of the documentary then continues with the government disclosure theory by following the strange documents with the quoted statement. Indications that the government's military and scientific leaders will soon release nearly half a century of official documentation of ongoing alien encounters on Earth. Was Disney aware of information of a possible disclosure way ahead of time as part of the marketing campaign to slowly acclimate human beings to the possibility of alien life? A campaign that would later be canceled and lead to this documentary being banned to prevent mass panic? Or has the disclosure slowly been developing into another plan over the years? That is seen as viability grow with modern-day shows such as ancient aliens and popular cinematic science fiction blockbusters. The next 10 minutes of the Alien Encounters documentary begins to go into an in-depth study of astromicrobiology and the peculiar organisms that seem to arrive on our planet via asteroids. Although next to no evidence for the study can be found today. The documentary goes into detail about a hidden study made by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration that used research bases constructed in Antarctica as the center for the study of bacterial life from off our planet. The study involved finding recently crashed asteroids on the icy continent, hoping that the sub-zero temperatures would help to preserve any alien bacteria and viruses for study in a secret base unable to be reached by private or competing government organizations. According to the documentary, the study found that bacteria and viruses discovered did in fact travel across interstellar space, and that they may very well be the advanced invasion force leading the way to test Earth's environment for more complex and determined regions. The last part of the documentary immediately shifts in tone to discuss personal alien abduction events with traumatized abductees that experience violence and privacy invading experimentation from extraterrestrial life. Featuring an interview with Bud Hopkins, the founder of the Alien Reduction Theory, the host ends the documentary with this chilling statement. Most Americans will likely explore outer space aboard craft of alien origin. Statistics indicate a greater probability that you will experience extraterrestrial contact within the next five years and that within the next five years you have more of a chance to see extraterrestrials than win the state lottery. But how do you prepare for such an extraordinary event? Here is the new Tomorrowland at Disney World. Scientists and Disney engineers have brought to life a possible scenario that helps to climate the public to their inevitable alien encounter. Although this three-part televised documentary was never broadcast to the American public shortly following the creation of the documentary, the Tomorrowland section of the Magic Kingdom theme park at Walt Disney World opened the extraterrestrial alien encounter attraction that subjected children to strange binaural audio, video recordings, and images of terrifying alien abduction all of which points to evidence of the claim that Disney had been commissioned by the United States government. Begin the slow acclimatization of extraterrestrial visitations to the general public in the hopes that when the eventual and unavoidable planetary contact would be made, society would not buckle underneath the mass panic of the terrifying encounter. Back in 2012, Disney purchased the studio known as Lucasfilm and acquired the rights to the Star Wars universe for an incredible $4 billion. Despite analysis believing that the purchase would never see a return equivalent to its cost, Disney continued with the transaction and has gone on to make record-breaking movies featuring the Star Wars universe for children of all ages. Could the projected loss have been an acceptable cost for the purpose of space-age propaganda? Is the government disclosure project still well underway with Disney at the head of its advertising and manipulation of the public image? With the discovery of this banned documentary, anything could very well be possible. Going back in September, researchers at the Large Hadron Collider made a big announcement. They said that the Large Hadron Collider had found proof of high-energy particles and that matter had been produced from light. Simone pagan Grizzo, a researcher at the U.S. Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, said the following, If you go back and look at Maxwell's equations for classical electromagneticism, you'll see the two cladding waves sum up to a bigger wave. We only see these two phenomena recently observed by Atlas when we put together Maxwell's equations with special relativity and quantum mechanics and the so-called theory of quantum electrodynamics. Alessandro Tricoli, a researcher at Brooklyn Haven National Laboratory, had this to say. If you read the equation of E equals mc squared from right to left, you'll see that a small amount of mass produces a huge amount of energy because of the c squared constant, which is the speed of light squared. 
but if you look at the formula the other way around, you'll see that you need to start with a huge amount of energy to produce even a tiny amount of mass. One of the issues when these types of discoveries are made is that many of us don't understand it. These scientists and researchers are experimenting with things that the majority of us don't understand. And it can be worrying when they're conducting these types of experiments because sometimes they're going into uncharted territory. For those unaware, the Large Hadron Collider was built by the European Organization for Nuclear Research, also known as CERN. It's the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator. It started up on the 10th of September 2008 and remains the latest addition to CERN's accelerator complex. The Large Hadron Collider consists of a 27 kilometers ring of superconducting magnets with a number of accelerating structures to boost the energy of the particles along the way. CERN, the European Physics Research Center, recently upgraded the Large Hadron Collider. The upgrade comes six years after the collider managed to provide scientists with answers to a riddle when it confirmed the Higgs boson exists. Scientists claim the upgrade would help in boosting luminosity of proton smashing experiments at the Large Hadron Collider, which can be found 17 miles underneath the border of Switzerland and France. It should help to boost the amount of particle collision tenfold, which would give them a much clearer picture of the subatomic world. It's just been announced, though, that a new superclider has been approved by CERN, and what's interesting is that it means the current one now looks tiny. The new collider will have a circumference of over 62 miles, meaning it will be four times bigger and much more powerful than the current one. However, this isn't going to be cheap, with researchers estimating it's going to cost around $23 billion. CERN said the following about the news. Such a machine would produce copious amounts of Higgs bosons in a very clean environment. It would make dramatic progress in mapping the diverse interactions of the Higgs boson with other particles and allow measurements of extremely high precision. They continued with the following on their website. The Future Circular Collider Study is developing designs for a high-performance collider to extend the research currently being conducted at the Large Hadron Collider. Once the latter reaches the end of its lifespan, the goal of the FCC is to greatly push the energy and intensity frontiers of particle colliders with the aim of reaching collision energies of 100 Teversus or tera electron volts. This is in the search for new physics. The FCC study hosted by CERN is an international collaboration of more than 150 universities, research institutes and industrial partners from all around the world. The study will elaborate on different possibilities for circular colliders, new detector facilities, the associated infrastructure cost estimates, global implementation scenarios, as well as appropriate international governed structures. The FCC examines scenarios for three different types of particle collisions, hadron, proton-proton, and heavy iron. Collisions like in the Large Hadron Collider, electron resistant collisions as in the former LEP and proton-electron collisions. One question that many people have asked is where is this money coming from? Officials said they will be getting backing from EU members of stains, but if it comes to it, they may have to reach out to countries like China. Years now, there's been worries that this machine might create something devastating. Various media outlets suggested this machine could be capable of creating a black hole, with CERN themselves admitting that although this is unlikely, it could happen. CERN have even said it would be great for science if this happened as it would give them a chance to study possible extra dimensions. This discovery comes not long after researchers said they want to open. Researchers have said they're coming to the end of building a large piece of equipment that will help them test this, saying that they're looking forward to using this piece of equipment. One of the researchers on board have said they hope to discover something they call a hidden shadow world. They have described this as a concealed mirror world. However, it's hard for many to understand this as no hard evidence for this exists. Once again, it's cause worry among some, as they don't think we should be messing around with these sorts of things. Some have suggested that what researchers in Tennessee are talking about is actually dark matter. Scientists are quite open about dark matter and have expressed they don't really know what it is. According to some studies, though, dark matter makes up roughly 85% of the matter in the universe though the strange form of matter or energy can't be observed. By understanding the movements of stars, it was made obvious to researchers that there was a large amount of mass not accounted for within our galactic supercluster. Understanding what it is, why it can't be detected, and all of its strange properties could be the key to understanding big questions about the nature of our universe. Now that scientists have discovered and identified the Higgs boson, they are now trying to unravel another mystery. This comes in the form of particles from the dark world. 
The researchers are now trying to make measurements and simulations of dark matter. Trail cameras aren't just for capturing wildlife, they let us see what animals get up to when we're not around. Every so often though they capture things we don't expect to see, and while in most cases these are easy to explain, sometimes they manage to capture creatures known as cryptids. These are animals that are not recognized by science, with some of the most well-known ones being that of Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, and the Dogman. As of right now though, scientists have said they don't exist, but others say we share this planet with many unknown creatures and every so often they make themselves known. One interesting way that mysterious creatures make the news is by eyewitness reports, but what's more interesting is when these creatures are captured on camera. This is what happened with this creature, whose identity is currently not known. Recently, this photograph has been making the rounds on social media and various theories have been put forward to try and explain it, with some suggesting that it's the famous dogman cryptid. Most suggest that its feet look like that of the mysterious dogman, a dog-like humanoid that's been reported in several parts of the world for the last few decades. Interestingly, many have detailed their reports and when coming through each one, all of them are very similar in nature making some suggest that what people are seeing is the same creature and that it somehow managed to survive in various regions across our planet. The image has been shared on various groups, with some saying that it's some of the best proof we have of the cryptid. However, one issue is that there's not much information known about the photograph, so it's been tough to narrow down what wildlife is in the area. But believers have said it doesn't look like everyday wildlife. With one user saying the following, these photographs have been floating around on the web for a while now and the go-to is that it's either a dogman or a Bigfoot. These two are the most common cryptids captured on trial cameras. In recent times, there's been various photographs taken of Bigfoot, some of which have been snapped by trial cameras, so I think that this is the more likely candidate. End quote. The image of the foot though has confused people, with some saying it's too humanoid for it to be an animal and being one of the main reasons why people suggest it's either a dogman or a Bigfoot. For those unaware, all across North America are reports and tales of a creature that's become known as the dogman. It's been described as looking like a strange werewolf-like creature and seems to possess supernatural strength and abilities. Some eyewitnesses have often compared the creature to a more dog-like Sasquatch, whereas others believe it to be more of a werewolf beast and at the center of Skimwalker legends. Interestingly, for the last 60 years there's been many reports about these creatures and as with most of these tales, the majority of these stories follow a similar theme. Researchers have managed to pinpoint the first dogman sighting to 1887. This was said to have occurred in Wexford County. The story goes that two lumberjacks were having a conversation when one of them spotted something mysterious. He described it as having a man's body and a dog's face. When they noticed it, they quickly left the scene, not wanting to stay and risk getting hurt by the large creature. Fast forward to 1961 and a security guard witnessed something similar in Big Rapids, Michigan. Most of the encounters with these creatures are just stories and there's no way to back up what the individual saw. However, the security guard remembered that he had a camera and was in fact able to snap a picture of the lodge beast. Those who have analyzed it says it matches other Iwini's descriptions of the dogman. Although the majority of document sightings are from Michigan, there's been some outside of this area that have come forward with similar experiences. Cryptid researchers have said that trail cameras are the best way to capture these cryptids and that there's no shortage of photographs. Unfortunately, they say the majority of these are brush asadas fakes, even though there's no evidence to these claims, saying that this label was put on them so people would stop talking about it. One person said the following about the photographs. I think that is the dogman creature. I've seen some say that it's Bigfoot, but for me the overall look of the creature matches that of the dogman. The photo is really human-like and matches many people's eyewitness accounts. My friends seen a dogman and they said it was very human-like except from the fact it was much bigger, standing around 7 feet tall and having the overall build of a wolf while also possessing the ability to walk on two legs. These cryptids fascinate me and I'm sure there will be more photographs that will come to light in the future. End quote. One of the strangest reported encounters of the dogman creature comes from California. According to the reporter, the story circles around that of a woman who claimed to have encountered the dogman creature near the city of Sacramento and this happened back in 1953. The sighting is believed to have taken place roughly 1,000 feet west of the American River, a short 2,000 feet east of the state capital and in a small house owned by a family. According to the woman, she had the sighting when she was around 12 years old. As she was laying there, she claimed to have noticed a large mass moving in the window as if someone or something was trying to stare inside. 
She quickly got up and went to the window to see a large face of a dog that seemed to be staring into the room through a low window. She claimed that the head of the dog looked very strange, much larger than that of a Cody or a normal dog, and it had a long straight snout. Too dark to see what color it could have been, but was believed to be a dark gray with glowing red eyes. She ran from the window and then noticed the creature began to stand up on its hind legs and that it measured around five feet off the ground. She screamed for her parents to come, which scared the dog man away before anything else could occur. They quickly went outside and claimed that nothing was nearby and that the window was far too tall for a dog to be standing up and looking in. Unfortunately, nothing more can be gathered from the report as the woman was unsure of the exact time of day the event had occurred. Trail cameras aren't just for capturing wildlife, they let us see what animals get up to when we're not around. Every so often though, they capture things we don't expect to see, and while in most cases these are easy to explain, sometimes they manage to capture creatures known as cryptids. These are animals that are not recognized by science, with some of the most well-known ones being that of Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, and the Dogman. As of right now, those scientists have said they don't exist, but others say we share this planet with many unknown creatures and every so often they make themselves known. One interesting way that mysterious creatures make the news is by eyewitness reports, but what's more interesting is when these creatures are captured on camera. This is what happened with this creature, whose identity is currently not known. Recently, this photograph has been making the rounds on social media and various theories have been put forward to try and explain it, with some suggesting that it's the famous Dogman cryptid. Most suggest that its feet look like that of the mysterious Dogman, a dog-like humanoid that's been reported in several parts of the world for the last few decades. Interestingly, many have detailed their reports and when coming through each one, all of them are very similar in nature. Making some suggest that what people are seeing is the same creature and that it somehow managed to survive in various regions across our planet. The image has been shared on various groups, with some saying that it's some of the best proof we have of the cryptid. However, one issue is that there's not much information known about the photograph, so it's been tough to narrow down what wildlife is in the area. But believers have said it doesn't look like everyday wildlife. With one user saying the following, these photographs have been floating around on the web for a while now and the go-to is that it's either a dogman or a Bigfoot. These two are the most common cryptids captured on trial cameras. In recent times, there's been various photographs taken of Bigfoot, some of which have been snapped by trial cameras, so I think that this is the more likely candidate. End quote. The image of the foot though has confused people, with some saying it's too humanoid for it to be an animal and being one of the main reasons why people suggest it's either a dogman or a Bigfoot. For those unaware, all across North America are reports and tales of a creature that's become known as the dogman. It's been described as looking like a strange werewolf-like creature and seems to possess supernatural strength and abilities. Some eyewitnesses have often compared the creature to a more dog-like Sasquatch, whereas others believe it to be more of a werewolf beast and at the center of Skywalker legends. Interestingly, for the last 60 years, there's been many reports about these creatures, and as with most of these tales, the majority of these stories follow a similar theme. Researchers have managed to pinpoint the first dogman sighting to 1887. This was said to have occurred in Wexford County. The story goes that two lumberjacks were having a conversation when one of them spotted something mysterious. He described it as having a man's body and a dog's face. When they noticed it, they quickly left the scene, not wanting to stay and risk getting hurt by the large creature. Fast forward to 1961 and a security guard witnessed something similar in Big Rapids, Michigan. Most of the encounters with these creatures are just stories. There's no way to back up what the individual saw. However, the security guard remembered that he had a camera and was in fact able to snap a picture of the lodge beast. Those who have analyzed it says it matches other Iwin's descriptions of the dogman. Although the majority of document sightings are from Michigan, there's been some outside of this area that have come forward with similar experiences. Cryptid researchers have said that trail cameras are the best way to capture these cryptids and that there's no shortage of photographs. Unfortunately, they say the majority of these are brush of Sardis fakes, even though there's no evidence to these claims, saying that this label was put on them so people stop talking about it. One person said the following about the photographs. I think that is the dogman creature. I've seen some say that it's Bigfoot, but for me the overall look of the creature matches that of the dogman. The photo is really human-like and matches many people's eyewitness accounts. 
My friends seen a dogman and they said it was very human-like except from the fact it was much bigger, standing around 7 feet tall and having the overall build of a wolf while also possessing the ability to walk on two legs. These cryptids fascinate me and I'm sure there will be more photographs that will come to light in the future. End quote. One of the strangest reported encounters of the dogman creature comes from California. According to the reporter, the story circles around that of a woman who claimed to have encountered the dogman creature near the city of Sacramento and this happened back in 1953. The sighting is believed to have taken place roughly 1,000 feet west of the American River, a short 2,000 feet east of the state capital and in a small house owned by a family. According to the woman, she had the sighting when she was around 12 years old. As she was laying there, she claimed to have noticed a large mass moving in the window as if someone or something was trying to stare inside. She quickly got up and went to the window to see a large face of a dog that seemed to be staring into the room through a low window. She claimed that the head of the dog looked very strange, much larger than that of a Cody or a normal dog, and it had a long straight snout, too dark to see what color it could have been, but was believed to be a dark gray with glowing red eyes. She ran from the window and then noticed the creature began to stand up on its hind legs and that it measured around five feet off the ground. She screamed for her parents to come, which scared the dog man away before anything else could occur. They quickly went outside and claimed that nothing was nearby and that the window was far too tall for a dog to be standing up and looking in. Unfortunately, nothing more can be gathered from the report. As the woman was unsure of the exact time of day, the event had occurred. Space has truly earned its moniker as the final frontier. Stretching in all directions with rules of gravity and physics that do not apply on Earth, the possibilities for what might lie beyond our comprehension are endless. Some things that occur are so strange that it seems that the only explanation is one that involves aliens and other life forms. But most are none other than marvels of science that have never been seen on our small planet. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at instances of space marvels so unexpected that they even surprised scientists. Scientists find the source of mysterious pulses being blasted towards Earth. Since 2014, scientists have pondered the odd and unexplained gamma rays that we have been receiving here on Earth, with them being repeatedly blasted in our direction. However, scientists have found the spot these gamma rays have been coming from. These gamma ray pulses that we have been receiving here on Earth have been for years a topic of great scientific research. With astronomers finally tracking this previously unexplained occurrence down to a celestial body referred to as PSR J20395617. To those of us who are not quite up to date with celestial objects, PSR J20395617 is a neutron star spinning rapidly on its axis. A neutron star is typically very small, with a radius nearing though usually not exceeding 30 kilometers. These neutron stars also hold an incredibly high density made of neutrons in close proximity to one another. Our current scientific understanding of neutron stars is that they are formed after the gravitational collapse of a supernova when a black hole is not made due to the smaller size of the object. Whilst some of the initial hypotheses as to what this object firing gamma rays is did include a neutron star orbiting quickly found another star. Other possibilities have also been in discussion. Furthermore, until now there was no proof, never mind substantial concrete evidence, that this was indeed the case. Scientists have now definitively concluded that the neutron star that has been firing gamma pulses is part of a binary system, meaning that this neutron star is gravitationally bound to one other star. In this instance, PSAR J20395617 orbits a star that is an estimated one-sixth the size of the Sun within our own solar system. This orbital pattern, combined with the 377 rotations per second, has been concluded to force a gradual, steady evaporation of the neutron star. This evaporation seems to have released gamma rays that have been detected through the space telescopes we have put into space from Earth. Whilst this phenomenon had sparked interest worldwide, the research team was led by a group of scientists working at the University of Manchester. One of the largest aids in this research, however, was the crucial involvement of the Einstein at Home program. This was a volunteered study where researchers were given access to the computer power of PCs that had been volunteered for usage. In its essence, this means that researchers, if the computer were not in use, could gain extra power. This project was aided by thousands of civilians who may not have possibly comprehended what they were helping to complete. 
With one computer, this data analysis would have taken over 500 years. The aid from people's homes allowed the same results to be conducted in only two months. The community spirit truly is tangible. As we close the book on a scientific mystery that has been puzzling astronomers since 2014, NASA's $1 billion Jupiter probe sent back stunning new photos of Jupiter. When you think of the fact that we're investigating and exploring far-off places in space, how far away do you think it is? 10 million miles? 20? Try 563 million miles. This gaseous giant hasn't been won for close-up photos until pretty recently, and it will continue to orbit until at least July of 2021. Its main goal is to map the planet's magnetic and gravitational fields, but there are some pretty incredible bonuses to this. We get to see stunning photos as a result. Juno, the aircraft, flies over Jupiter's cloud tops at speeds 75 times as fast as a bullet. Flyovers, called parahovies, happen once every 54 days. Each time this is repeated, the Juno cam captures incredible photos of the planet and this information is bounced back to Earth where people around the world can download the stunning full-color photos. Its gas world clouds are vivid and forever changing, making no two photos alike. This is all a new process, Juno being only the second long-term exploration probe after the Galileo spacecraft which orbited the planet from 1995 to 2003. Space.com states that Juno is one of NASA's three new frontiers probes. The others are New Horizons, which flew by Pluto in 2015, and OSIRIS-REx, which is expected to fly to asteroid 101955 Bennu in 2020 to collect a sample and return it to Earth. New Frontiers was a program NASA created in 2003 for medium-sized missions that are capped at $1 billion in development and launch costs each. The Curiosity rover, by contrast, costs about $2.5 billion. It also should be noted that Juno is different because it runs on solar power. The same publication writes that Juno launched from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station on August 5, 2011, while eight other spacecraft have flown in Jupiter's neighborhood in decades past. Part of what makes Juno stand apart is its ability to generate solar power from Jupiter's neighborhood. The other spacecraft relied on nuclear power. This aircraft is accomplishing incredible discoveries and sending us back some beautiful photos while we wait. Mars is humming. The InSight rover landed on Mars in November 2018, landing near the equator of the Red Planet. NASA's robot has been measuring the planet's seismic activity and conducting tests on its geographic qualities. Its mission is to understand and learn about the geology of rocky planets to observe their evolution and gain some more understanding about Earth's history and potential future. Scientists cannot get enough data on rocky planets just from Earth. They need to gather information from others. InSight landed in the Elysium Planitia, a small crater located on a volcanic plain. This location is often caught in wind and dust storms. The data it has gathered so far suggests that the seismic activity and magnetic field on Mars are much stronger than the research is estimated, about 10 times more. While collecting data, the rover recorded a strange humming sound that researchers and experts have not been able to concretely identify the cause of. They have their speculations, though, and suggest it is caused by both seismic movement below the surface as well as the wind above it. When combined together, these two forces create a strange sound. The hum actually cannot be heard by humans. It falls outside our frequency range but gets picked up on readings by the robot and its machines. So any future human visitors will not be able to hear Mars humming. The researchers are excited at finding so many similarities between Mars and Earth. The infrasound, sound we can't hear, and the atmospheric turbulence are encouraging to their studies on finding out Mars' history and seeing what its timeline looks like compared to ours. Interestingly enough, Earth also has a faint infrasound humming to it. There have been reports of a hum that have been a hot debate for many years, even outside the astronomy community. Scientists can't really explain it, but many people try to blame it for certain diseases and health issues. There have been many locations across Earth that have complained of some sort of noise pollution and mysterious humming sounds. Now, InSight has identified a similar one on Mars. The robot was using a seismometer to measure the quakes underneath the planet. Since its first reading, it has measured over 400 quakes. It even managed to find fault lines on Mars, which confirms the constant seismic activity found. A few of the quakes have registered at 3 to 4 magnitudes, but most of them were so small that the machines and scientists were unable to detect their origin. 
Researchers also found that there are more quakes on Mars when the planet gets cold. When it cools down, it contracts, which forces the brittle layers near the surface to break in a way to accommodate their positioning. This breaking is causing stress on the surface that results in quakes. There are still many mysteries that the InSight researchers are excited about delving into, like how they recorded some type of activity at Mars depth. They believe there might even be hot magma still at its core. They will continue to measure the activity and gather as much knowledge about Mars history as possible. Moon rock given to Holland by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin turns out to be fake. In 2009, the Dutch National Museum, Rick's Museum, had a rather bashful announcement to make with the disappointing revelation that the beloved moon rock is not authentic. While the museum is most well known for fine art exhibitions, one particularly exciting exhibition is Fly Me to the Moon. Front and center in the space-themed piece was what we all thought to be a rock from the moon. This exhibit was first revealed to the public in 2006. The moon rock was intended to symbolize the exploration of faraway distant places, possible colonization, and bringing home treasures. The thought, love, and excitement represented with this exhibit made the unfortunate reveal of the truth that much more devastating. The rock was gifted to Willem Dries Jr. in 1969 from the U.S. Ambassador to the Netherlands. This gift shortly follows the moon landing. The supposed moon rock was presented from J. William Middendorf II in the midst of a meeting with the famous trio from aboard Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins. When Dries unfortunately passed away in 1998, the rock was donated to the home. A museum spokeswoman explained that, since the rock had come from the personal possession of the Prime Minister, no one had thought to consider checking the authenticity and simply approved the ownership via a phone call with NASA. Apparently, according to the Reeks Museum, the once-believed moon rock had been insured at an estimated half a million dollars when in reality the value is, at a maximum, worth $70. Former U.S. ambassador attempted to recount the tale but could not specifically remember how the U.S. State Department acquired the rock at all. It is established and well-known that in the 1970s NASA shared lunar rocks with 100 countries. A space expert, however, expressed his shock that the material was already part of an exhibition in just 2006 and so further research began to take place. Free University of Amsterdam's researchers jumped on the case, extensively testing and investigating the genuine history of this rock. Ultimately, the tests proved the rock was not authentic and this lunar adventure keepsake was instead some petrified wood. So far, no one has been able to offer an explanation as to how this scenario could occur. Despite tests proving it's not a moon rock, the curators at Rick's Museum intend to keep it anyway as a curiosity item, a souvenir to remember this unusual tale and to keep it home where it belongs. Phobos Monolith You may remember news of a mysterious monolith that had been sitting in the Utah desert back for four years in 2020. But did you know that there are dozens, if not hundreds, of monoliths scattered across the solar system and one particular monolith, the Phobos monolith, is 300 feet in height. The Phobos monolith sits on the moon Phobos, which belongs to the rocky desert planet of Mars. But Phobos is not alone, as Mars also has a monolith to its name, appropriately titled the Mars monolith. The Mars monolith is a rectangular object that was identified on Mars' surface. Orbit imagery taken from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter at around 180 miles away shows that the Mars monolith sits at the bottom of a cliff which scientists believe it likely fell from. While Mars might have its own monolith, the monolith that belongs to the moon Phobos is significant due to its sheer size. According to scientists, the Phobos monolith is much larger than the monolith in Utah that sent the media in a spin. In fact, data suggests that the Phobos monolith is 279 feet in width and 300 feet in height. The Phobos monolith mystery is amplified by the fact that Phobos is completely barren. Whilst Mars has an atmosphere and a weather system, Phobos sits silently in space, with its solitary monolith pointing up towards the heavens. What's more is that Phobos is tiny compared to the grand scale of the universe, making the sight of something so massive atop of a small celestial body even more creepy. The effects of erosion are common for strange discoveries on other planets. Mars itself has been the subject of many strange discoveries, such as the Mars face, the Mars pyramid, and even the levitating spoon. These rock formations are usually a result of our perspective from Earth, as well as millions of years of rock degradation. While interesting to many, Phobos has yet to receive any significant research or space exploration.
Optech and the Mars Institute have proposed that the site of the monolith be investigated. This mission is referred to as PRIME, fully known as Phobos Reconnaissance and International Mars Exploration. The proposed mission would see a lander touchdown on the of the moon's geology. Currently, the PRIME mission is not set to go ahead and talks of funding are next to non-existent. However, famed second man on the moon Buzz Aldrin has previously supported the idea of a mission to Phobos, so there might be a chance in the future. In fact, when Aldrin discussed the idea of sending a mission to Phobos, he said, Mars monolith while we touched on the Mars monolith in the previous entry, it's also deserving of its own. The discovery of the Mars monolith came from the same stream of images taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter over a decade ago. The image of the monolith depicts a seemingly massive rectangular structure jutting out from the planet's surface. The monolith has had waves of attention since its discovery by the high-rise camera on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Scientists regularly speak on the matter of the Mars monolith as well as other similar structures found on Mars and elsewhere in the solar system. Jonathan Hill, a researcher and mission planner at the Mars Space Flight Facility at Arizona State University, is tasked with processing a large chunk of NASA Mars mission imagery. Hill states that in his opinion, the object is most likely a peculiar shaped rock. Speaking on the matter, Hill said, when your resolution is too low to fully resolve and it tends to look rectangular because the pixels in the image are squares. Any curve will look like a series of straight lines if you reduce your resolution enough. This would explain the seemingly large number of monoliths found in the solar system. This visual illusion is a side effect of our distance from things in outer space. The high-rise camera is able to take photographs at a resolution of one foot per pixel. While that might be useful for a large number of research purposes, it does mean that smaller objects can lose focus and detail. This also explains why the height of the monolith appears to be so large in the photos taken by NASA. The photo is taken during a time where the sun is at a low angle which effectively stretches the rock's shadow much further than other times of the day. This results in the monolith's height appearing much larger than it actually might be. To Hill, the location of the Mars monolith also suggests that it is nothing more than a boulder. He argues that it makes little sense for a being or beings to create such an object just to leave it in a location it would eventually fall. Speaking on the intentions of aliens, Hill says, if I was going to build a monolith somewhere, that's the last place I would put it. The debris falling from the cliff would cover it up pretty quickly on geologic timescales. Cryovolcanoes on Ceres in the main asteroid belt that sits between Mars and Jupiter lies Ceres, the largest of the asteroids. Ceres, first discovered in 1801 by Giuseppe Piazzi, was originally classified as a planet. This was until other large objects were discovered in the same neighborhood as Ceres. Astrologists at the time realized they were looking at a new type of object in space, so the term asteroid, meaning star-like, was described these new objects. In the 1860s, it was widely accepted that these large asteroids had major differences to the planets we know, but a specific definition of planet was never formulated. At the 2006 Pluto debate, it was discussed the specific criteria that had to be met in order for an object to be considered a planet. Had it not been for a modification to this criteria stating the planet must have cleared the neighborhood around its orbit, Ceres would be the fifth planet from the Sun. Obviously, due to the asteroid belt it lies within, Ceres is not classified as a planet but a dwarf planet and an asteroid simultaneously. Now, whilst the controversy surrounding Ceres classification is certainly interesting, that's not what we're going to discuss today. Ceres itself is home to something much more fascinating. Since early 2015, NASA's Dawn spacecraft has orbited the icy world of Ceres, examining its surface closely. It wasn't until quite a few months had passed that the dawn would observe something so fascinating but so bizarre at the same time. It was a 13,000-foot-tall mound closely resembling what we know as a volcano. Scientists named it Ahanamans. In 2016, it was confirmed that Ahanamans was indeed a volcano but not your average volcano, a cryovolcano. A cryovolcano is, as you can imagine, a volcano but with a twist. Instead of releasing molten rock or lava like the volcanoes we have on Earth, a cryovolcano erupts water, methane, or ammonia. The water and other gases released often turn into a solid form once exposed to the low temperature surrounding the volcano, hence the more colloquial name ice volcanoes. These eruptions are referred to as cryomagma or cryolava. During eruption, they are liquid but are also released as a vapor. 
Cryovolcanoes are thought to be able to form on moons and asteroids that used to have an abundance of water. The reason Ahanamans erupts water and other substances rather than magma is simple. The temperatures on Ceres are simply too cold to melt rock, but warm enough that ice can melt. Ahanamans was only able to be understood more when scientists examined mineral salt. Likely the product of a cryovolcanic eruption inside the Octor crater found it had origins in a Hunamans, which in turn relates both fascinating natural structures. The Octor crater is 57 miles across and as deep as a Hunamans is high. The large impact that tore the giant Octor crater into the surface of the dwarf planet must have originally started everything and triggered the later cryovolcanic activity, says Andreas Nathus, framing camera lead investigator for Max Planck. After this event, rock around the planet reshuffled and moved up towards the surface. The change in pressure allowed water and dissolved gases to escape that would eventually form a volcano. It's also suggested that many smaller explosions around the dwarf planet caused the cryovolcanism rather than one major event. Cryovolcanism isn't exclusive to Ceres though as it has been spotted on Enceladus. One of Saturn's moons, Europa, a moon of Jupiter and Triton, Neptune's largest moon. Cryovolcanoes are a fascinating insight into the wonders of the universe and things we couldn't even imagine being possible. Scientists think they have detected a collision between a black hole and a neutron star. In the US and Italy, gravitational wave detectors picked up on space-time ripples passing through Earth courtesy of a collision between a black hole and a neutron star. To put things into perspective, the mass of an entire sun is squeezed by gravity into a ball the size of a city. It may take you by surprise that the collision didn't produce any detectable light considering the severity of the situation. To grasp a greater understanding of the situation, we will have to delve into what black holes and neutron stars are. They are corpses of stars that are the result of calamitous explosions. These explosions are known as supernovas, which occur when a white dwarf is provoked into a runaway nuclear fusion or when a massive star is in its last evolutionary stages. Supernovas are actually fascinating, as these eruptions can make a star briefly outshine all of the other stars in its galaxy. After a star has undergone supernova, the core of its remains collapses under the strength of its own gravitational pull. What happens next is what decides what the remnant will become. A smaller core forms a neutron star. A larger core forms a black hole. Gravitational waves are disturbances in the curvature of space-time that create a ripple effect propelled from accelerated masses. This causes waves to emit outwards at speeds of light from whatever the source may be. The theory of gravitational waves was first introduced to us in 1915 by a theoretical physicist Albert Einstein with the prediction that waves would be conceived from massive accelerating objects. These waves would ripple through the fabric of space and time. In 2015, 100 years later, Einstein's prediction was brought into fruition as a result of a collision of two black holes. This so-called happenstance occurred again in 2017 in the event where two neutron stars collided. The gravitational waves that were endured in August are being theorized by scientists as the aftermath caused by a collision that actually took place one billion years ago. In the circumstance that this event is confirmed, it will mark the beginning of a new era of astrophysical studies. With implications for how researchers understand Einstein's general theory of relativity, the deaths of stars, and the behavior of extreme matter, Researchers have a sense of cultivated confidence that this collision between a black hole and a neutron star is not an anomaly. Although there is still so much more to outer space than what we have covered today, it gives us a greater appreciation and a year to learn more about our infinite universe. TUN-618 Black Hole Located around 10 billion light-years away from us here on Earth lies TUN-618 Quasar, and at the center of that is possibly one of the most massive supermassive black holes in existence. First noted during a survey of stars that ended up being mainly white dwarfs in 1957, the TUN-618 Quasar wasn't officially recognized until 1963 when quasars themselves were first recognized as an occurrence of the universe. It was then in 1970 during a radio survey in Italy that there was in fact a radio emission detected from the TUN-618 quasar. Known as very luminous, TUN-618 quasar was identified as very distant because of its redshift but still visible, therefore being known as very luminous because this could still be observed from Earth despite it being 10 billion light-years away. 
The Tiyun 618 quasar is very luminous and the black hole swirling at its center is estimated to be an astronomical 66 billion times more massive than that of our own sun. It's no surprise that because of this, the Tiyun 618 supermassive black hole is one of, if not the most massive black hole that we currently know of. What's mostly impressive about the Tiyun 618 supermassive black hole is its mass. It's truly incomprehensible by us here on Earth because of how we would be comparing it to our own sun. To us, our sun is gigantic and massive, its true size completely dwarfing Earth. So to then try and picture something 66 billion times the sun's mass is borderline impossible. Blueberries on Mars in 2004 NASA sent its Opportunity rover to Mars in order to explore more of its surface hoping to learn about its composition and more information regarding the history of Mars. After landing on Mars, the rover made an interesting discovery, tiny dark blue spheres that appeared to resemble blueberries. The land covered in these spherical small pebbles were termed as blueberries by scientists because they appeared to look incredibly similar to the fruit. There were several of these blueberries all located into one general area, which scientists found to be very curious. The blueberries were measured to be very small, only being up to 6.2 millimeters in diameter. The scientists on the Mars team were baffled because nothing like the blueberries had ever been discovered before and it was bizarre that only this specific area contained them. Scientists were aware that the region of Mars where the blueberries were found contained a lot of hematite or iron oxide. Scientists believed that the blueberries were formed by liquid water moving through rocks over time, water heavily infused with iron oxide. This insight is extremely foundational. First of all, it suggests that flowing water was once present on Mars. For spheres of this kind, flowing water had to be involved, specifically over a long period of time. This hints to the suggestion that Mars is a highly complex terrain and that ancient Mars may have appeared much differently than the Mars we currently know. It remains a mystery how these blueberries fully formed and what was involved in their creation. While scientists are sure that iron oxide and mineral-infused water was involved, they remain unsure of just what it took for these little blueberries to form. Some theories suggest perhaps they are pieces of meteorite that have been shaped over time. Unfortunately, more sophisticated technology is required in order to fully understand what is going on behind the chemistry of the blueberries. Nothing like this exists on Earth, so scientists are extremely limited in their access to learning more about the blueberries. It is difficult to fully know what they are made of and how exactly so many of them came into being in the same area at once. The technology required to learn more about these blueberries is currently being designated to learning more big picture information about Mars. However, it is possible that more may be discovered about the blueberries in the future. One thing is for sure, the discovery of the blueberries tells us that we have much more to learn about Mars. China spacecraft sends Mars footage for the first time. Breaking news within the early days of 2020 comes from the latest space exploration mission conducted by the China National Space Administration. The 5th of February 2021 saw the release of images and video footage of the surface of Mars captured by China's Mars probe named Tianwen-1. This video footage gives us a closer insight than has ever been possible before, providing a view of Mars's surface. Tianwen. One entered the red planet's orbit on the 10th of February 2021 and captured a clip of the surface of Mars moving in and out of view against the dark sky. The remarkable video footage provided by this aspirational and resoundingly successful mission shows as white craters, according to news reports. The equipment used for this fantastic space exploration quest, Tianwen, one features a Mars orbiter, lander, and solar-powered rover and weighs a staggering five tons. This impressive technology set out from China in July 2020, having only recently completed its journey to the Red Planet, making it to its intended destination in February this year. This progress in space exploration presents a momentous step forwards in the Beijing space program, aiming to compete with the U.S. advancements of NASA, whose name translates to questions to heaven, present a turning point for exponential growth in the China National Space Administration. Current predictions and growth markets suggest that by 2022 there could be a space station fully equipped with a crew established by the China National Space Administration. Adding further heat to the U.S.-China space competition is the estimated landing of the U.S. opposing mission in May later this year. 
Increasing the close quarters in the space discovery again is that the first ever United Arab Emirates interplanetary mission accomplished the same feat later. Within the same week, the United Arab Emirate Hope probe entered Mars orbit too. Such close competition certainly introduces new perspectives and even more levels of success to the Beijing space mission. The next steps from Chinese astrophysicists in exploring Mars is the implementation of the rover Utopia due to land on Mars in May later this year. This is due to orbit for one year on Mars, equivalent to 687 days on Earth. Whilst Mars has long proved to be a problem and a point of mystery in discovery and space research, we have already gained a wealth of new knowledge from this new video footage, including geological observations from the Sheer Pirelli Crater and the Valles Maniaries Canyons. Earth Mini Moon 2020 so is actually a rocket booster. Leading up to September 2020, there was news that Earth could get a new mini-moon. A mini-moon is a space rock that briefly gets pulled into Earth's orbit by gravity but exits after a certain amount of time. Around this time, NASA's Center for Near-Earth Object Studies was noticing that the orbit of the unidentified object was extremely similar to Earth's. Namely, that it was practically circular and on the same plane. Not only that, it was moving significantly more slowly than a space rock usually does. This, along with some of its other features, made it incredibly unique and caused some researchers to speculate that it might not be an asteroid at all, but a rocket booster instead. Specifically, one that we ourselves launched in the earliest days of space exploration. At the time, the object was referred to as 2020 so. It was launched in late 1966. This would mean it was likely a product of NASA or the Soviet Union who were in the space race at the time. Around early December, it was finally confirmed that the object was a rocket booster that belonged to NASA's Surveyor 2. While this technically disqualifies it from being a mini-moon, it is interesting to note that this hunk of space junk survived when the lander itself didn't, crashing on the surface of the moon in 1966. On December 1, 2020, it passed very closely to our planet at just 0.13 lunar distances and then again on February 2, 2021 at just 0.58 lunar distances. As of March 2021, the object will break free of Earth's gravitational pull and orbit the Sun instead. These days we build rockets to be reusable and land back on Earth on ships at sea. But believe it or not, there are quite a few rockets from that time period that were lost. Because of its hollowness, pressure created by the solar radiation pushed it off course and changed its trajectory. It turns out that it has actually passed Earth a few times completely unnoticed. But for now, it's time to wave goodbye to the rocket booster until next time. There may be 300 million habitable planets in our galaxy. Late in 2020, NASA claimed that recent evidence and calculations suggest that our galaxy holds at least 300 million planets that could potentially harbor life, with the closest being 20 light years away from Earth. A team of researchers used old observational data from the Kepler telescope, which scanned the Milky Way to find habitable worlds. From that data, the scientists found that about 50% of the sun-like stars throughout our galaxy system have planets with environments and sizes that might be capable of holding liquid water. Four of these planets are within 30 light years from Earth. They calculate that as low as 7% of these stars would have habitable planets, which leads to their 300 million figure estimates. The experts say that it could even be as high as a 75% chance of a planet's existence, which would then reach up to 3 billion planets. NASA's Kepler Space Telescope operated for nine years as it searched space for planets that orbit other stars. Its mission was only supposed to last three years, but it managed to conserve fuel so well that it stretched three gallons into nine years of orbit. It confirmed about 2,662 planets in our galaxy and proved there were more planets than stars in it. It gathered so much data that researchers had to use a computer algorithm to try and sort through it all. The algorithm still made mistakes and identified many false positives, so teams are currently going through the observations by hand to check whether any planet was missed or incorrectly identified. The scientists narrowed their search to planets that were of similar size or at least half that of Earth. There are many factors that result in a planet being habitable. But overall it needs to be rocky. Any planets larger than Earth are usually gaseous. They also looked for stars that resembled our sun in age and temperature and data from ESA's Gaia telescope to review the energy output of these individual stars. This data can inform them whether the star emits too much radiation or not enough energy to sustain life. 
they can then observe whether water is able to survive in liquid form on these planets. With Gaia's details on the stars within the galaxy cross-referencing Kepler's data, researchers plan to determine which stars and planets have an atmosphere that supports habitability. The Skull Asteroid TB-145 in 2015 on Halloween no less an ominous space rock flew past our planet. The hunk of mass was thought to be a lifeless comet which had lost all of its vaporous properties. Such as water due to countless orbits around the sun astronomers were taken aback by the appearance of the asteroid as it looked hauntingly similar to a cosmically sized human skull. The 2015 flyby cut it pretty close by space standards. It passed with only 1.27 lunar distances between the comet passed again in 2018, but kept more of a distance. Because the comet is extinct, it has no tail. It is relatively small, all things considered, clocking in at approximately 2,047 feet or 625 meters. Vishnu Reddy, a scientist at the planetary, and this to say about it according to NASA's JPL site. We found that the object reflects about 6% of the light it receives from the sun. That is similar to fresh asphalt, and while here on Earth we think that is pretty dark, it is brighter than a typical comet, which reflects only 3-5% to of the light. That suggests it could be cometary in origin, but as there is no comet evident, the conclusion is it is a lifeless comet. It is indeed Mr. Eddy. While it is projected to pass Venus and Mercury several times in the next few years, it is not scheduled to pass by Earth again until 2082. It should be noted that the eerie appearance of the beaming skull is only visible from certain angles, so for anyone thinking that this could be a threat or perhaps a greeting from intelligent life, it's more likely that it is our own narcissistic biases getting the better of us. The Vela incident The Vela satellite is located near the Prince Edward Islands in the Indian Ocean. It was constructed as a reaction to the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which ensured that nuclear reactors or explosions could not be tested anywhere due to the deadly and detrimental effects of nuclear energy. The Vela satellite is able to detect nuclear explosions and send signals to intelligence agencies to warn them of the presence of dangerous and illegal nuclear energy. The Vela satellite is equipped with technology that can detect X-rays, neutrons, and gamma rays by using bang meter sensors. It is an extremely advanced piece of technology and essential for both human and environmental safety. On September 22, 1979, the Vela satellite detected the infamous double flash indicating that a nuclear explosion had occurred. This detection on the satellite is now commonly known as the South Atlantic flash. The flash lit up the sky not only once but twice and was remarked as an incredible natural event. However, the true cause of the double flash remains a mystery. The United States and other countries alike predicted that the Valor satellite flash might have occurred due to natural phenomenon such as a meteor crash or lightning strike. To investigate this further, meteorological technology was introduced into study but was unable to detect whether nature was responsible for this. This technology was unable to prove the exact cause for the detonation. However, it did show that a wind had occurred over the southern Indian Ocean that might have carried nuclear explosive radiation or chemicals to certain parts of Australia. After an investigation from the United States Department of Defense within the Indian Ocean and surrounding countries, they predicted that it is possible that a nuclear test had occurred within the region of South Africa or Israel. But there was not enough evidence to conclude that a nuclear threat was present. There are several conspiracies as to why the Valor satellite detected a nuclear explosion. Investigators believe that the United States might be covering up the reality that Israel and South Africa might have access to nuclear power and that they might be working together to create nuclear weapons. These same investigators claim to have evidence that the United States Department of Defense came across conclusive evidence. That a nuclear explosion from these regions really did occur but that they chose to ignore it to not draw attention to their international conflicts with the region. Recognizing that Israel and South Africa might share in nuclear power is a dangerous idea for the United States. There are certain ulterior motives for the United States to disguise this information from the general public. However, upon further investigation into South Africa's nuclear power industry, Officials believe that the South African government could not have made such a powerful nuclear explosive within the time frame that it went off because their access to nuclear power at the time was limited. South Africa was also a part of the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Because of this, they allowed foreign parties to view their classified documents revealing the kind of nuclear access they had. 
Because South Africa seems clean on its own, it gives precedent to the possibility that they collaborated with Israel to test this nuclear explosive. The United States has yet to confirm or deny this possibility. Home 15A black hole Whilst it may not be the most massive of black holes, the Home 15A black hole has a very interesting backstory and is by no means a small black hole. It's essentially the second most massive black hole in the entire universe. Whilst observing the Abel 85 cluster, the Max Planck Institute discovered something truly incredible. The Abel 85 cluster is a collection of around 500 galaxies. But what we're interested in is what lies at the very center of this cluster of galaxies, the Home 15A galaxy. Early calculations from scientists indicated that the center of the Home 15A was much more dimmer than it perhaps should have been when taking into account the astronomical mass of the stars that are located within the galaxy. All of this indicated that there was something different about Home 15A's center. Well, it turned out to be a black hole, but not just any black. After attempting to measure the mass of said black hole, the scientists discovered the estimates were much larger than first thought and in fact this black hole now dubbed an ultramassive black hole as a mass of around 40 billion times that of our sun. That is a staggering number and there's no real way to comprehend something of that scale, however it is fascinating nonetheless. You might be wondering how something as massive as this ultramassive black hole could even exist within a galaxy given the size of our own. Well, Home 15A is a giant galaxy known as an elliptical galaxy. An elliptical galaxy is formed when a spiral galaxy such as our own, the Milky Way, merges within another spiral galaxy. It goes further though as this newly formed elliptical galaxy can then merge with another elliptical galaxy, creating an even bigger galaxy. When these galaxies merge together, the black holes in their centers can also merge and exactly like the galaxies themselves, create an even larger black hole. When these black holes collide and get larger, it can push stars away forming the darker center. This is how scientists discovered the Home 15A black hole. Whilst the Home 15A black hole is the most massive in the nearby universe being only 700 million light years away from us, the previous entry on this list actually trumps the Home 15A ultramassive black hole. The TUN 618 Quasar ultramassive black hole is more massive but is located 10 billion light years away so cannot be considered to reside in the nearby universe. High schoolers helped discover four new alien planets. Two Massachusetts high schoolers, 16-year-old Kardik Pingley and 18-year-old Jasmine Wright have helped to discover four brand new alien planets. 2021 is already showing incredible promise for being a great year in space exploration. The two young adults were in a program called the Student Research Mentoring Program at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which links up high school students with scientists for annually-based projects. SRMP Director Clara Sousa Silva, a cosmochemist at MIT, said the following in a statement. By the end of the program, the students can say they've done active, state-of-the-art research in astrophysics. Pinglei and Wright worked with Tanzu Dallin, a researcher at MIT's Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research. He is also the lead author of the paper that the two high schoolers contributed to. They made the discovery by scrutinizing observations of the sun-like star HD 108236 made by TESS. TESS stands for NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. TESS hunts for alien worlds using the transit method, meaning that the satellite watches for tiny dips in a star's brightness when a planet crosses or transits across its face. Alien planets are not meant to mean planets with alien life on them. These planets are also known as exoplanets, and they are a newer development within the scientific sphere. An exoplanet is a planet that orbits a star other than our sun. Astronomers have now confirmed over 4,000 exoplanets, but the first one was acknowledged only in 1992. Previously, the orbit of planets around other stars had only been presumed. Space.com reports the statement that, I was very excited and very shocked, Wright said in the same statement. We knew this was the goal of Dylon's research, but to actually find a multi-planetary system and be part of the discovering team was really cool. They also share that three of the four new found worlds are gaseous planets slightly smaller than Neptune. The fourth is a super-Earth, a rocky planet a bit larger than our own, the researchers said. All four exoplanets lie very close to HD 108236. Their orbital periods range from just under four Earth days to 19.5 Earth days. 
In an interview, Dallin said that our species has long been contemplating planets beyond our solar system and with multiplanetary systems, you're kind of hitting the jackpot. He said in the same statement, the planets originated from the same disk of matter around the same star, but they ended up being different planets with different atmospheres and different climates due to their different orbits. So we would like to understand the fundamental processes of planet formation and evolution using this planetary system. It is pretty incredible how quickly we have reached these kinds of discoveries. Evidence of water on Mars The idea of water on Mars has been present in science for many years. It is now well known that Mars is considered a mostly dry planet with limited evidence of moisture. However, new information shows that ancient waters once flowed over the surface of the red planet. As we mentioned earlier, the presence of the blue breeze also lends itself to the idea that running water was present on Mars. The first major hint suggesting that Mars was covered in water is through the craters formed on the face of the planet. Scientists from the Netherlands assert that the only thing capable of forming the kind of massive craters discovered would have been large amounts of water, specifically water that was deep and remained in one place for a long time. Alongside these craters are various channels formed in the surface of Mars, which suggests that running water existed and created these pathways. These channels are indented, which tells us that this running water existed for a long period of time. This confirms that once Mars was home to many lakes, rivers, and perhaps also larger bodies of water like oceans. The soil found on Mars has been found to have hydrogen in it. This has been attributed to the presence of water molecules in the soil as well. This could indicate that water may still exist beneath the surface of Mars. NASA has found rocks that look like concrete slabs built from this soil. The rock has eroded on one side, the other is completely smooth. Scientists affirm that water, specifically running water, is responsible. Another important piece of evidence that Mars contained water is the ice now present. Various rovers have discovered ice and glaciers. The temperatures on Mars now are far too low to support liquid water. There are also minerals and rocks that have formed under the ice that imply that liquid water was once part of the red planet. In 2018, a subglacial lake was discovered. It extends about 20 kilometers and it is considered to be the first known stable body of liquid water on Mars. This provides important insight into what Mars once was and it also allows scientists to better assess whether Mars could or ever did support life. Throughout these studies, scientists are very positive that running water once existed on Mars in high volumes. The Curiosity rover was sent to Mars to discover whether flowing water ever existed on the planet, and it seems that this has been confirmed. This shapes everything we know and continue to learn about Mars as we discover what life may have looked like when water was running on this planet. While some scientists believe that the running water only existed for a short amount of time on Mars, it seems that the combination of studies and evidence suggests that it existed much longer than previously believed. This suggests that there may have been enough water present for a long enough period of time that Mars could have been considered habitable. The evidence of running water opens new questions about whether there was plant or animal life once on Mars and how long ago this may have been. Scientists argue that the evidence of water on Mars is the first true evidence of a possible habitable environment. Water is essential to all life as we know it, so the idea that Mars once contained this necessity for life is incredible. Dr. Hawking warned us about alien contact. An age-old question that has played on the minds of scientists for centuries is, are we alone in the universe? Whilst it is true that even the least scientific-minded of us would love to know what other life, if any, there is in the universe, Hawking has given us warnings as to the possible consequences of making ourselves known to other life forms, despite us attempting to reveal our location for decades now. Largely, Hawking wants us to gain some perspective as to our relevance. If a civilization billions of years more advanced than us found our societies, then we could be as meaningful to them as bacteria and microorganisms are to us. Their ability to harm us, dismiss us, or purge us of our resources could be a realistic threat that Hawking advised we should keep in mind. For years, in attempting to make contact with other potential civilizations, we have sent signals and messages trying to find other life forms and awaited potential signals from elsewhere. Under Hawking's advice and the Breakthrough Listen Project, a shift has been undergone where scientists are looking for foreign life form signals as opposed to sending out our own. The Breakthrough Listen Project, funded by Yuri Milner, is a method of attempting to find intelligent alien life. The procedure is scanning the stars closest to the Earth for radio signals. 
Some movements and interactions that have warranted further investigation include Tabby's star due to its dimming and brightening. While one explanation for this may be an advanced civilization, it is perhaps more plausible to assume a comet swarm is the cause of the apparent flickering of the star. The 2016 documentary Stephen Hawking's Favorite Places sees Hawking explain and explore his favorite places in the universe in which he speaks about Gliese 832c, a planet 16 light years away, and how this would be a prime place for the Breakthrough Listen Project to scan. Hawking does suggest that even if we do receive signals or messages from other life forms, it may be in our best interest to avoid responding at all. Even though Hawking has played a significant role and had a key contribution to the mission attempt to find extraterrestrial life, he is a large critic of the work. We have to ask the question that if we were to find other life forms, what would we do? Would humans respect and leave peace or attempt to colonize and invade? How can we anticipate a positive reaction to others finding human life? The advancement of modern technology and our ever-growing scientific knowledge truly is remarkable and a feat that we should marvel at. Scientists that help us in our discoveries are a testament to all that the human race can achieve. However, we have to heed the warnings great minds give us and remember that fantasizing about the creations we can engineer and knowledge we can gain does not eliminate the danger that these discoveries present. Will the human race form a world government? Will we find alien life? Would we communicate if we do? The possibilities of what science can bring us in the future are near limitless. But how far should we push the boundaries? Exoplanets located in TRAPPIST-1 Discovered within the TRAPPIST-1 system that made headlines from all around the world, TRAPPIST-1. D was one of the many exoplanets found orbiting a star very similar in heat and size to our own sun that led many research scientists to believe that many of the planets orbiting around the sun to be Earth-like habitable planets and ideal for future colonization of a solar system. The most exciting prospect of this discovery was not only the planet, however, but rather the distance the system is from our own solar system being only a mere 39.6 light years away from us making it an interstellar neighbor with a much easier point of access. In fact, previous efforts in developments of space technologies such as that of the Orion nuclear-powered spacecraft could see the journey to the TRAPPIST. One system met in as little as one generation of passengers and accomplished in a short 60 years. This very well means that efforts could be started right now to begin interstellar colonization with current space technologies without any additional stress of developments already being performed. The TRAPPIST-1D planet in orbit around the sun-like star of the TRAPPIST system also appears to be cooler than that of our own Earth and far richer in composition of precious metals, a rocky surface. A low gravity for easy takeoff and an atmosphere filled with however, given the planet's size, mass and density, it is theorized to have a weak electromagnetic field which would not help to shield colonization efforts from damaging cosmic radiation. Similarly seen on our neighboring planet Mars. But even if the planet turns out to be incompatible with future colonization efforts once the passengers arrive at their destination, it can easily be cannibalized for resources to build megastructure bases capable of supporting human life and assist in the efforts of terraforming and colonizing the other neighboring planets nearby. The closest neighbor to the TRAPPIST-1D planet, TRAPPIST-1C, is seen as the best candidate for future human colonization efforts that require next to no additional research developments in the realm of colonization. The short distance of the interstellar neighbor along with all the raw resources that can be gathered by the neighboring planet is only the first bullet point as to why TRAPPIST-1C is a prime candidate for colonization. Back in 2016, Researchers found that the planet has a temperature that is very similar to Earth with a maximum surface temperature of 140 degrees Fahrenheit, a temperature similarly seen in areas on Earth such as Death Valley. Additionally, TRAPPIST-1C has a gravitational force that is 97% equal to that of Earth's gravitational forces, making it habitable without risk to the health and wellness of colonizers as well as a mass large enough to support a strong electromagnetic field that can shield colonizers from deadly cosmic radiation. This makes it a prime environment worthy of colonization efforts as the size, atmosphere, electromagnetic field and mass of the planet seem to be an almost perfect mirroring of our very own planet. Recent research also believes the planet to have a rich atmosphere of water vapor that could potentially see the planet slightly cooled enough to have surface temperatures similar to that of Earth. Starless exoplanets may orbit black holes. Exoplanets are, put simply, just planets that don't orbit our sun. 
Recent studies have found, though, that some exoplanets rather than orbit a star are orbiting superassive black holes. This is also thought to be quite common across the universe as evidence suggests that at the center of a galaxy the superassive black hole can pull planets into its orbit. What's more is that it doesn't stop there. That these planets can also be formed around these black holes. Whilst it's true that black holes are never ending in the pursuit to consume everything around it, they can also form a ring around themselves. These rings are made of various gases and dust but form anywhere up to 30 light years away from the superassive black hole itself. It is theorized that planets can be formed when a star forms. The cloud of gas and dust from around the star collapses and forms disks. These disks are then pulled together and merged by gravity. As you can probably put together, this new research suggests that the clouds formed around a superassive black hole can create these disks and potentially in turn, planets. These planets created around the black holes would be around 10 times the mass of the Earth and could be giant ice or rock planets. Also, because these planets would be formed light years away from the black hole, that there wouldn't be any strange happenings on these planets caused by the extreme gravity from the black hole. The scientists carrying out this research at the University of Kagoshima in Japan also estimate that tens of thousands of these planets could be orbiting the superassive black holes in the centers of galaxies and even go as far as to say this could be happening in our own galaxy too. 2020 CD3 An object known as 2020 CD3 was already acting as Earth's second moon for a time being. In fact, the moon had been orbiting Earth for at least a year when astronomers finally identified it in February 2020. To be fair, it was pretty hard to miss as the space rock really is the miniest of mini-moons. It is only about three feet or a little under a meter wide. Unfortunately, by early March 2020, the moon was flung out of our gravitational pull and began to orbit the sun instead. We waved goodbye to our little moon earlier than expected as it was originally projected to leave in April of that same year. While 2020 CD3 had been orbiting for at least a year, it is possible that it actually had been in revolution for up to three years before we noticed it. 2020 CD3 now orbits the sun every 379 days. Astronomers are unsure if the space rock is a miniature asteroid or perhaps a piece of our moon that was broken off. While it was classified as a near-Earth object, it was not seen as a potentially hazardous object as simulations never indicated any chance of collision. Quite frankly, this object was always too small to be a threat regardless. Even if it did collide with the Earth, it would have been broken up in the atmosphere before touching ground. In March 2044, our former mini-moon will be close to Earth again, but not quite close enough to be pulled back into the orbit. The next time that it is likely that the space rock re-enters our orbit is not for a few thousand years. The reason Earth has trouble keeping a mini-moon is because the gravitational pull from other elements of our solar system, like the moon and the sun, are strong enough to make the circuits of these rocks unstable. But who knows, another chunk of astro rock might be out there waiting to be our next mini-moon. So whether these objects simply fly by or stay with us for a longer period of time, every interaction gets us excited about what is out there in the great expanse that is space. While we can't always trace these objects or predict what they will do and where they will go, the mysteries of space will continue to fascinate us for eons to come. Who knows when the next compelling discovery will come flying our way. The great attractor on planet Earth, gravitational force is inevitable as everything that goes up comes down eventually. The great attractor, just as the name suggests, attracts galaxies to itself just like the way a magnet does to metal. It operates as a gravitational anomaly. The Great Attractor is a gravitational abnormality in intergalactic space and the apparent central gravitational point of the Lanakaya supercluster. When observed, the Great Attractor is difficult to be envisioned as it is inconveniently obscured by large clusters of galaxies in our Milky Way's galactic plane. A lot of astronomers have been curious if planet Earth is safe with the discovery of the existence of the Great Attractor by NASA. The Great Attractor was explored and discovered by NASA to have been located on the border of Triangulum Austral and Norma. This field covers part of the Norma Cluster as well as a dense area of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. The Norma Cluster is the closest massive galaxy cluster to the Milky Way and lies about 220 million light years away. The Great Attractor was recorded by astronomers to be an enormous concentration of masses and occupies a region of space which dominates our region of the universe. 
One of the distinguished characteristics of the great attractor also is that the gravitational abnormality is observable by its effects on the motion of galaxies and their associated clusters. Over a region of hundreds of millions of light years across, its visibility inconvenient to observe at optical wavelengths. A whole range of tactics need to be in place for observations such as infrared or radio observations, but the region just behind the center of the Milky Way where visibility is obscured remains yet a complete mystery to astronomers. Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. Earth may be unique in many ways, but one thing it shares in common with the other planets is volcanoes. Space volcanoes operate almost exactly like the ones on Earth, except that they have the potential to get bigger. Much bigger. That brings us to Olympus Mons. Olympus Mons is a massive shield volcano on the planet Mars. It is over 21 kilometers tall. To put that into perspective, it is about two and a half times the height of Mount Everest. It's so tall that it actually goes outside of Mars' atmosphere. It is considered the tallest volcano to be discovered in the solar system. Olympus Mons covers an area roughly the size of Italy, which is a massive surface area for a volcano. Because the tectonic plates on Mars do not shift as much as they do on Earth, Olympus Mons has been able to acquire a massive size. The shifting of the tectonic plates greatly changes how things like volcanoes form because it disrupts the matter required to settle and shape the volcano. This has also allowed Olympus Mons to discharge lava to enormous heights continuously without being disturbed. So, how did a volcano of this size even come to be? Scientists predict that Olympus Mons came from many lava flows pouring onto the same site over time. This allows lava to remain in the same spot for longer periods of time, which in turn allows more volcanic crust to form. Eventually, a volcano arises around these lava flows and continues to grow as more lava spews. This means that for a few billion years there has been a steady flow of lava in one spot on Mars. This has never been able to happen on Earth, which means that no volcano like Olympus Mons has ever been able to form on Earth. Even though it has taken billions of years to form this volcano, it is actually still considered relatively young. Because of this, Olympus Mons could still be active. The last time this volcano erupted is predicted to have been anywhere from 20 to 200 million years ago, which is around the time that dinosaurs roamed on Earth. It is unlikely to erupt again, but some scientists predict that it is still a highly plausible possibility which could have extreme effects. On us considering the size of the volcano, there haven't been any rovers to make the journey onto this volcano. This is for many reasons in part because it is a highly complex terrain. It is incredibly dusty, which makes gathering accurate samples extremely difficult. It also has high elevations, which makes any kind of parachute landing impossible because there is not enough room to actually make the landing. Unfortunately, this means that we will not learn much more about Olympus Mons until there is a breakthrough in technology. Our intergalactic red planet neighbor continues to be a place of exploration and research. These three Mars discoveries show that the Mars we know today is nothing like it once was. The Mysterious Radio Signals from the M82 Galaxy For 10 years now, astronomers have been picking up mysterious radio signals from the M82 Galaxy. Located about 12 million light years away, the Messier 82 is a starburst galaxy located in the Ursa Major constellation. This galaxy is five times more luminous than our Milky Way galaxy and its center is 100 times more luminous than our galaxy's center. Receiving a radio signal from such a distant galaxy is quite mind-blowing. It opens up all kinds of possibilities. Researchers do not know anything about the object that is making these signals. The first signal from the M82 galaxy was received by the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia. Up until now, more than 20 signals have been discovered. As you would expect, this is one of the hottest topics in astronomy today. Some scientists have given the theory that these signals are coming from the high-energy pulsars that are being consumed by a black hole in the M82 galaxy. Another theory points towards the possibility of massive cosmic explosions and then there is always a possibility as per our own understanding that an alien race might just be trying to contact us. The discovery of these mysterious radio signals from the M82 galaxy has given scientists a new hope about the possibility of an alien civilization. At the same time, it has also opened up a whole new mystery to be solved by researchers. Will we be able to see this mystery unfold during our lifetime? Only time will tell. The universe is expanding faster than we thought. Whilst we may not be able to feel, see, or really understand it, the universe is constantly expanding. 
This, however, is not in the normal sense of the word. We are located within our galaxy, the Milky Way. However, the galaxies outside of ours are moving away from us and the galaxies that are the farthest away are moving away from us faster. If you were to be in a different galaxy, for example, this would be the same. Galaxies outside of that galaxy would be moving away from it, even our own. They are not moving in the conventional sense of the word because they're moving with space rather than passing through. Whilst difficult to understand the universe itself has no center and everything within it is actually moving away from everything else. A famous analogy coined to explain this expansion is thinking of the universe as a loaf of raisin bread dough. As it is cooked it rises and expands and as a result the raisins move away from one another but they are still inside the bread. At this point you might be asking why isn't earth moving away from everything else then? This is because on a local scale such as around us gravity keeps everything together and holds it in place. This was first discovered in 1925 by Edwin Hubble, the man the famous Hubble telescope is named after, and he proved that there was a direct relationship between the speeds of distant galaxies and their distances from Earth. This is now known as Hubble's Law. The number meaning the rate of cosmic expansion in relation to speeds of galaxies and their distance from Earth is known as the Hubble Constant. In the last couple of years, even up to this year, new evidence is suggesting that the universe is expanding much faster than initially first thought. The universe is outpacing all our expectations in its expansion and that is very puzzling, says lead study author Adam Rice. An astronomer at Johns Hopkins University who co-won the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics for helping discover dark energy. This new evidence suggests that measurements of the Hubble constant mentioned earlier using cosmic microwave background, the afterglow of the early universe and the Big Bang is actually conflicting with estimates of younger stars and even the Milky Way. This discrepancy is still apparent even after taking into account dark energy and other cosmic forces that are thought to be speeding up the universe's expansion. This has and is still disputed by other scientists and cosmologists as incorrect or incomplete data. However, fresh research from the Hubble as new as 2019 suggests this gap is actually larger than ever. It is estimated that the universe as we know it is expanding up to 9% faster than we originally thought when examining the trajectory of the universe's expansion from the Big Bang. What does this mean? Well, the discrepancy between the rate we believe the universe is expanding now and what we believed it should be from the trajectory created from the Big Bang means that scientists could be missing an essential factor in the cosmological model when measuring that. Would account for this discrepancy? For now at least, what's missing is a mystery. But with all the fascinating discoveries we've talked about today, it would be no surprise if in a couple of years from now we were discussing a new strongest material or new type of formation on a distant planet. Or even a new theory of the universe. We just don't know. One thing is for sure though, as we try and figure out this wacky wonderful universe, is that it certainly won't be boring. Kepler 20f Although the planet known as Kepler 20f is more than 929 light years away from Earth meaning that it would take more than 900 years traveling at the speed of light before humanity could even reach the planet with current theories and technologies of space travel. It is still a primate location for the establishment of future colonies and holds more similarities to Earth than Venus itself. In fact, the planet Kepler 20f is much cooler than Venus, being more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit cooler at its maximum temperature. When the planet was first discovered back in 2011, it was noticed as being a rocky planet with the same mass, radius, and gravity as the planet Earth, while also supporting a rich atmosphere believing to be containing vast amounts of water vapor. Unfortunately, this water vapor caused a runaway greenhouse effect that sees the planet at an overall temperature too hot to support life. However, with a few modifications to the environment, it could very well be a much better twin than Venus without requiring the extensive needs of terraforming as our own neighboring planet. In fact, the other celestial bodies in the region of Kepler 20f are believed to hold a vast amount of resources that could be used in mining efforts to help terraform the planet with megastructures constructed. By sending a separated human colony to the planet over many generations, the planet could potentially be a new starting ground for all of human life. China claims to be building an artificial sun. China has revealed their plans to create a nuclear fusion reactor that will reach extreme temperatures similar to those found at the sun's core. They claim that their artificial sun will be able to burn up to 360 million degrees Fahrenheit, about 12 times hotter than our sun. 
Nuclear fusion on the sun occurs when two hydrogen nuclei fuse together to form a heavier helium nucleus, thus releasing an immense amount of energy during the process. In order to recreate this process of nuclear fusion, China is using HL2M Tokamak, which is the largest kind of fusion reactor found today. Their device is called the Experimental Advanced Superconducting Tokamak. The name Tokamak comes from a shortened version of the name Tokamak, of the Russian translation for toroidal magnetic confinement. A tokamak is a ring-shaped device in which the hydrogen is heated to extreme temperatures and turns into plasma. The temperamental plasma is contained in the device through the use of magnetic fields. However, the plasma is prone to bursts and can easily damage the device. Essentially, a tokamak is a donut that's very difficult to control and has taken a long time to be used. At such a large scale, most other scientists switched from tokamaks to a more stable device called Estelarata. They say that China's tokamak is different than others due to the flexibility of its magnetic field. It provides more protection from the plasma to the reactor walls resulting in a more stable device. China first began working on it in 2006 and it took until 2018 for the construction to near completion. And it to reach the halfway point of 180 million degrees Fahrenheit. The scientists working on its claim that it will be fully operational and reach the claimed 360 million degrees Fahrenheit by the end of 2020. So why is China creating an artificial sun? What will they use it for? Their goal is to create a stable plasma fusion reaction that can continuously maintain those extreme temperatures by itself. They want to use the power it generates as an energy source for commercial practices. If successful, the artificial sun would be a massive jump in progress towards a clean and nearly limitless energy. It would also be an immense financial profit for them. While the arc generator imitated the power of the tesseract to provide clean, renewable energy, the experimentally advanced superconducting tokamak will imitate the sun's nuclear fusion. Their tokamak to be able to reach half the expected temperature for short intervals of time before destabilizing. Although the 2020 pandemic might have slowed the project down, the researchers continue to work towards the goal of it being fully operational. China lands on the dark side of the moon. On January 3, 2019, at around 10.26 a.m. Beijing time, China's robot spacecraft successfully landed on the far side of our moon. The spacecraft Chang'e 4 puts China in the running for a space leader as it is the first in history to land in the South Pole-Aiken Basin, which is an area of the moon that is never visible to Earth. This dark side of the moon is unexplored territory. No one has attempted to reach it before. The moon is the Earth's only natural satellite rotating every 27 days or so. We are actually only able to see approximately 60% of the moon's surface. The 40% of the dark side of the moon is always hidden from us. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, have spent the past 50 years collecting images of the far side of the moon through various satellites and space probes. So although we have known for some time what the other side roughly looks like, this landing makes history and will reveal even more detailed information about the moon and space that we did not know prior. There is no direct communication link to the robotic spacecraft, so in order for the lunar images it captured to reach Earth. It has to be rerouted through another satellite that Chang'e 4 was launched on December 7, 2018 and arrived in the moon's orbit five days later. It then took the rest of the month to lower itself onto the surface. Named after a Chinese goddess who supposedly lived for millennia on the moon, its mission is to explore the massive South Pole Aiken Basin. This basin is one of the largest known impact craters in our whole solar system. The distance from its tallest peaks to its very depths is nearly 15 kilometers. Mount Everest only reaches around 8.9 kilometers. Chang'e 4 will collect soil samples to analyze the structure and composition of the moon above and below its surface. What's even more amazing is that Chang'e 4 brought live plant species from Earth that it will use to plant a garden. It carries cotton, rapeseed, potato, yeast, and to the small flowering plant Arabidopsis. Apart from gathering samples and data, its other mission is to attempt to grow the first plants on the moon. The China National Space Administration also explained that since there is no radio interference on the dark side, there is opportunity for spacecraft to observe the stars and nebulae using radio astronomy. Even though the moon has been explored since the 1960s, there is so much information still unknown to us. China first announced its moon landing plan in 2016. Their space program has grown exponentially since their first astronaut launching in 2003. 
and over time they have managed to send multiple robotic spacecrafts onto the moon, albeit on the light side. They have also launched various satellites and space stations and even a Mars rover that they expect to land in February 2021. It's amazing how far we've come technologically. Alternative energy sources, interstellar exploration, space gardens, next up, space travel. All we need now is to clean up the junk and debris still floating in space. With the Chinese government heavily funding their space program and encouraging new developments, perhaps it will inspire some competition within the other countries to once again look up at the sky and delve back into space exploration. Hat P7b discovered in 2008, Hat P7b is an extrasolar planet orbiting around a star twice the size of our sun hat. P7b is also known as Kepler 2b. Astronomers estimate that this planet is located about 1,040 light years away. Being located very close to its host star, this planet receives extreme heat. Astronomers have made some very strange observations about this planet. One such observation relates to the extreme light absorbing characteristics. Astronomers have found that it is one of the darkest planets ever discovered. They have estimated its albedo to be around 0.03. Albedo is the measure of the diffuse reflection of solar radiation out of the total solar radiation received by an astronomical body. This means that this planet absorbs about 97% of the light that strikes its surface. Scientists have been studying this distant planet for many years now. In 2016, they were able to identify the weather conditions on this planet. It has been called the first ever weather report for a planet outside of our solar system. Researchers from the University of Warwick in England observed the weather patterns on Hat P7b and found that the planet had violent weather systems. The temperatures on this planet can reach as high as 2,500 degrees Celsius. Catastrophic winds blow across the planet. These winds transport the clouds from the night side of the planet to the day side. These winds have varying speeds throughout the day and they form amazing cloud formations. Scientists believe that the clouds on Hat P7b could be made of corundin, which is a mineral found in sapphires and rubies. This has led them to believe that there is a strong possibility that some of the most precious stones found on Earth, sapphires and rubies, could be the particles of the violent winds that blow on the surface of Hat P7b. This also gives us an idea of the unending amount of wealth and resource that could be harnessed if humans were able to travel across the universe. The Space Rule Back in 2009, top researchers at the Goddard Space Flight Center sent a device up into space via a giant balloon known as Arcade. Arcade was an acronym that stood for Absolute Radiometer for Cosmology, Astrophysics, and Diffuse Emissions, which details its mission as being that of a searching device capable of picking up diffuse radiation caused by the universe's earliest stars. It was a huge surprise then that instead of picking up these weak signals, the Arcade device captured data that scientists have described as a space rule. Although a large amount of radio waves caused via synchrotron radiation was expected by researchers at the Goddard Space Flight Center, what was recovered and analyzed turned out to be radio waves six times the normal amount expected to be heard, as well as their origin points being from that of galaxies 2.5 million light years away. This has led many to speculate the possibility that perhaps this enormous amount of background radio waves found in our universe could be that of extraterrestrial civilizations and their frequencies sent out into the vacuum of space. This could very well be the case as our radio wave frequencies have been spreading out like a bubble from Earth since the first transmissions were sent a little over 100 years ago and given the fact that these extraterrestrial civilizations could predate us. By millions of years, we could be picking up the faintest signals that have reached us over a vast distance of both space and time. Scientists struggle to find any other cause for this mystery and have left many wondering if whether or not we are truly alone in the universe or we are merely the latest species to tune into an age-old galactic conversation. NASA discovers TIE Fighter Galaxy not that long ago in a galaxy that is very far away. Scientists at NASA discovered something very unusual but something very interesting, a dream of every sci-fi lover. Discovered in August of 2020, NASA researchers announced that they had found a galaxy shaped like Darth Vader's TIE Fighter from the Star Wars series. 554 bears an uncanny resemblance to the personal spacecraft of the film's iconic villain. Located in the Cassiopeia constellation of space, the galaxy is located 500 million light-years away from us. 
The reason the galaxy has such a peculiar shape mostly comes down to what angle researchers can view the galaxy at, and it probably wouldn't look quite like a TIE fighter if you were to view it from another angle. The galaxy is an interesting find nonetheless, and scientists have actually labeled it as an active galaxy, meaning that the galaxy actually emits more light out into space than what all of its stars are capable of, some of which has captured the interest of scientists. The excess light seems to be produced by gamma rays from a superassive black hole at the galaxy's center. This explains the section that is thinner in the middle. The wings of the TIE fighter have an explanation too, as they are actually large clouds of gas and dust built up and heated by gravity and friction. According to communication network coverage on the Star Wars-related spotting, the TIE fighter galaxy has a superassive black hole at its center and is blasting out enormous amounts of energy. This is not the first strangely shaped galaxy that scientists have spotted. As technology and measuring instruments have become better equipped at recording far off, scientists have discovered a galaxy shaped like a boomerang, one shaped like a sombrero, and even one shaped like a donut. The galaxy seen from far away will be forever remembered due to its unique shape and memorable. 486958 Arakoth 4869 5-8 Arakoth is the most distant object ever explored and is also known as 2014 MU69 by its original destination. It was discovered on the June 26, 2014. In the Algonquian language, Arakoth means sky. New Horizons principal investigator Alan Stern claimed the name Arakoth reflects the inspiration of looking to the skies and wondering about the stars and worlds beyond our own. It is situated in the Kuiper Belt, which is relatively similar to an asteroid belt but much larger in size. Many objects wavering within the Kuiper Belt are well-preserved and frozen, similar to a time capsule, giving us an inside look on what the outer solar system was like after its initial conception. For over 4 billion years, the Kuiper Belt is known as the solar system's third zone. Arakoth is also a trans-Neptunian object. Transneptunian objects are dwarf or minor-sized planets in our solar system that are at a greater distance than Neptune. Arakoth checks in at 4 billion years old. It was discovered by Mark Buey using the Hubble Space Telescope. The observation was conducted by NASA's New Horizons science team. Announced data from Arakoth has given us an indication about the formation of planets and our cosmic origins. We believe this ancient body composed of two distinct lobes that merged into one entity may harbor answers that contribute to our understanding of the origin of life on Earth. Arakoth has a red tint that is actually more red than Pluto, making it the reddest outer solar system object discovered to date. Arakoth's amorphous shape is described by NASA as a snowman that's been partially flattened. It is two objects merged into one and is about 35 kilometers long, 20 kilometers wide, and 10 kilometers thick. Arakoth is the furthest object that has been explored by humans. It was identified when the probe was 6.4 billion kilometers from Earth and it is an estimated 6.6 .6 billion kilometers away from Earth. It takes Arakoth around 293 years to orbit the Sun once. Arakoth could give scientists answers that they have been searching decades for. There are two situations scientists have debated concerning planetary formation. The first scenario is hierarchical accretion, where small grains and pebbles bounce around, occasionally hitting into each other with enough force to stick, making bigger and bigger objects. Eventually, over the course of millions of years, these planets would have compiled matter from random, forceful collisions. The second scenario is cloud collapse, where certain regions of the nebula had a high density of particles and these clumps were drawn towards each other until they spontaneously gravitationally collapsed. Unlike the forceful nature of hierarchical accretion collisions, cloud collapse collisions were leading to the planets being born. Dr. Alan Stern, the principal investigator of the New Horizons team, said the imagery shows no signs of violence, no fractures. The two lobes don't look smashed together, leaving room to certify the cloud collapse theory. The discovery of Arakoth has led to a possible revolutionary breakthrough. A planetary scientist at Washington University in St. Louis explained, it tells us some profound truths about our solar system. It's a remarkable world that's told us a remarkable story. The information exposed left the New Horizons team confused, debating if Arakoth was more significant than the probe's first encounter with Pluto in 2015. It will be exciting to see where the discovery of 486958 Arakoth will take us and how it will help us understand the astonishing complexity and inner workings of outer space.
Astronomers announced the discovery of a second repeating fast radio burst over the years. Astronomers have been baffled by a unique phenomenon that sends a transient radio pulse of length ranging from a fraction of a millisecond to a few milliseconds. It is known as a fast radio burst, or FRB. Astronomers believe that it is caused by some extremely high-energy astrophysical process happening deep somewhere in the universe. The strength of an FRB has been described as 1,000 times less than the strength of a mobile phone signal that would be received from the moon. Astronomers are not sure as to what causes an FRB. In 2016, scientists made a breakthrough when they discovered the first repeating FRB. They realized that a series of bursts was coming from one single source. Now in 2019, scientists have stumbled upon a second repeating fast radio burst. The first signal from this new source was received on August 14, 2019. Then within the next couple of months, the researchers received four more signals from the same FRB source. According to researchers, this new FRB source that has been named FRB180814 is located at a distance of about 1.6 billion light years away. A detailed analysis of the first repeating fast radio burst had revealed that it was probably coming from an extremely magnetic environment, so there is a possibility that it could be coming from a neutron star or a black hole. However, when the scientists measured the polarization of a signal received from this newly discovered repeating FRB, they found it to be very low. This has led researchers to believe that not all FRBs are coming from extreme environments. With the discovery of the new repeating FRB source, researchers are now confident that they will soon be able to discover more sources of repeating fast radio bursts. The Keenan, Barga, and Coe Void After the formation of the Big Bang, as matter and energy spread out from a singularity, it mostly spread out in a uniform way, predictable by most mathematicians and physicists educated in the matter. However, in recent years, it has come to the attention of many academics that though this might hold true for everywhere else in the known universe, this does not happen to be the case for the area around our immediate galaxy. It appears that our home galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is at the center of a vast desert in regards to the universe, existing in the middle of one of the largest observed voids in all of the observable universe. This void is referred to as the KBC void after its founders and lead researchers who came across this peculiar anomaly in each of their independent studies using various methods to prove the existence of this void and the lack of matter. Given the fact that the universe will normally disperse energy in organized filaments, it seems incredibly odd that our galaxy would find itself formed in the middle of essentially nothingness. Though these findings were made back in 2013 and the research data surrounding this information is fairly recent in its discovery, this finding has been at the center of many conspiracy theory claims believing that perhaps the cause for this void comes from something artificial and not a natural anomaly of the universe. This can be further supported by the fact that the strange KBC void appears to be almost perfectly spherical in nature, almost as if our galaxy was at the center of a massively growing explosion that spread out evenly in all directions. According to Nikolai Kardashev, the Russian astrophysicist who helped to design the metric of the Kardashev scale to accurately map out the advancements of the level of technological prowess of a civilization. He believed that not only would advanced civilizations require an incredibly high output of energy requirements, but that looking for these pockets of energy or lack of energy could be clear signs of advanced extraterrestrial life and its energy requirements and usage. This could mean that the void we find ourselves to be within could be the substantial amount of evidence required to prove the energy requirements of a surrounding advanced extraterrestrial civilization. Dr. Story Musgrave Franklin Story Musgrave, known as Story Musgrave, was born in 1935 in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. One of seven children, Musgrave grew up to become a physician and a NASA astronaut, despite having come from an extraordinarily dysfunctional family full of abuse and alcoholism. In 1996, he became only the second astronaut to fly on six space flights. A highly intelligent individual, he holds six academic degrees, making him the world's most formally educated astronaut. In 1998, Musgrave held the record for the oldest person in orbit at age 61. With a huge variety of interests and a highly diverse range of career experiences, Musgrave has obviously had a very interesting life. One of the most curious tales of his space career was one involving a strange sighting from his spacecraft. 
Musgrave has said to have seen on at least two of his missions something he can only describe as a snake-looking being at least six to eight feet long, looking rubbery due to internal waves and Musgrave believes the snake follows you for long periods of time throughout space. Musgrave believes that the snake must have been white in color in order to reflect sunlight and appear to swim due to the velocity of the nearby spacecraft. Due to the lack of gravity in space, items like the snake are able to glide freely in what Musgrave calls an extraordinary ballet. The only theory that Musgrave has to explain the strange object is that it may have been an uncritical rubber seal from the main engines. Interestingly, Musgrave has a strong belief in the existence of other life forms, a belief that was crystallized on his many space voyages. He says, the more you fly in space, the more you see an incredible amount of things out there, and that sort of thing brings to you, really, a certainty that other living creatures are out there. In other interviews, he has said, I feel that they're everywhere out there, and they're doing interstellar travel. We'll think differently about ourselves once we accept that. Now 84, it is unlikely that Musgrave will ever get a concrete explanation for his bizarre sightings while in space. However, the fact that such an intelligent and accomplished individual believes with such conviction that we are not alone in the universe is a comfort to those who adamantly believe that humans are not the only species inhabiting the universe. NASA's Parker Solar Probe Discovery The Parker Solar Probe was launched in the year 2018. Researchers have revealed that the unexplained rogue waves and high winds mean scientists are negligent of something really cogent in the standard models of the sun. NASA's Parker Solar Probe maneuvered closer to the sun than any previous mission, though the sun is in the center of the solar system and its radiation has birthed the existence of Earth. It is one of the most undiscovered items in space because of its immense heat and radiation. During these two encounters, Parker traveled within 15 million miles of the sun's surface, far exceeding the 25 million mile record first set by NASA's Helios 2 mission in 1976. Parker has also acclaimed the title of the fastest human-made object in history from Helios 2 as it surfaced near the sun at over 153,000 miles per hour. In a jaw-dropping discovery, Parker detected new phenomena within a quarter of an astronomical unit, the distance between Earth and the sun of the solar surface. At that distance, the probe reported that the solar wind, which is a stream of charged particles emitted by the sun, was rotating around the star at speeds far beyond what models had estimated. To everyone's big surprise, by the time it got to the closest approach, the solar wind was flowing between 35 and 50 kilometers per second around the sun. That's something like 15 to 20 times faster than the standard solar models predict. So scientists are missing something really fundamental in the rigid standard models of the sun, how it rotates and how the wind escapes, which is discovered to be really interesting. Park was also struck by a series of extremely intense alpha waves in the solar wind. Interplanetary missions have long observed far less energetic alpha waves, which are waves that circulate through magnetized plasma from the sun. But Parker is the first to brace the huge rogue waves near the star. It was reported that every now and then, suddenly within seconds, the speed of the wind would leap up by about 300,000 miles an hour. Then, for seconds or hundreds of seconds, the spacecraft would sit there washed by the spur in the speed of the wind and then just as quickly it goes away. These spurs are so forcible that they distort and twist the magnetic field as they pass through it. It gives one a sense of just how much energy is dissipated in these rogue waves as they go by compared to the regular Alvin waves that have been reported earlier. Though the mechanism behind these waves is still a mystery, the great force of them may help elucidate two of the most persistent mysteries about the sun. Why is solar corona or the atmosphere of the sun about 1,000 times hotter than its surface? And why does the solar wind suddenly accelerate to supersonic speeds at a certain distance from the sun? Scientists suspect that a complex process dumps heat and energy into the solar corona. The newly detected rogue waves might be a portion of this dynamic. In initial analysis by scientists, they're carrying a great mass of energy. So they are very promising as an energy source. It cannot in any way be acclaimed that astronomers have solved this mystery, but some very surprising results have been made to paint the path to closing this mystery. Tunguska event Russia is known for being a powerhouse and being home to some of the greatest nuclear power on the planet, but this power has caused various issues for the country. One interesting case happened back in 1908. On the morning of the 30th of June 1908, a large explosion occurred near the Tunguska River. 
This terrifying explosion over the hardly populated region of eastern Siberia erased around 80 million trees. Whatever this explosion was ripped through the area with ease and caused a massive amount of damage. The large majority of the trees have been wiped of its branches. It's also said that around three people died in the event. When it comes to the reason behind this famous incident, various theories have been put forward, the majority of which people can't seem to agree on. One of the most accepted theories is that a meteorite caused the destruction of the area. Interestingly, scientists and researchers have classified this as an impact event even though no impact crater or objects have ever been discovered, something that's led people to look at alternative theories to explain the mysterious event. Scientists, however, have stuck to the meteorite story and say that the object that caused the damage would have been large. They suggested that the object disintegrated at around 5 to 12 miles in the sky. Back in 1908 when this incident happened, science was not at the level it is now. Due to this, researchers at the time had limited instruments. The magnitude of the event has helped modern researchers to come to a more conclusive answer for what happened here. As it took around 10 to 11 years to find out information on this incident, and because many people living in the area were religious, they concluded that the reason this event happened was because their god was not happy with them. Science has said that various studies have allowed them to come up with different estimates of the size of the meteorite, ranging from 50 to 190 meters, depending on how fast the body was traveling. Along with the size of the meteorite, other factors were also measured in order to reach a decision. Tests showed that the energy of this object would have been the same as 3 to 30 megatons of TNT. More than a hundred years after the event, only a few clues remain. For such a large event, it's left behind no clue whatsoever. Interestingly, researchers have said that much larger events happened in Earth's history, but this event is considered one of the largest impact events ever recorded in the history of the Earth. Today, after more than 100 years of the event, scientists still believe there is something we are missing. One NASA scientist said the following about the event. A century later, some still debate the cause and come up with different scenarios that could have caused the explosion. But the generally agreed upon theory is that on the morning of June 30, 1908, a large space rock about 120 feet across entered the atmosphere of Siberia and then detonated in the sky. The moon is shrinking. Earth's moon was formed around 4.6 billion years ago and it's always in synchronous rotation with Earth, which means that we always see the same side of the moon. The first unmanned mission to the moon was in 1959 by the Soviet lunar program, with the first manned landing being Apollo 11 in 1969. Due to its size and composition, the moon is sometimes classified as a terrestrial planet, along with Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. In the summer of 1994, the moon was very extensively mapped by the little spacecraft Clementine and again in 1999 by Luna Prospector. In recent years, there has been a special interest in the dark side of the moon. This popular term refers to the fact that the same physical half of the moon is always facing Earth, which in turn means that there's a dark side. Recent NASA scientists have come forward and said that they've discovered something interesting about our moon. They said that it's shrinking and shaking. They've said that their studies have shown that the inside of the moon has shriveled up and that deep cliffs can be found all over its surface. What's interesting is that this recent study suggests that the moon could still be shrinking. Researchers have also come forward and said that the moon's surface crust is brittle and that due to the moon shrinking, it's starting to break the surface. One of the senior scientists at NASA said the following about this discovery. Our analysis gives the first evidence that these faults are still active and likely producing moon quakes today as the moon continues to gradually cool and shrink. Some of these quakes can be fairly strong, around 5 on the Richter scale. The scientists have also been using high-detailed images to help the discovery of other faults. The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera has snapped over 3,500 images and these have helped scientists to understand what's going on on the surface of the moon. Some photographs in particular have shown them that there are bright patches and scraps on certain terrains. These small details are showing the researchers that recent quakes have happened on the moon. These moonquakes can last up to an hour and have been known to send boulders rolling down cliff slopes. One researcher said that around 20 to 30 percent of the moonquakes were most likely generated by built-up energy from these faults and that they didn't think this had happened from naturally occurring space debris like asteroids. NASA scientists have said that they are keeping a close eye on the seismic shaking. This recent discovery was published in the journal Nature Geoscience.
IC1101 black hole. Located around 1 billion light years away from us here on Earth is the ABLE 2029 galaxy cluster. Within this cluster is the IC1101 supergiant elliptical galaxy. As mentioned earlier, an elliptical galaxy is the product of two spiral galaxies merging together. The IC1101 itself is actually one of the biggest galaxies in the known universe, which is a very impressive feat in itself. Not only that, the IC1101 is home to something even more interesting. An ultramassive black hole, the third largest in the observable universe to be more specific, lies in the center of IC1101. The black hole itself has not had its mass directly measured. However, it's estimated to be just under the mass of home 15, a ultramassive black hole around 40 billion times the mass of our own sun. Whilst this is IC 1101's estimated mass, it could actually be between 40 to 100 billion times the mass of our own sun. But as mentioned previously, IC 1101 hasn't been directly measured at the time of recording, so this could potentially be the most massive once measured more accurately. The IC 1101 galaxy is one of the more interesting galaxies that we know of, home to an estimated 100 to 150 trillion stars. That's again completely crazy to think of in practical terms. The supergiant elliptical galaxy of IC 1101 has a huge radius of 3 million light years. The total mass of IC 1101 is 1 1.125 quadrillion solar masses. The IC 1101 black hole located at the center has a mass of 70 billion solar masses. What's more mind-blowing is that because of its distance away from us here on Earth, Anything we observe is more likely over 1 billion years old. It's because of this we really have no idea what's going on at the IC1101 at present. An interesting point to think about is that due to the sheer amount of stars that are located within the IC1101, there would more than likely be hundreds if not thousands of potential civilizations inhabiting this galaxy. Given the fact that the black holes we've spoken about today are so massive and incomprehensible to us means that probability would suggest somewhere out there is more life or other civilizations. On the Kardashev scale, a scale used to determine the strength or size of a civilization if a civilization were to occupy and control the IC1101 galaxy, then that would fall into the highest category of the scale, a scale 3. This simply states that the civilization has completely colonized the galaxy. This is compared to us on Earth. We as a civilization would fall into the lowest end of the scale, a scale one. A one on the scale is simply planetary scale occupation or control. So we as the human race control the planet. Going into specific detail and discussing these truly incredible occurrences throughout the universe can almost be quite an unsettling experience. Learning about these absolutely astronomical black holes, or should we say ultra-massive black holes, is fascinating more than any other. It shows just how more advanced we are getting as we progress as a civilization and the simple fact that we can comprehend these mammoth black holes is fascinating in itself. The black holes we discussed today, TUN618, HOME15A and IC1101 are universe royalty. They are, at the time of recording, the biggest black holes in the known universe. NASA finds ancient organic material, mysterious methane on Mars. NASA's own Curiosity rover has stumbled across organic material preserved within sedimentary rocks on Mars up to 3 billion years old. Whilst many people hear organic molecules and assume this equates to life and biological sustainability, NASA has been quick to disclaim that whilst this is exciting, this is not the only possible explanation. The molecules found on Mars certainly contain carbon and hydrogen, with the likely possibility of accompanying elements such as oxygen and nitrogen yet to be found. Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters, Thomas Sabukin stated, With these new findings, Mars is telling us to stay the course and keep searching for evidence of life. Whilst we may not have concrete evidence that Mars has hosted life, we have enough material to speculate and not entirely dismiss the idea that there may once have been life on Mars supported by the now ancient organic material. Another NASA researcher, Jen Egenbrode, explains that this organic material could simply record and document ancient life, may have even been a food source for life or even existed entirely independently of life, most importantly, however. She stresses that this is an insightful and promising discovery regardless as to which category this finding does fall into. As it tells us new information regarding the planetary conditions and processes all informed by the chemical compositions found. 
Today we can determine that Mars can no longer support life, though this discovery of organic material reminds us that in the past Mars once had environmental conditions and a climate that could facilitate liquid water, meaning life could theoretically survive. However, this discovery does not end here. Scientists have also discovered a fluctuation in methane levels in the atmosphere of Mars dependent upon each season. The study observed these changes to be consistent within each Mars year over a three-year period on Mars, equating to a six-year-long study for the scientists here on Earth. This observation was completed by the sample analysis at Mars Suite of the Curiosity. There are multiple explanations, again with varying degrees of excitement attached as to why the methane levels fluctuate like this. Some suggest that the chemical interaction between water and rock may have generated methane, while others retain a firm belief that we should still consider that this methane has a biological origin, suggesting Mars once hosted some kind of life. 2008 TC3 On October 7, 2008, an asteroid entered the Earth's atmosphere and exploded 37 kilometers above the Nubian Desert in Sudan. Scientists estimated that the asteroid had a diameter of 4.1 meters and weighed more than 80 tons. The asteroid disintegrated as a result of the explosion in the atmosphere and more than 600 meteorites belonging to this asteroid were recovered by scientists. Many of these meteorites belong to the rare type known as urolites. These urolites contain a number of different minerals including nanodiamonds. Known as the TC3 asteroid, this was the first asteroid whose impact was predicted before entry into the Earth's atmosphere. The asteroid was discovered 19 hours before impact. It was discovered by Richard A. Kowalski, who was working at Catalina Sky Survey, a telescope in Arizona, United States. The meteor exploded 37 kilometers above the Earth's atmosphere. The energy of the explosion was measured to be equal to that of a 0.9 to 2.1 kilotons of TNT. A large fireball was created as a result of the explosion. According to media reports, the light from the explosion was so intense that it lit up the sky just like the full moon. An airliner that was traveling 1,400 kilometers away from the explosion reported seeing a very bright flash of light. After the explosion, scientists started searching for the torn apart meteorites. 15 meteorites were discovered within the first three days of the explosion. After analysis, the researchers concluded that the asteroid TC3 belonged to a class of asteroids known as F-class asteroids. Researchers found amino acids on the collected meteorites and they concluded that the source of the asteroid was most probably another planet in our own solar system. One of the pieces of the TC3 asteroid was gifted to Richard Kowalski, the scientist who discovered the asteroid before it had entered the Earth's atmosphere. According to scientists, it is not uncommon for asteroids of such a size to hit the surface of the Earth. In fact, two or three such asteroids hit Earth every year. NASA scientists detect evidence of a parallel universe where time runs backwards. For decades, our TV screens have been riddled with science fiction shows, weaving stories of parallel universes and describing realms filled with time travel and aliens alike. Well, new research as recent as 2020 suggests that these ideas are not quite so far-fetched. As scientists describe actions of particles resembling expectations of parallel universes where both the rules of time and physics appear to be inverted to our own. The idea of a multiverse has not always been confined to our comic books and fictional tales. It has been suggested for numerous years that there is a likelihood of a multiverse existing and subsequent research that has been conducted for years now has taken this possibility into account. One often cited that has considered the possibility of a parallel universe is quantum mechanics with the many worlds theory first proposed by American physicist Hugh Everett III in 1957 whilst completing his doctoral thesis at Princeton University. This informed his relative state formulation which has impacted the field for decades now. Whilst undeniably influential, the impact of the many worlds interpretation has not been isolated nor uncontested. By any means, at the time of publication by Everett, the leading, dominating, and ultimately competing theory was the Copenhagen interpretation, a wider explanation of quantum physics with a much broader meaning and more contradictory ideas within it. Even today, the Copenhagen interpretation dominates the discourse and discussions of quantum mechanics. Or will that change with this new 2020 discovery? An experiment aiming to detect cosmic rays appears to have discovered particles that many scientists have suggested are from a universe, world, or realm that is parallel to our own. 
If a universe of this nature genuinely exists, current theories suggest that its formation likely coincides with our own, being born via the Big Bang. These leading field experts used apparatus described as a giant balloon to move NASA's Antarctic Impulsive Transient Antenna, also known as ANITA, to above Antarctica. Antarctica made for an ideal location for the employment of this technology as the environmental factors, including dry air and a distinct lack of radio noise, left few extraneous variables to distort and corrupt the data and findings. We discovered here that Earth has a consistent, constant arrival of high-energy particles entering our atmosphere from outer space. It has been well established that low-energy particles, known as subatomic neutrinos, with are able to pass through Earth with ease. We also believed until now that the particles with high energy have been unable to pass through our planet, being stopped by the solid matter of Earth itself. This new research conflicting with established premises has been assumed to indicate that these particles are coming up out of the Earth, emitting particles with a heavier mass, known as tau neutrinos, as detected by Anita. The previous idea, however, had been that we were experiencing high-energy particles coming down from outer space to the Earth. So what do scientists think this inverted trajectory means? Simply put, many physicists believe that these new, bizarre particles are traveling back in time, providing possible evidence to support the idea of a parallel universe where the time runs backwards to our own. Experimental particle physicist Peter Gorham and principal Anita investigator explained that the only other explanation as to the odd behavior of the tau neutrino particle is that it had somehow shifted into a new particle before passing through the Earth and then changing back into its original state once again. Of course, many skeptics were quick to voice an opinion here. Despite this phenomenon having seemingly limited explanations, though we cannot be certain either way as to exactly what is happening with the tau neutrino particle. Will more particles arise to support the idea of a backwards parallel universe, or will this discovery simply become the future material of a sci-fi episode? The Japan Earth Grazer 2006 Meteors are the small bodies of matter that enter the Earth's atmosphere and become incandescent due to friction. They travel at very high speeds and appear as streaks of light. While many of the meteors hit the surface of the Earth, some meteors enter the Earth's surface in such a trajectory that is almost parallel to the Earth's surface. Due to their high speed, these meteors bounce back into the upper atmosphere and re-enter space. Such meteors are known as Earth grazers. One of the most fascinating examples of an Earth grazer was observed in Japan. On March 29, 2006, the citizens in several cities of Japan witnessed a bright fireball travel across the sky. Scientists in different research facilities in Japan were able to accurately measure the characteristics of the meteor. Scientists determined that the fireball was caused by a meteor that weighed approximately 100 kilograms. It had entered the Earth's atmosphere at a height of 87 kilometers and then it covered a distance of 1,000 kilometers in only 35 seconds before leaving the Earth's atmosphere. This was only the third Earth grazer to have been observed and measured accurately by scientists. It was widely photographed and videos were made by ordinary people and scientists observing the Earth grazer. The event was also widely covered by the mainstream media. It was one of the most rare and fascinating space-related events to have ever been witnessed by a large number of people. Red Square Nebula In April 2007, NASA released images of a massive celestial object located in the constellation Serpens. This red-colored bipolar nebula is located in the same area of the sky as the star MWC 922. Scientists named it Red Square Nebula because of its color and shape. The images of the Red Square Nebula were taken using the Mount Palomar Hale Telescope. This massive object is estimated to be located at a distance of 5,000 light years from Earth. The unique nebula has fascinated scientists because of its symmetrical shape. According to Peter Tuthill, an astrophysicist at Sydney University, Red Square Nebula is one of the most symmetrical celestial objects ever imaged. Researchers are unsure about the exact composition and the origin of Red Square Nebula. However, most of the researchers believe that the massive star MWC 922, located at the center of the nebula, is responsible for its existence. According to Peter Tuthill, many stars that have a low mass, like the sun in our solar system, get rid of their outer layers in order to produce stunning planetary nebulae. Researchers believe that this dying star is ejecting gas and dust into the surroundings creating the nebula. It is believed to be a bipolar nebula formed as a result of the material emitting from the opposite sides of the star.
the meteorite that wiped out the dinosaurs. Scientists believe that about 66 million years ago, one of the most catastrophic events in the Earth's entire history took place. Researchers have found abundant geological evidence of an asteroid hitting the surface of the Earth and causing massive destruction. However, the most conclusive evidence was discovered in 1978 when geophysicists working for an oil company discovered a massive impact crater underneath the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. The crater is located near the town of Chicxulub and therefore it has been named the Chicxulub Crater. Subsequently, the asteroid that created the crater was also named the Chicxulub Asteroid. Over the years, a number of research studies have been conducted to determine the various features of the crater and the asteroid that caused it. It is estimated that the crater is 150 kilometers in diameter and 20 kilometers in depth. The crater goes quite deep into the continental crust. Researchers believe that the Chicxulub asteroid was approximately 10 kilometers in diameter. As this massive asteroid hit the surface of the Earth, it caused a massive explosion, resulting in Earth's atmosphere being polluted by a huge amount of debris. This severely altered the Earth's climate and caused the extinction of more than 75% of species that existed on Earth, including dinosaurs. Some evidence has also hinted that a massive tsunami was also triggered as a result of the explosion. Researchers are still trying to get their heads around the climatic conditions immediately after the meteor impact. Further research is being carried out in order to better understand the mix of dust and various gases that engulfed the planet after the impact from the Chicxulub asteroid. Our sun's twin, our sun, lies at the heart of the solar system and it's no secret that it's massive. Scientists have figured out that the sun is around 110 times the diameter of the Earth. This means that over 1 million Earths could fit inside the sun. Researchers have come forward and said that when our sun was born 4.5 billion years ago, it had a twin. However, this twin sun was not identical. Harvard scientists have said that this was the same with every other star in our universe. It has in fact been proved that many stars do have companions. Astronomers are now focused on trying to understand whether binary and triplet star systems are born that way. Astronomers have been searching for the sun's twin. This star goes by the name Nemesis. It's even been suggested that Nemesis is the reason behind the KT extinction, one of the largest mass extinction events to happen on our planet. It's also become known as the Die of the Dinosaurs. It's been theorized that Nemesis pushed an asteroid into the orbit of Earth. A research astronomer from UC Berkeley said the following, There probably was a Nemesis a long time ago. We have searched and tried to find out where the star resides. The system where the star would be has either broke apart or shrank. This other sun, however, would not have been near the current one. It's thought that at one point in time, it could have been 800 million Mars away from Earth. An idea is that the sun most likely escaped and then mixed with other stars in the Milky Way's region. As mentioned, this isn't science fiction either. Other researchers have come forward and said that this is not the first time that the idea that stars form with a companion has been suggested. A research paper is going to be featured in the Royal Astronomical Society. This will look at the origins of binary and multiple star systems. However, although this theory does have its supporters, there are those that don't believe in the nemesis theory. Some researchers have come forward and said that after studying craters, it doesn't back up the nemesis claim. Regardless, studies are still happening to try and prove the existence of this hypothetical star. GJ504B in 2011, scientists made an extraordinary discovery when they discovered GJ504B, also known as Gliese 504B, a planet that is still glowing from the heat of its formation. Scientists estimate that this bright pink colored planet is located at a distance of about 57 light years from Earth. This exoplanet orbits a sun like star named 59 Virginis, located in the Virgo constellation. This star is visible in the sky during night time and it can be easily seen with the naked eye. Chances are that you have already seen this star up in the sky amongst the thousands of other visible stars. Scientists estimate that the planet GJ504b is about four times bigger than Jupiter and the solar system it is located in is approximately 100 to 200 million years old. This is a remarkably young age when compared to other solar systems in the universe. Our solar system is estimated to be about 4.571 billion years old. The close observation of the newly formed GJ504b planet has given astronomers new insights into the development process of planets. Astronomers believe that this planet is still undergoing changes at a very rapid pace. 
According to one NASA scientist, if we could travel to this giant planet, all we would see is a world brightly glowing from the heat of its formation. GJ143b Planet Recently in 2019, NASA announced the discovery of a Neptune-like exoplanet known as GJ143b. The planet is estimated to have a mass of 22.7 times more than that of Earth. Astronomers believe that the planet orbits very close to its host star and it completes one orbit of the star in just 35.6 days. GJ143 orbits an orange main sequence star known as HD 21749. It is also known as GJ143. This star has only two planets and GJ143b is one of them. The star is located in the Rectilium constellation and is estimated to be at a distance of 53 light years from Earth. Researchers are further observing this newly discovered planet and it would probably take a couple of years before they are able to get basic information about the terrain, atmospheric conditions, and climate. 